Section 8 of The Black Prophet by William Carlton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8. Chapter 17. National Calamity, Sarah in Love and Sorrow. The astonishment of the prophet's wife on discovering that the tobacco box had been removed from the place of its concealment was too natural to excite any suspicion of deceit or falsehood on her part and he himself although his disappointment was dreadful on finding that it had disappeared at once perceived that she had been perfectly ignorant of its removal with his usual distrust and want of confidence however he resolved to test her truth a little further lest by any possibility she might have deceived him now nelly said he sternly mark me is this the way you produce the box you acknowledge that you had it that you hid it even and now when i tell you i want it and that it may be a matter of life and death to me you pretend it's gone and that you know nothing about it i say again mark me well produce the box here she replied chafed and indignant as well at its disappearance as at the obstinacy of his suspicions here's my throat dash your knife into it if you like but as for the box i tell you that although i did put it in there you know as much about it now as i do well said he for once i believe you but mark me still this box must be gotten and it's to you i'll look for it that's all you know me ay she replied i know you eh what do you mean by that he asked what do you know come now i say what do you know that you're a hardened and a bad man oh you needn't brandish your knife nor your eyes needn't blaze up that way like your daughter's she added except that you're hard and dark and without one spark a common feelin'. i know nothing particularly wicked about you but at the same time i suspect enough what do you suspect you hardened vagabond it doesn't matter what i suspect she answered only i think you'd have bad heart for anything so go about your business for i want to have nothing more either to do or say to you and i wish to glory i had been always of that way a thinkin ah oh, many a scalded heart i'd a missed that i got by you she then walked into the cabin and the prophet slowly followed her with his fixed doubtful and suspicious eye after which he flung the knife on the threshold and took his way in a dark and disappointed mood toward glendew it is impossible for us here to detail the subject matter of his reflections or to intimate to our readers how far his determination to bring condy dalton to justice originated in repentance for having concealed his knowledge of the murder or in some other less justifiable state of feeling at this moment indeed the family of the daltons wore in anything but a position to bear the heavy and terrible blow which was about to fall upon them our readers cannot forget the pitiable state in which we left them during that distressing crisis of misery when the strange woman arrived with the oatmeal which the kind-hearted mave sullivan had so generously sent them on that melancholy occasion her lover complained of being ill and unfortunately the symptoms were in this instance too significant of the malady which followed them indeed it would be an affliction of unnecessary pain to detail here the sufferings which this unhappy family had individually and collectively borne young condy after a fortnight's prostration from typhus fever was again upon his legs tottering about as his father had been in a state of such helplessness between want of food on the one hand and illness on the other as it is distressing even to contemplate if however the abstract consideration of it even at a distance be a matter of such painful retrospect to the mind what must not the actual endurance of that and worse have been to the thousands upon thousands of families who were obliged by god's mysterious dispensation 
to encounter these calamities in all their almost incredible and hideous reality at this precise period the state of the country was frightful beyond belief for it is well known that the mortality of the season we are describing was considerably greater than that which even cholera occasioned in its worst and most malignant ravages indeed the latter was not attended by such a tedious and lingering strain of miseries as that which in so many woeful shapes surrounded typhus fever the appearance of cholera was sudden and its operations quick and although on that account it was looked upon with tenfold terror yet for this very reason the consequences which it produced were by no means so full of affliction and distress nor presented such strong and pitiable claims on human aid and sympathy as did those of typhus in the one case the victim was cut down by a sudden stroke which occasioned a shock or moral paralysis both to himself and the survivors especially to the latter that might be almost said to neutralize its own inflictions in the other the approach was comparatively so slow and gradual that all the sympathies and afflictions were allowed full and painful time to reach the utmost limits of human suffering and to endure the wasting series of those struggles and details which long illness surrounded by destitution and affliction never fails to inflict in the cholera there was no time left to feel the passions were wrenched and stunned by a blow which was over one may say before it could be perceived while in the widespread but more tedious desolation of typhus the heart was left to brood over the thousand phases of love and misery which the terrible realities of the one joined to the alarming exaggerations of the other never failed to present in cholera a few hours and all was over but in the awful fever which then prevailed there was the gradual approach the protracted illness the long nights of racking pain day after day of raging torture and the dark period of uncertainty when the balance of human life hangs in the terrible equilibrium of suspense all requiring the exhibition of constant attention of the eye whose affection never sleeps the ear that is deaf only to every sound but the moan of pain the touch whose tenderness is felt as a solace so long as suffering itself is conscious the pressure of the aching head the moistening of the parched and burning lips and the numerous and indescribable offices of love and devotedness which always encompass or should encompass the bed of sickness and of death there was we say all this and much more than the imagination itself unaided by a severe acquaintance with the truth could embody in its gloomiest conceptions in fact ireland during the season or rather the year we are describing might be compared to one vast lazar house filled with famine disease and death the very skies of heaven were hung with the black drapery of the grave for never since nor within the memory of man before it did the clouds present shapes of such gloomy and funereal import hearses coffins long funeral processions and all the dark emblems of mortality were reflected as it were on the sky from the terrible work of pestilence and famine which was going forward on the earth beneath them to all this the thunder and lightning too were constantly adding their angry peals and flashing as if uttering the indignation of heaven against our devoted people and what rendered such fearful manifestations ominous and alarming to the superstitious was the fact of their occurrence in the evening and at night circumstances which are always looked upon with unusual terror and dismay 
to any person passing through the country such a combination of startling and awful appearances was presented as has probably never been witnessed since go where you might every object reminded you of the fearful desolation that was progressing around you the features of the people were gaunt their eyes wild and hollow and their gait feeble and tottering passed through the fields and you were met by little groups bearing home on their shoulders and that with difficulty a coffin or perhaps two of them the roads were literally black with funerals and as you passed along from parish to parish the death bells were pealing forth in slow but dismal tones the gloomy triumph which pestilence was achieving over the face of our devoted country a country that every successive day filled with darker desolation and deeper mourning nor was this all the people had an alarmed and unsettled aspect and whether you met them as individuals or crowds they seemed when closely observed to labor under some strong and insatiable want that rendered them almost reckless the number of those who were reduced to mendicancy was incredible and if it had not been for the extraordinary and unparalleled exertions of the clergy of all creeds medical men and local committees thousands upon thousands would have perished of disease or hunger on the highways many indeed did so perish and it was no unusual sight to meet the father and mother accompanied by their children going they knew not whither and to witness one or other of them lying down on the roadside and well were they off who could succeed in obtaining a sheaf of straw on which as a luxury to lay down their aching head that was never more to rise from it until born in a parish shell to a shallow and hasty grave temporary sheds were also erected on the roadsides or near them containing fever-stricken patients who had no other home and when they were released at last from their sorrows nothing was more common than to place the coffin on the roadside also with a plate on the lid of it in order to solicit from those who passed such aid as they could afford to the sick or starving survivors that indeed was the trying and melancholy period in which all the lingering traces of self-respect all recollection of former independence all sense of modesty was cast to the winds under the terrible pressure of the complex destitution which prevailed everything like shame was forgotten and it was well known that whole families who had hitherto been respectable and independent were precipitated almost at once into all the common cant of importunity and clamour during this frightful struggle between life and death of the truth of this the scenes which took place at the public soup shops and other appointed places of relief afforded melancholy proof here were wild crowds ragged sickly and wasted away to skin and bone struggling for the dole of charity like so many hungry vultures about the remnant of some carcass which they were tearing amid noise and screams and strife into very shreds for as we have said all sense of becoming restraint and shame was now abandoned and the timid girl or modest mother of a family or decent farmer goaded by the same wild and tyrannical cravings urged their claims with as much turbulent solicitation and outcry as if they had been trained since their very infancy to all the forms of impudent cant and imposture this our readers will admit was a most deplorable state of things but unfortunately we cannot limit the truth of our descriptions to the scenes we have just attempted to portray the misery which prevailed as it had more than one source so had it more than one aspect there were in the first place 
studded over the country a vast number of strong farmers with bursting granaries and immense haggards who without coming under the odious denomination of misers or meal mongers are in the habit of keeping up their provisions in large quantities because they can afford to do so until a year of scarcity arrives when they draw upon their stock precisely when famine and prices are both at their highest in addition to these there was another still viler class we mean the hard-hearted and well-known misers men who at every time and in every season prey upon the distress and destitution of the poor and who can never look upon a promising spring or an abundant harvest without an inward sense of ingratitude against god for his goodness or upon a season of drought or a failing crop unless with a thankful feeling of devotion for the approaching calamity during such periods and under such circumstances these men including those of both classes and the famished people in general live and act under antagonistic principles hunger they say will break through stone walls and when we reflect that in addition to this irresistible stimulus we may add a spirit of strong prejudice and resentment against these heartless persons it is not surprising that the starving multitudes should in the ravening madness of famine follow up its outrageous impulses and forget those legal restraints or moral principles that protect property under ordinary or different circumstances it was just at this precise period therefore that the people impelled by hunger and general misery began to burst out into that excited stupefaction which is we believe peculiar to famine riots and what rendered them still more exasperated than they probably would have been was the long lines of provision carts which met or intermingled with the funerals on the public thoroughfares while on their way to the neighboring harbors for exportation such indeed was the extraordinary fact day after day vessels laden with irish provisions drawn from a population perishing with actual hunger as well as with the pestilence which it occasioned were passing out of our ports while singular as it may seem other vessels came in freighted with our own provisions sent back through the charity of england to our relief it is not our business any more than it is our inclination to dwell here upon the state of those sumptuary enactments which reflected such honor upon the legislative wisdom that permitted our country to arrive at the lamentable condition we have attempted to describe we merely mention the facts and leave to those who possess position and ability the task of giving to this extraordinary state of things a more effectual attention without the least disposition however to defend or justify any violation of the laws we may be permitted to observe that the very witnessing of such facts as these by destitute and starving multitudes was in itself such a temptation to break in upon the provisions thus transmitted as it was scarcely within the strength of men furious with famine to resist be this as it may however it is our duty as a faithful historian to state that at the present period of our narrative the famine riots had begun to assume something of an alarming aspect several carts had been attacked and pillaged some strong farmers had been visited and two or three misers were obliged to become benevolent with rather a bad grace at the head of these parties were two persons mentioned in these pages to wit thomas dalton and red eody duncan together with several others of various estimation and character 
some of them as might be naturally expected the most daring and turbulent spirits in the neighborhood such then was the miserable state of things in the country at that particular period the dreadful typhus was now abroad in all his deadly power accompanied on this occasion as he always is among the irish by a panic which invested him with tenfold terrors the moment fever was ascertained or even supposed to visit a family that moment the infected persons were avoided by their neighbors and friends as if they carried death as they often did about them so that its presence occasioned all the usual interchanges of civility and good neighborhood to be discontinued nor should this excite our wonder inasmuch as this terrific scourge though unquestionably an epidemic was also ascertained to be dangerously and fatally contagious none of them but persons of extraordinary moral strength or possessing powerful impressions of religious duty had courage to enter the houses of the sick or dead for the purpose of rendering to the afflicted those offices of humanity which their circumstances required if we accept only their nearest relatives or those who lived in the same family having thus endeavored to give what we feel to be but a faint picture of the state of the kingdom at large in this memorable year we beg our readers to accompany us once more to the cabin of our moody and mysterious friend the black prophet evening was now tolerably far advanced donald dhu sat gloomily as usual looking into the fire with no agreeable aspect while on the opposite side sat nelly as silent and nearly as gloomy looking as himself every now and then his black piercing eye would stray over to her as if in a state of abstraction and again with that undetermined kind of significance which made it doubtful whether the subject matter of his cogitations was concerned with her at all or not in this position were they placed when sarah entered the cabin and throwing aside her cloak seated herself in front of the fire something about halfway between each she also appeared moody and if one could judge by her countenance felt equally disposed to melancholy or ill temper well madam said her father i hope it's no offence to ask where you have been sportin yourself since i suppose you went to see charlie hanlon or what is better his master young dick of the grange no she replied i did not charlie hanlon oh no well his master don't vex me don't vex me she replied abruptly i don't wish to fight about nothin or about trifles or to give bad answers but still don't vex me i say there's something in the wind now observed nelly she's getting fast into one of her tantrums i know it by her eyes she'd as soon wail me now as cry and she just as soon cry as wail me oh my lady i know you here at any rate will you have your supper the resentment which had been gathering at nelly's coarse observations disappeared the moment the question as to supper had been put to her oh why don't you she said and why didn't you always speak to me in a kind voice but about young dick said the suspicious prophet did you see him since no she replied calmly and thoughtfully but as if catching by reflection the base import of the query she replied in a loud and piercing voice rendered at once full and keen by indignation no i say and don't dare to suspect me of going to dick of the grange or any such profligate hullo there's a breeze after a pause you won't bait us i hope then madame where were you short as was the period that had passed since her reply and the putting of this last question she had relapsed or fallen into a mood of such 
complete abstraction that she heard him not with her naturally beautiful and taper hand under her still more finely chiselled chin she sat looking in apparent sorrow and perplexity into the fire and while so engaged she sighed deeply two or three times never mind her man said nelly let her alone and don't draw an old house on our heads she has had a fight with charlie hanlon i suppose maybe he has refused to marry her if he ever had any notion of it which i don't think he had sarah rose up and approaching her said what is that you were saying charlie hanlon never name him and me together from this minute out i like him well enough as an acquaintance but never name us together as sweethearts mark my words now i would go any length to serve charlie hanlon but i care nothing for him beyond an acquaintance although i did like him a little or i thought i did poor charlie exclaimed nelly he'll break his heart arrah what'll he do for a piece of black crepe to get into mournin' hey ha 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 if you had made use of them words to me only yesterday she replied i'd punish you on the spot but now you unfortunate woman you're below my anger say what you will or what you wish another quarrel with you i will never have what does she mean said the other looking fiercely at the prophet i ax you you traitor what she means ay and you'll ask me till your horse be for you get an answer he replied you're a dark and deep villain she uttered while her face became crimson with rage and the veins of her neck and temples swelled out as if they would burst however i told you what your fate would be and that providence was on your bloody trail ay did i and you'll find it true soon the prophet rose and rushed at her but sarah with the quickness of lightning flew between them don't be so mean she said don't now father if you rise your hand to her if you rise your hand to her i'll never sleep a night under the roof why don't you separate yourself from her oh no the man that would rise his hand to such a woman to a woman that must have the conscience she has especially when he could put the salt seas between himself and her is worse and meaner than she is as for me i'm leaving this house in a day or two for my mind's made up that the same roof won't cover us the devil go with you and sixpence then replied nelly disdainfully and then you'll want neither money nor company but before you go i'd thank you to tell me what has become of the old tobacco box that you pulled out of the wall the other day i know you were looking for it and i'm sure you got it there was no one else to take it so before you go tell me unless you wish to get a knife put into me by that dark-looking old father of yours i know nothing about your old box but i wish i did that's a lie you strap you know right well where it is no replied her father she does not when she says she doesn't did you ever know her to tell a lie ay did i fifty the prophet rushed at her again and again did sarah interpose you vile old tarmagent he exclaimed you're statin what you feel to be false when you say so right well you know that neither you nor i nor anyone else ever heard a lie from her lips and yet you have the brass to say to the contrary father said sarah there's but one course for you as for me my mind's made up in this house i don't stay if she does if you think of what i spoke to you about he replied all would soon be right with us but then you're so unreasonable and full of foolish notions that it's hard for me to know what to do especially as i wish to do all for the best well rejoined sarah i'll speak to you again about it at this time i'm disturbed and uneasy in my mind i'm unhappy unhappy and i hardly knows on what hand to turn 
I'm afeard I was born for a hard fate, and that the day of my doom isn't far from me. All father is dark before me, my heart is indeed low and full of sorrow, and sometimes I could almost tear any one that would contradict me. Anyway, I'm unhappy. As she uttered the last words, her father, considerably surprised at the melancholy tenor of her language, looked at her, and perceived that whilst she spoke, her large black eyes were full of distress and swam in tears. "'Don't be a fool, Sarah,' said he. "'Don't be a fool, Sarah,' said he. "'It's not a trifle should make anyone cry in such a world as this. "'If Charlie Hanlon and you has quarrelled, "'it was only the case with thousands before you. "'If he don't marry you, maybe as good or better will, "'for sure, as the old proverb says, "'there's as good fish in the sea as ever was catched. "'In the meantime, think what I said to you, "'and all will be right.' Sarah looked not at him, but whilst he spoke, she hastily dried her tears, and ere half a minute had passed, her face had assumed a firm and somewhat of an indignant expression. Little, however, did her father then dream of the surprising change which one short day had brought about in her existence, nor of the strong passions which one unhappy interview had awakened in her generous but unregulated heart chapter eighteen love wins the race from profligacy donald dhu mcgowan's reputation as a prophecy man arose in the first instance as much on account of his mysterious pretensions to a knowledge of the quack prophecies of his day pastorini call him kill etc and such stuff as from any pretensions he claimed to foretell the future in the course of time however by assuming to be a seventh son he availed himself of the credulity and ignorance of the people and soon added a pretended insight into futurity to his powers of interpreting pastorini and all the cashpenny trash of the kind which then circulated among the people. This imposture, in course of time, produced its effect. Many, it is true, laughed at his impudent assumptions, but, on the other hand, hundreds were strongly impressed with a belief in the mysterious and rhapsodical predictions which he was in the habit of uttering. Among the latter class we may reckon simple-hearted Jerry Sullivan and family, all of whom, Maeve herself included, placed the most religious confidence in the oracles he gave forth. It was then, with considerable agitation and palpitating heart, that on the day following that of Donald's visit to her father's, she approached the grey stone, where, in the words of the prophet, she should meet the young man who was going to bring her love, wealth, and happiness and all that a woman can wish to have with a man the agitation she felt however was the result of a depression that almost amounted to despair her faithful heart was fixed but upon one alone and she knew that her meeting with any other could not so far as she was concerned realize the golden visions of donald dhu the words however could not be misunderstood the first person she met on the right side of the way after passing the greystone was to be the individual, and when we consider her implicit belief in Donald's prophecy, contrasted with her own impressions and the state of mind in which she approached the place, we may form a tolerably accurate notion of what she must have experienced. On arriving within two hundred yards or so of the spot mentioned, she observed in the distance about half a mile before her a gentleman on horseback approaching her at rapid speed. Her heart, on perceiving him, literally sank within her, and she felt so weak as to be scarcely able to proceed. Oh, what, she at length asked herself, would I not now give but for one glance of young Condy Dalton? But it is not to be. 
the unfortunate murder of my uncle has prevented that forever although i can't get myself to believe that any of the daltons ever did it but maybe that's because i wish they didn't the general opinion is that his father is the man that did it may the lord forgive them whoever they are that took his life for it was a black act to me at any rate across the road before her ran one of those little deep valleys or large ravines and into this had the horseman disappeared as she closed the soliloquy he had not however at all slackened his pace but on the contrary evidently increased it as she could hear by the noise of his horse's feet at this moment she reached the brow of the ravine and our readers may form some conception of what she felt when on looking down it she saw her lover young dalton toiling up towards her with feeble and failing steps while pressing after him from the bottom came young henderson urging his horse with whip and spur her heart which had that moment bounded with delight now utterly failed her on perceiving the little chance which the poor young man had of being the first to meet her and thus fulfil the prophecy henderson was gaining upon him at a rapid pace and must in a few minutes have passed him had not woman's wit and presence of mind came to her assistance if he cannot run up the hill she said to herself i can run to him down it and as the thought occurred to her she started towards him at her greatest speed which indeed was considerable as her form was of that light and elastic description which betokens great powers of activity and exertion the struggle indeed was close henderson now plied whip and spur with redoubled energy and the animal was approaching at full speed mave on the other hand urged by a thousand motives forgot everything but the necessity of exertion dalton was incapable of running a step and appeared not to know the cause of the contest between the parties at length mave by her singular activity and speed reached her lover into whose arms she actually ran just as henderson had come within a few dozen yards of the spot where she met him this effort on the part of mave was in perfect accordance with the simple earnestness of her character her youthful figure her innocence of manner the glow of beauty and the crowd of blushing graces which the act developed together with the joyous exultation of her triumph on reaching her lover's arms and thus securing to herself and him completion of so delightful a prediction all when taken in at one view rendered her being so irresistibly fascinating that her lover could scarcely look upon the incident as a real one but for a moment almost persuaded himself that his beloved mave had undergone some delightful and glorious transformation such as he had seen her assume in the dreams of his late illness henderson finding himself disappointed now pulled up his horse and addressed her upon my word miss sullivan i believe he added i have the pleasure of addressing jeremy sullivan's daughter so far famed for her beauty i say upon my word miss sullivan your speed outstrips the wind those light and beautiful feet of yours scarcely touch the ground i am certain you must dance delightfully mave again blushed and immediately extricated herself from her lover's arms but before she did she felt his frame trembling with indignation at the liberty henderson had taken in addressing her at all dalton the latter proceeded unconscious of the passion he was exciting i cannot but envy you at all events i would myself delight to be a winning post under such circumstances dalton looked at him and his eye like that of his father when enraged glared with a deadly light pass on sir he replied mave sullivan is no girl for the like of you to address 
she wishes to have no conversation with you and she will not i shan't take your word for that my good friend replied henderson smiling she can speak for herself and will too i trust dear condy whispered mave don't put yourself in a passion you are too weak to bear it miss sullivan proceeded young dick is a pretty girl and as such i claim a portion of her attention and should she so far favor me even of her conversation and that with every respect for your very superior judgment my good mr dalton what is your object now in wishing to speak to her asked the latter looking him sternly in the face i don't exactly see that i'm bound to answer your catechism said dick it is to miss sullivan i should address myself i speak to you miss sullivan and allow me to say that i feel a very warm interest in your welfare and nothing would give me greater pleasure than to promote it by any means in my power mave was about to reply but dalton anticipated her the only favor you can bestow upon miss sullivan as you are pleased to call her is to pass her by said dalton she wishes to have no intimacy or conversation of any kind with such a noted profligate she knows your character mr henderson or if she doesn't i do and that it's as much as a decent girl's good name is worth to be seen speaking to you now i tell you again to pass on don't force either yourself or your conversation upon her if you're wise i'm here to protect her and i won't see her insulted for nothing do you mean that as a threat my good fellow if you think it is a threat don't deserve it and you won't get it if right was to take place our family would have a heavy account to settle with you and yours and it wouldn't be wise in you to add this to it ha i see oh i understand you i think more threatening eh as i said before replied dalton that's as you may deserve it your cruelty and injustice and oppression to our family we might overlook but i tell you that if you become the means of bringing a stain the slightest that ever was breathed upon the fair name of this girl it would be a thousand times better that you never were born ah indeed master dalton but in the meantime what does miss sullivan herself say we are anxious to hear your own sentiments on this matter miss sullivan i would feel obliged to you to pass on sir she replied condy dalton is ill and badly able to bear such a conversation as this here said dalton fiercely laying his hand upon mave's shoulder if you cross my path here or leave but a shadow of a stain as i said upon her name woe betide you your wishes are commands to me miss sullivan replied henderson without noticing dalton's denunciation in the slightest degree and i trust that when we meet again you won't be guarded by such a terrible bow-wow of a dragon as has now charge of you good-bye and accept my best wishes until then he immediately set spurs once more to his horse and in a few minutes had turned at the crossroads and taken that which led to his father's house it was well for him said dalton immediately after he had left them that i hadn't a loaded pistol in my hand but no dear mave he added checking himself the hasty temper and the hasty blow is the fault of our family and so far as i am concerned i'll do everything to overcome it mave now examined him somewhat more earnestly than she had done and although grieved at his thin and wasted appearance yet she could not help being forcibly struck by the singular clearness and manly beauty of his features and yet this beauty filled her heart with anything but satisfaction for on contemplating it she saw that it was overshadowed by an expression of such settled sorrow and dejection as it was impossible to look upon without the deepest compassion and sympathy 
"'We had better rest a little, dear Mave,' he said. "'You must be fatigued, and so am I. "'Turn back a little, will you, and let us sit upon the grey stone. "'It's the only thing in the shape of a seat that is now near us. "'Have you any objection?' "'None of the world,' she replied. "'I'll be time enough at my uncle's, especially as I don't intend to come home to-night.' They accordingly sauntered back and took their seat upon the ledge of the stone question that almost concealed them from observation, after which the dialogue proceeded as follows. Condy observed Mave, I was glad to hear that you recovered from the fever, but I'm sorry to see you look so ill. There is a great deal of care in your face. There is, dear Mave, there is, he replied with a melancholy smile and a great deal of care in my heart you look then yourself and careworn too dear we are not without our own struggles at home she replied as indeed who is now but we had more than ourselves to fret for who he asked but on putting the question he saw a look of such tender reproach in her eye as touched him kind heart he exclaimed kindest and best of hearts why should i ax such a question surely i ought to know you i am glad i met you may for i have many things to say to you and it's hard to say when i may have an opportunity again i know that is true said she but i did not expect to meet you here Maeve, he proceeded in a voice filled with melancholy and sadness you acknowledged that you loved me she looked at him, and that look moved him to the heart. "'I know you do love me,' he proceeded, "'and now, dear Mave, the thought of that fills my heart with sorrow.' She started slightly and looked at him again with a good deal of surprise, but on seeing his eyes filled with tears, she also caught the contagion and asked with deep emotion, "'Why, dear Condy, why does my love for you make your heart sorrowful?' "'Because I have no hope,' said he, "'no hope that ever you can be mine.' Mave remained silent, for she knew the insurmountable obstacles that prevented their union, but she wept afresh. "'When I saw your father last behind your garden, the day I struck Donald Dew,' Dalton proceeded, "'I told him what I then believed to be true, that my father never had a hand in your uncle's death mave dear i cannot tell a lie nor i will not i couldn't say as much to him now i'm afeard that his death is on my father's soul mave started and got pale at the words great god she exclaimed don't say so con dear oh no no is it your father that was always so good and so generous to every one that stood in need of it at his hands and who was also so charitable to the poor ay said he he was charitable to the poor but of late i've heard him say things that nobody but a man that has some great crime to answer for could or would say i believe too that what the public says is right that it's the hand of god himself that's upon him and us for that murder but maybe said mave who still continued pale and trembling maybe it was accidentally after all a chance blow maybe but whatever it was dear con let us speak no more about it i am not able to listen to it it would sicken me soon very well dear we'll drop it and i hope i'm wrong for i can't think after all that a man with such a kind and tender heart as my father pious man too could he paused a moment and then added oh no i'm surely wrong he never did the act however as we said i'll drop it for indeed dear mave i have enough that sorrowful and heartbreaking to speak about over and above that unfortunate subject i hope said mave that there is nothing worse than your own illness and you know thanks be to the almighty you're recovering fast from that my poor lovin sister nancy said he was laid down yesterday morning with this terrible favor she was our chief dependence we could stand it out no longer i could and can do nothing and my mother this morning 
his tears fell so fast and his affliction was so deep that he was not able for a time to proceed oh what about her asked mave participating in his grief oh what about her that every one loves she was obliged to go out this morning he proceeded to beg openly in the face of day among neighbors now mave sullivan farewell said he rising while his face was crimsoned over with shame farewell mave sullivan all from this minute is over between you and me the son of a beggar must never become your husband will never call you his wife even if there was no other reason against it the melancholy but lovely girl rose with him she trembled she blushed and again got pale then blushed once more at length she spoke and is that dear con all that you yet know of mave sullivan's heart or of the love for you that's in it your mother oh and is it come to that with her but but do you think that even that or anything that wouldn't be a crime in yourself or do you think oh i know not what to say i see now dear con the reason for the sorrow that's in your face the heartbreak and the care that's there i see indeed how low in spirits and how hopeless you are and i see that although your eye is clear still it's heavy heavy with hard affliction but then what is love con dear if it's to fly away when these things come on us is it now then that you'd expect me to desert you to keep cool with you or to leave you when you have no other heart to go to for any comfort but mine oh no con dear your own mave sullivan is none of these god knows it's little comfort she proceeded weeping bitterly it's little comfort in my poor heart for any one but there's one thing in it con dear that poor as i stand here this minute and where oh where is there or could there be a poorer girl than i am still there's one thing in it that i wouldn't exchange for this world's wealth and that that dear con is my love for you that's the love dear con that neither this world nor its cares nor its shame nor its poverty nor its sorrow can ever overcome or banish that's the love that would live with you in wealth that would keep by your side through good and through evil that would share your sickness that would rejoice with you that would grieve with you beg with you starve with you and to go where you might die by your side i cannot bid you to throw care and sorrow away but if it's consolation to you to know and to feel how your own mave sullivan loves you then you have that consolation dear con i am ready to marry you and share your distress to-morrow ay this day or this minute if it could be done there was a gentle calm but firm enthusiasm about her manner which carried immediate conviction with it and as her tears fell in silence she bestowed a look upon her lover which fully and tenderly confirmed all that her tongue had uttered both had been standing but her lover taking her hand sat down as she also did he then turned around and pressed her to his heart and their tears in this melancholy embrace of love and sorrow both literally mingled together i would be ungrateful to god my beloved mave he replied and unworthy of you and indeed at best i am not worthy of you if i didn't take hope and courage when i know that such a girl loves me as it is i feel my heart easier and my spirits lighter although at the same time dear mave i'm very weak and far from being well that's because this disturbance of your mind is too much for you yet but keep your spirits up you don't know she continued smiling sweetly through her tears what a delightful prophecy was fulfilled for us this day ay a while ago even when i met you no he replied what was it she then detailed the particulars of donald dhu's prediction which she dwelt upon with very cheerful spirit after which she added and now con dear don't you think that's a sign we'll be yet happy dalton who placed 
no reliance whatever on Donald Dew's impostures, still felt reluctant to destroy the hope occasioned by such an agreeable illusion. Well, he replied, although I don't much believe in anything that old scoundrel says, I trust for all that that he has told you truth for once. But how did you happen to come here, Con? she asked, to be here at this very minute, too. Why, said he, I was desired to be the first to meet you after you passed the grey stone, the very one we're sitting on, if I loved you and wished to serve you. But who on earth could tell you this, she asked, because I thought no livin' bein' knew of it beside myself and Donald Dew. It was Sarah his daughter, said Dalton, but when I asked her why I should come to do so, she wouldn't tell me. She said if I wished to save you from evil, or at any rate from trouble. That's a strange girl, his daughter, he added. She makes one do whatever she likes. Isn't she very handsome, said May, with an expression of admiration. I think she's without exception the prettiest girl I ever seen. And her beautiful figure beats all, but somehow they say every one is afraid of her, and durstn't vex her. She examined me well yesterday, at all events, replied Con. I thought them broad, black, beautiful eyes of her would look through me. Many a wager has been laid as to which is the handsomest, you or she, and I know hundreds that it give a great deal to see you both beside one another. Indeed, and she has it then, said May, far and away, in face and figure and in everything. I don't think so, he replied, but at any rate, not in everything. Not in the heart, dear Mave, not in the heart. They say she's kind-hearted, then, replied Mave. They do, said Con, and I don't know how it comes, but somehow every one loves her, and every one fears her at the same time. She asked me yesterday if I thought my father murdered Sullivan. Oh, for God's sake, don't talk about it, said Babe again, getting pale. I can't bear to hear it spoken of. The grey stone, on a low ledge of which, nearly concealed from public view, our lovers had been sitting, was, in point of size, a very large rock of irregular size. After the last words alluding to the murder had been uttered, an old man, very neatly but plainly dressed, and bearing a peddler's pack, came round from behind a projection of it and approached them. From his position it was all but certain that he must have overheard their whole conversation. Mave, on seeing him, blushed deeply, and Dalton himself felt considerably embarrassed at the idea that the stranger had been listening, and became acquainted with circumstances that were never designed for any other ears but their own. The old man, on making his appearance, surveyed our lovers from head to foot with a curious and inquisitive eye, a circumstance which, taken in connection with his eavesdropping, was not at all relished by young Dalton. I think you will know us again, said he, in no friendly voice. How long have you been sitting behind the corner there? he inquired. I hope I may know yous again, replied the peddler, for he was one. I was just long enough behind the corner to hear some of what you were speaking about last. And what was that? said Dalton, putting him to the test. You were talking about the murder of one Sullivan. We were, replied Dalton, but I'll thank you to say nothing further about it. It's disagreeable to both of us, distressing to both of us. I don't understand that, said the old peddler. How can it be so to either of you, if you're not concerned in it one way or other? We are, then, said Dalton with warmth. The man that was killed was this girl's uncle, and the man that was supposed to take his life is my father. Maybe you understand me now. The blood left the cheeks of the old man, who staggered over to the ledge whereon they sat and placed himself beside them. God of heaven, said he with astonishment, can this be true? Now that you know what you do know, said Dalton, we'll thank you to drop the subject. Well, I will, said he, but first for heaven's sake answer me a question or two. What's your name, Avick? 
Condy Dalton, ay, Condy Dalton, the Lord be about us, and Sullivan, Sullivan was the name of the man that was murdered, you say? Yes, partly Sullivan, God rest him. And whisper, tell me, God preserve us, was there anything done to your father, Avic? What was done to him? Why, he was taken up on suspicion soon after it happened, but but there was nothing done. They had no proof against him, and he was let go again. Is your father alive still? He is living, replied Dalton. But come, pass on, old man, he added bitterly. I'll give you no more information. Well, thank you, dear, said the peddler. I ax your pardon for giving you pain, and the colleen here. I, you're a Sullivan, then, and a pretty but sorrowful-looking creature you are. God knows, poor things. God pity you both, and grant you a better fate than what appears to be before you. For I did hear a trifle of your discourse. End of section 8 Section 9 of The Black Prophet by William Carleton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9. There was something singularly benevolent and kind in the old peddler's voice as he uttered the last words, and he had not gone many perches from the stone when Dalton's heart relented as he reflected on his harsh and unfriendly demeanor towards him. That is a good old man, he observed and I am now sorry that I spoke to him so roughly. There was kindness in his voice and in his eye as he looked upon us. There was, replied Maeve, and I think him a good old man, too. I don't think he would harm anyone. Dear Maeve, said Dalton, I must now get home as soon as I can. I don't feel so well as I was. There is a chill upon me, and I'm afeard I won't have a comfortable night. "'And I can do nothing for you,' added Maeve, her eyes filling with tears. "'I didn't thank you for that lock of hair you sent me by Donald Dew, he added. "'It is here upon my heart, and I needn't say that if anything had happened me, or if anything should happen me, it and that heart must go to dust together.' "'You are too much cast down,' she replied, her tears flowing fast, "'and it can't surely be otherwise, but, dear Con, "'let us hope for better days and put our trust in God's goodness.' "'Farewell, dear Maeve,' he replied, "'and may God bless and preserve you till I see you again. "'And may he send down aid to you all,' she added, "'and give consolation to your breaking hearts.' An embrace, long, tender, and mournful, accompanied their words, after which they separated in sorrow and in tears, and with but little hope of happiness on the path of life that lay before them. Chapter 19 Hanlon Secures the Tobacco Box Strange Scene at Midnight The hour so mysteriously appointed by Red Roddy for the delivery of the tobacco box to Hanlon was fast approaching, and the night, though by no means so stormy as that which we have described on the occasion of that person's first visit to the Greystone, was nevertheless dark and rainy with an occasional slight gust of wind that uttered a dreary and melancholy moan as it swept over the hedges. Hanlon, whose fear of supernatural appearances had not been diminished by what he had heard there before as well as on his way home, now felt alarmed at every gust of wind that went past him. He hurried on, however, and kept his nerves as firmly set as his terrors would allow him, until he got upon the plain old road which led directly to the appointed place. The remarkable interest which he had felt at an earlier stage of the circumstances that compose our narrative was beginning to cool a little, when it was revived by his recent conversation with Red Roddy concerning the Black Prophet, 
and the palpable contradictions in which he detected that person with reference to the period when the prophet came to reside in the neighborhood his anxiety therefore about the tobacco box began as he approached the grey stone to balance his fears so that by the time he arrived there he found himself cooler and firmer a good deal than when he first crossed the dark fields from home hanlon in fact had learned a good deal of the prophet's real character from several of those who had never been duped by his impostures and the fact of ascertaining that the very article so essential to the completion of his purpose had been found in the prophet's house or possession gave a fresh and still more powerful impulse to his determinations the night we have already observed was dark and the heavy gloom which covered the sky was dismal and monotonous several flashes of lightning it is true had shot out from the impervious masses of black clouds that lay against each other overhead these however only added terror to the depression which such a night and such a sky were calculated to occasion i trust thought hanlon as he approached the stone that there will be no disappointment and that i won't have my journey on such a dark and dismal night for nothing how this red ruffian can have any authority over a girl like sarah is a puzzle that i can't make out it was just as these thoughts occurred to, to him that he arrived at the stone where he stood anxiously waiting and listening and repeating his paternoster as well as he could for several minutes but without hearing or seeing any one i might have known thought he that the rascal could bring but nothing of the kind and i am only a fool for heeding him at all at this moment however he heard the noise of a light quick footstep approaching and almost immediately afterwards sarah joined him well i am glad you are come said he for god knows when i thought of our last stand here i was anything but comfortable why replied sarah what were you afeard of i hate a cowardly man and you are cowardly not where mere flesh and blood is concerned he replied i'm afeard of neither man nor woman but i wouldn't like to meet a ghost or spirit may the lord preserve us why now what harm could a ghost or spirit do you did you ever hear that they laid hands on or killed any one no but for all that it's well known that several persons have died of fright in consequence ay of cowardliness but it wasn't the ghost killed them sure the poor ghost only comes to get relief for itself to have masses said or maybe to do justice to someone that is wronged in this world there's jimmy beatty and he lay three weeks of fright from seeing a ghost and it turned out when all was known that the ghost was nothing more or less than tar martin's white-faced cow ha 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 at any rate let us change the subject said hanlon you heard yourself the last night we were here what i'll never forget we heard some noise like a groan and that was all but who could tell what it was or who cares either i for one do but dear sarah have you the box why does your voice tremble that way for is it fear because if i thought it was i wouldn't scruple much to walk home without another word and bring the box with me you have it then to be sure i have and my father and nelly is both hunting the house for it why what could your father want with it how can i tell and only that i promised it to you i wouldn't fetch it at all i thought you had given it up for lost how did you get it again that's nothing to you and don't trouble your head about it there it is now and i have kept my word for while i live i'll never break it if i can dear me how bright that flash was as hanlon was taking the box out of her hand a fearful flash of sheeted lightning opened out of a cloud almost immediately above them 
and discovered it so plainly that the letters P.M. were distinctly legible on the lid of it, and nearly at the same moment a deep groan was heard as if coming out of the rock. "'Father of heaven!' exclaimed Hanlon. "'Do you hear that?' "'Yes,' she replied. "'I did hear a groan, but here do you go. Oh, it would be useless to ask you, so I must only do it myself. Stand here, and I'll go round the rock. At any rate, let us be sure that it is a ghost. Don't, Sarah, he exclaimed, seizing her arm. For God's sakes, don't. It is a spirit. I know it. Don't leave me. I understand it all, and maybe you will some day, too. Now, she exclaimed indignantly, and in an incredulous voice, in God's name, what has a spirit to do with an old rusty tobacco box it's surely a curious box there's my father would give one of his eyes to find it and nelly that hid it the other day found it gone when she went to get it for him do you tell me so said hanlon placing it as he spoke in his safest pocket i do she replied and only that i promised it to you and would not break my word i'd give it to my father but i don't see myself what use it can be of to him or anybody hanlon despite of his terrors heard this intelligence with the deepest interest indeed with an interest so deep that he almost forgot them altogether and with a view of eliciting from her as much information in connection with it as he could he asked her to accompany him a part of the way home it's not quite the thing she replied for a girl like me to be walkin with a young feller at this hour but as i'm not afeard of you and as i know you are afeard of the ghost if there is a ghost i will go part of the way with you although it does not say much for your courage to ask me thank you sarah you are a perfect treasure whatever i was or whatever i am charley i can never be anything more to you than a mere acquaintance i don't think ever we were much more but what i want to tell you is that if ever you have any serious notion of me you must put it out of your head why so sarah why so she replied hastily why because i don't wish it isn't that enough for you if you have spirit well but i'd like to know why you changed your mind ah said she well after all that's only natural it is but reasonable and i'll tell you in the first place there's a want of manliness about you that i don't like i think you've but little heart or feeling you toy with the girls with this one and that one and you don't appear to love any one of them in short you're not affectionate i'm afeard now here i am and i can scarcely say that ever you courted me like a man that had feelin i think you're revengeful too for i have seen you look black and angry at a woman before now you never loved me i know i say i know you did not there then is some of my reasons but i'll tell you one more that's worth them all i love another now ay she added with a convulsive laugh i love another and i know charley that he can't love me there's more lightning what a flash oh i didn't care this minute if it went through my heart don't talk so sarah i know what's before me disappointment disappointment in everything the people say i'm wild and very wicked in my temper and i am too but how could i be otherwise for what did i ever see or hear under our own miserable roof but evil talk and evil deeds a word of kindness i never got from my father or from nelly nothing but the bad word and the hard blow until now that she is afeard of me but little she knew that many a time when i was fiercest and threatened to put a knife into her there was a quiver of affection in my heart a yearning i may say after kindness that had me often near throwing my arms about her neck and asking her why she mightn't as well be kind as cruel to me but i couldn't because i knew that if i did she'd only tramp on me and despise me and tyrannize over me more and more 
she uttered these sentiments under the influence of deep feeling checkered with an occasional burst of wild distraction that seemed to originate from much bitterness of heart is it a fair question replied hanlon whose character she had altogether misunderstood having in point of fact never had an opportunity of viewing it in its natural light is it a fair question to ask you who is it that you're in love with it's not a fair question she replied i know he loves another and for that reason i'll never breathe it to a mortal because he added if i knew maybe i might be able to put in a good word for you now and then accordin as i got an opportunity for me she replied indignantly what to beg him get fond of me oh it's wonderful the meanness that's in almost every one you meet no she proceeded vehemently if he was a king on his throne sooner than stooped to that or if he didn't or couldn't love me on my own account i'd let the last drop of my heart's blood out first oh no 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 ha he loves another she added hastily he loves another and do you know her asked hanlon do i know her she replied do i know her it's i that do i and i have her in my power too and if i set about it can prevent a ring from ever going on them ha ha and i that divil sarah mcgowan what a fine character i have got well well good night charley maybe it's a folly to have a bad name for nothing at least they say so ha ha good night i'll go home oh i had like to forgot red body told me he was speaking to you about something that he says you can't but understand yourself and he desired me to get you if i could to join him in it i said i would if it was right and honest for i have great doubts of it being either the one or the other if it comes from him he said that it was both but that it'd be a great piece of roguery to have it undone now if it is what he says it is help him in it if you can but if it isn't have no hand in it that's all i told him i would say and that's all i do say keep out of his secrets i advise you and above all things avoid everything mean and dishonest for charley i have a kind of liking for you that i can't explain although i don't love you as a sweetheart good night again she left him abruptly and at a rapid pace proceeded back to the greystone around which she walked with a view of examining whether or not there might be any cause visible earthly or otherwise for the groans which they had heard but notwithstanding a close and diligent search she could neither see nor hear anything whatsoever to which they might possibly be ascribed she reached home about one o'clock and after having sat musing for a time over the fire which was raked for the night that is covered over with geese hog or living ashes she was preparing to sleep in her humble bed behind a little partition wall about five feet high at the lower end of the cabin when her father who had been moaning and staring and uttering abrupt exclamations in his sleep at length rose up and began deliberately to dress himself as if with an intention of going out father said she in the name of goodness where are you going at this time of the night i'm going to the murdered man's grave he replied i'm going to tell them all how he was murdered and who it was that murdered him a girl with nerves less firm would have felt a most deadly terror at such language on perceiving as sarah at once did that her father whose eyes were shut was fast asleep at the time in her however it only produced such a high degree of excitement and interest as might be expected from one of her ardent and excitable temperament imbued as it was with a good deal of natural romance in god's name she said to herself what can this mean of late he hasn't had one hour's quiet rest at night nothing but startin and shoutin out and talkin about murder and murderers what can it mean for he's now walkin in his sleep father said she you're asleep go back to bed you had better no i'm not asleep 
he replied. I'm going down to the grave here below, behind the rocks down in Glendew, where the murdered man is lying buried. And what brings you there at this time of the night? Ha ha, he replied, uttering an exclamation of caution in a low, guarded voice. What brings me? Whist, hold your tongue, and I'll tell you. She really began to doubt her senses, notwithstanding the fact of his eyes being shut. Wish yourself, she replied. I don't want to hear anything about it. I have no relish for such secrets. I'm ready enough with my own hand, especially when there's a weapon in it. Readier than ever I'll be again, for all that I don't wish to hear such secrets. Are you asleep or awake? I'm awake, of course, he replied. And why are your eyes shut, then? Your frightful father to look at. No corpse ever had such a face as you have. Your heavy brows are knit in such a way, just as if you were in an agony. Your cheeks are so white, too, and your mouth is down at the corners that a ghost, I, the ghost of the murdered man himself, would be agreeable compared to you. Go to bed, father, if you're awake. To all this he made no reply, but having dressed himself, he deliberately, and with great caution, raised the latch, and proceeded out at that dismal and lonely hour sarah for a time knew not how to act she had often heard of sleep-walking and she feared now that if she awakened him he might imagine that she had heard matters which he wished no ears whatever to hear for the truth was that some vague suspicions of a dreadful nature had lately entered her mind suspicions which his broken slumbers his starts and frequent exclamations during sleep had only tended to confirm. I will watch him at all events, said she to herself, and see that he comes to no danger. She accordingly shut the door after her, and followed him pretty closely into the deep gloom of the silent and solitary glen. With cautious but steady and unerring steps, he proceeded in the direction of the loneliest spot of it, which, having reached, he went by a narrow and untrodden circuit, a kind of broken but natural pathway, to the identical spot where the body which Nelly had discovered lay. He then raised his hand as if in caution and whispered, Wished, here is where the murdered man's body lies. I'll not do it, said Sarah, I'll not do it. It would be mean and ungenerous to ask him a question that might make him betray himself. At this moment the moon, which had been for some time risen, presented a strange and alarming aspect. She seemed red as blood, and directly across her center there went a black bar a bar so ominously and intensely black that it was impossible to look upon it without experiencing something like what one might be supposed to feel in the presence of a supernatural appearance. At the performance of some magic or unnatural rite, where the sorcerer, by the wickedness of his spell, forced her, as it were, thus to lend a dreadful and reluctant sanction to his proceedings. Her father, however, proceeded, I, who murdered him, my lord, why, my lord, hm, it was Condy Dalton, and I have another man to prove it along with myself, one Roddy Duncan. Now, Roddy, answer strong, swear home, mind yourself, Roddy. These words were spoken aside precisely as one would address them when instructing any person to give a particular line of evidence. He then stooped down and placed his hand upon the grave, said, as if he were addressing the dead man, Ha! Ah, you sleep cool there, you guilty villain, and it wasn't my fault that the unfaithful and dishonest strap that you got that for didn't get as much herself. There you are, and you'll tell no tales at all events. You know, Roddy, he proceeded, it was Dalton that murdered him, mind that, but you're a coward at heart. As for myself, there's nothing troubles me 
but that tobacco box but you know nothing about that may the devil confound me at any rate for not destroying it and that old strap nelly suspects something for she's always ringing providence into my ears but if i had that box destroyed i'd disregard providence if there is a providence the words had barely proceeded out of his lips when a peal of thunder astonishingly loud broke as it were over their very heads having been preceded by a flash of lightning so bright that the long well-defined grave was exposed in all its lonely horrors to sarah's eye that's odd now said she that the thunder should come as he said them very words but thank god that it was dalton that did the deed for if it was himself he'd not keep it back now when the truth would be sure to come out it was he my lord and gentlemen of the jury proceeded her father and my conscience my lord during all this long time here he muttered something which she could not understand and after stooping down and putting his hand on the grave a second time he turned about and retraced his steps home it appeared however that late as the hour was there were other persons abroad as well as themselves for sarah could distinctly hear the footsteps of several persons passing along the adjoining road past the grey stone and she also thought that among the rest might be distinguished the voice of red roddy duncan the prophet quietly opened the door entered as usual and went to bed sarah having also retired to her own little sleeping place lay for some time musing deeply over the incidents of the night chapter twenty tumults confessions of murder the next morning opened with all the dark sultry rain and black cloudy drapery which had as we have already stated characterized the whole season indeed during the year we are describing it was known that all those visible signs which prognosticate any particular description of weather had altogether lost their significance if a fine day came for instance which indeed was a rare case or a clear and beautiful evening it was but natural that after such a dark and dreary course of weather the heart should become glad and full of hope that a permanent change for the better was about to take place but alas all cheerful hope and expectation were in vain the morrow's sun rose as before dim and gloomy to wade along his dismal and wintry path without one glimpse of enlivening light from his rising to his setting we have already mentioned slightly those outrages to which the disease and misery that scourged the country in so many shapes had driven the unfortunate and perishing multitudes indeed if there be any violation of the law that can or ought to be looked upon with the most lenient consideration and forbearance by the executive authorities it is that which takes place under the irresistible pressure of famine and singular as it may appear it is no less true that this is a subject concerning which much ignorance prevails not only throughout other parts of the empire but even at home here in ireland with ourselves much for instance is said and has been said concerning what are termed years of famine but it is not generally known that since the introduction of the potato in this country no year has ever passed which in some remote locality or other has not been such to the unfortunate inhabitants the climate of ireland is so unsettled its soil so various in quality and the potato so liable to injury from excess of either drought or moisture 
that we have no hesitation in stating the startling fact of this annual famine as one we can vouch for upon our personal knowledge and against the truth of which we challenge contradiction neither does an autumn pass without a complaint peculiar to those who feed solely upon the new and unripe potato and which ever since the year thirty two is known by the people as the potato cholera with these circumstances the legislature ought to be acquainted inasmuch as they are calamities that will desolate and afflict the country so long as the potato is permitted to be as it unfortunately is the staple food of the people that we are subject in consequence of that fact to periodical recurrences of death and disease is well known and admitted but that every season brings its partial scourge of both these evils to various remote and neglected districts of ireland has not been what it ought long since to have been an acknowledged and established fact in the sanitary statistics of the country indeed one would imagine that after the many terrible visitations which we have had from destitution and pestilence a legislature sincerely anxious for the health and comfort of the people would have devoted itself in some reasonable measure to the human consideration of such proper sumptuary and sanatory enactments as would have provided not only against the recurrence of these evils but for a more enlightened system of public health and cleanliness and a better and more comfortable provision of food for the indigent and poor as it is at present provision dealers of all kinds mealmongers forestallers butchers bakers and hucksters combine together and sustain such a general monopoly in food as is at variance with the spirit of all law and humanity and constitutes a kind of artificial famine in the country and surely these circumstances ought not to be permitted so long as we have a deliberate legislature whose duty it is to watch and guard the health and morals of the people at the present period of our narrative and especially on the gloomy morning following the prophet's unconscious visit to the grave of the murdered man the popular outrages had risen to an alarming height up to the present time occasional outbreaks by small and detached groups of individuals had taken place at night or before dawn and rather in a timid or fugitive manner than with the recklessness of men who assemble in large crowds and set both law and all consequences at open defiance now however destitution and disease had wrought such woeful work among the general population that it was difficult to know where or how to prescribe bounds to the impetuous resentment with which they expressed themselves against those who held over large quantities of food in order to procure high prices at this moment the country with its waste unreaped crops tying in a state of plashy and fermenting ruin and its desolate and wintry aspect was in frightful keeping with the appearance of the people when thus congregated together we can only say that the famine crowds of that awful year should have been seen in order to have been understood and felt the whole country was in a state of dull but frantic tumult and the wild crowds as they came and went in the perpetuation of their melancholy outrages were worn down by such starling evidences of general poverty and suffering as were enough to fill the heart with fear as well as pity even to look upon their cadaverous and emaciated aspects had something in them so wild and wolfish and the fire of famine blazed so savagely in their hollow eyes that many of them looked like creatures changed from their very humanity by some judicial plague 
that had been sent down from heaven to punish and desolate the land. And, in truth, there is no doubt whatsoever that the intensity of their sufferings and the natural panic which was occasioned by the united ravages of disease and famine had weakened the powers of their understanding and impressed upon their bearing and features an expression which seemed partly the wild excitement of temporary frenzy and partly the dull hopeless apathy of fatuity a state to which it is well known that misery sickness and hunger altogether had brought down the strong intellect and reason of the wretched and famishing multitudes nor was this state of feeling confined to those who were goaded by the frightful sufferings that prevailed on the contrary thousands became victims of the quick and powerful contagion which spread the insane spirit of violence at a rapid rate affecting many during the course of the day who in the early part of the morning had not partaken of its influence to no other principle than this can we attribute the wanton and irrational outrages of many of the people every one acquainted with such awful visitations must know that their terrific realities cause them by wild influences that run through the whole masses to forget all the decencies and restraints of ordinary life until fear and shame and becoming respect for order all of which constitute the moral safety of society are thrown aside or resolved into the great tyrannical instinct of self-preservation which when thus stimulated becomes what may be termed the insanity of desolation we know that the most savage animals as well as the most timid will when impelled by its ravenous clamours alike forget every other appetite but that which is necessary for the sustainment of life urged by it alone they will sometimes approach and assail the habitations of man and in the fury of the moment expose themselves to his power and dare his resentment just as a famine mob will do when urged by the same instinct in a year of scarcity there is no beast however in the deepest jungle of africa itself so wild savage and ferocious as a human mob when left to its own blind and headlong impulses on the morning in question the whole country was pouring forth its famished hordes to intercept meal carts and provision vehicles of all descriptions on their way to market or to the next seaport for shipment or to attack the granaries of provision dealers and all who having food in large quantities refused to give it gratis or at a nominal price to the poor carts and cars therefore mostly the property of unoffending persons were stopped on the highways they are broken and the food which they carried openly taken away and in case of resistance those who had charge of them were severely beaten mills were also attacked and pillaged and in many instances large quantities of flour and grain not only carried off but wantonly and wickedly strewn about the streets and destroyed in all these acts of violence there was very little shouting the fact being that the wretched people were not able to shout unless on rare occasions and sooth to say their vociferations were then but a faint and feeble echo of the noisy tumults which in general characterize the proceedings of excited and angry crowds truly those pitiable gatherings had their own peculiarities of misery during the progress of the pillage individuals of every age sex and condition so far as condition can be applied to the lower classes might be seen behind ditches in remote nooks in porches of houses and many on the open highways and streets eating or rather gobbling up raw flour or oatmeal others more fortunate were tearing and devouring bread with a fury to which only the unnatural 
appetites of so many famished maniacs could be compared as might be expected most of these inconsiderate acts of license were punished by the consequences which followed them sickness of various descriptions giddiness retchings fainting fits convulsions and in some cases death itself were induced by this wolfish and frightful gluttony on the part of the starving people others however who possessed more sense and maintained a greater restraint over their individual sufferings might be seen in all directions hurrying home loaded with provisions of the most portable descriptions under which they tottered and panted and sometimes fell utterly prostrate from recent illness or the mere exhaustion of want aged people grey-haired old men and old women bent with age exhibited a wild and excited alacrity that was grievous to witness while hurrying homewards if they had a home or if not to the first friendly shelter they could get a kind of dim exalting joy feebly blazing in their heavy eyes and a wild sense of unexpected good fortune working in unnatural play upon the muscles of their wrinkled and miserable faces the ghastly impressions of famine however were not confined to those who composed the crowds even the children were little living skeletons wan and yellow with the spirit of pain and suffering legible upon their fleshless but innocent features while the very dogs as was well observed were not able to bark unless they stood against a wall for indeed such of them as survived were nothing but ribs and skin at all events they assisted in making up the terrible picture of general misery which the country at large presented both day and night but at night especially their hungry howlings could be heard over the country or mingling with wailings which the people were in the habit of pouring over those whom the terrible typhus was sweeping away with such wide and indiscriminate fatality our readers may now perceive that the sufferings of these unhappy crowds before they had been driven to these acts of violence were almost beyond belief at an early period of the season when the potatoes could not be dug miserable women might be seen early in the morning and in fact during all hours of the day gathering weeds of various descriptions in order to sustain life and happy were they who could procure a few handfuls of young nettles chicken-weed sorrel priscog buglass or seaweed to bring home as food either for themselves or their unfortunate children others again were glad to creep or totter to stock farms at great distances across the country in hope of being able to procure a portion of blood which on such melancholy occasions is taken from the heifers and bullocks that graze there in order to prevent the miserable poor from perishing by actual starvation and death alas little do our english neighbors know or dream of the horrors which attend a year of severe famine in this unhappy country the crowds which kept perpetual and incessant siege to the houses of wealthy and even of struggling small farmers were such as scarcely any pen could describe neither can we render anything like adequate justice to the benevolence and charity nay we ought to say the generosity and magnanimity of this and the middle class in general in no country on earth could such noble instances of self-denial and sublime humanity be witnessed it has happened in thousands of instances that the last miserable morsel the last mouthful of nourishing liquid the last potato or the last sixpence has been divided with wretched and desolate beings who required it more and this too by persons who when that was gone knew not to what quarter 
they could turn with a hope of replacing for themselves that which they had just shared in a spirit of such genuine and exalted piety footnote it is as well to state here that the season described in this tale is the dreadful and melancholy one of eighteen seventeen and we may add that in order to avoid the charge of having exaggerated the almost incredible sufferings of the people in that year we have studiously kept our descriptions of them within the limits of truth dr Cogigan, in his able and very sensible pamphlet on fever and famine as cause and effect in ireland a pamphlet by the way which has been the means of conveying the most important truths to statesmen and which ought to be looked on as of great public benefit has confirmed the accuracy of the gloomy pictures i was forced to draw here follow an extract or two it is scarcely necessary to call to recollection the summer of eighteen ten cold and wet corn uncut in november or rotting in the sheaves on the ground potatoes not ripened and when unripe there cannot be worse food containing more water than nutrient straw at such an extravagant price as to render the obtaining of it for bedding almost impossible and when procured retaining from its half fermented state so much moisture that the use was perhaps worse than the want of it the same agent that destroyed the harvest spoiled the turf seldom had such a multiplication of evils come together in some of the former years although food and bedding were deficient the portion saved was of good quality and fuel was not wanting but in eighteen fifteen every comfort that might have compensated for partial want was absent this description applies to the two years of eighteen sixteen and eighteen seventeen in the midsummer of eighteen seventeen the blaze of fever was over the entire country it had burst forth in almost a thousand different points within the short space of a month in the summer of eighteen seventeen the epidemic sprung forth in tremor ugal kinsale trolley and clonamal in carrick on sewer illoscria ballina castlebar belfast amar omog londonderry monasterven tullamore and slane this simultaneous breakout shows that there must have been some universal cause and again the poor were deprived of employment and were driven from the doors where before they had already received relief lest they should introduce disease with them thus destitution and fever continued in a vicious circle each impelling the other while want of presence of mind aggravated a thousandfold the terrible infliction of the miseries that attend a visitation of epidemic fever few can form a conception the mere relation of the scenes that occurred in the country even in one of its last visitations makes one shudder in reading them as barker and chain observe in their report a volume might be filled with instances of the distress occasioned by the visitation of fever in eighteen seventeen on the road leading from cork within a mile of the town Contruc, i visit a woman laboring under typhus on her left lay a child very ill at the foot of the bed another child just able to crawl about and on her right the corpse of a third child who had died two days previously which the unhappy mother could not get removed in a letter from dr o'leary conturk ellen pagan a young woman whose husband was obliged in order to seek employment to leave her almost destitute in a miserable cabin with three children 
gave the shelter of her roof to a poor beggar who had fever. She herself caught the disease, and from the terror created in the neighborhood was, with her three children, deserted, except that some person left a little water and milk at the window for the children, one about four, the other about three years old, and the other an infant at her breast. In this way she continued for a week, when a neighbor sent her a loaf of bread, which was left in the window. Four days after this he grew uneasy about her, and one night, having prepared some tea and bread, he set off to her relief. When he arrived, the following scene presented itself. In the window lay the loaf where it had been deposited four days previously. In one corner of the cabin, on a little straw, without covering of any kind, lay the wretched mother, actually dying, and her infant, dead by her side, for the want of that sustenance which she had not to give. On the floor lay the children, to all appearance dying also of cold and hunger. At first they refused to take anything, and he had to pour a little liquid down their throats. With the cautious administration of food, they gradually recovered. The woman expired before the visitor quitted the house. This in a letter from Dr. McCarthy Monivet. A man, his wife, and two children lay together in a fever. The man died in the night. His wife, nearly convalescent, was so terrified with his corpse in the same bed with her that she relapsed and died in two days after. The children recovered from fever, but the eldest lost his reason by the fright. Many other scenes have I witnessed which would be too tedious to relate. This is from the Barker and O'Hane's report. I know not of any visitation so much to be dreaded as epidemic fever. It is worse than the plague, for it lasts throughout all seasons. Cholera may seem more frightful, but it is in reality less destructive. It terminates rapidly in death or in as rapid recovery. His visitation, too, is short, and it leaves those who recover unimpaired in health and strength. Civil war, were it not for its crimes, would be, as far as regards the welfare of a country, a visitation less to be dreaded than epidemic fever. It is not possible, then, to form an exaggerated picture of the sufferings of a million and a half people in these countries, in their convalescence from fever, deprived of not only the comforts, but even the necessaries of life, with scanty food and fuel, and covering only rising from fever to slowly fall victims to those numerous chronic diseases that are sure to seize upon enfeebled constitutions. Death would be to many a more merciful dispensation than such a recovery. This is from famine and fever as cause and effect in Ireland, etc., etc., by D. J. Cogigan, Esquire, M.D., M.K.C.S.B., Dublin, J. Fannin and Company, Grafton Street. End of footnote. It was to such a state of general tumult that the prophet and his family arose on the morning of the following day. As usual, he was grim and sullen, but on this occasion his face had a pallid and sunken look in it, which apparently added at least ten years to his age. There was little spoken, and after breakfast he prepared to go out. Sarah, during the whole morning, watched his looks, and paid marked attention to everything he said. He appeared, however, to be utterly unconscious of the previous night's adventure, a fact which his daughter easily perceived, and which occasioned her to feel a kind of vague compassion for him, in consequence of the advantage it might give Nelly over him for of late she began to participate in her father's fears and suspicions of that stubborn and superstitious personage. Father, said she, as he was about to go out, 
"'Is it fair to ax where you are going?' "'It's neither fair nor foul,' he replied. "'But if it's any satisfaction to you to know, I won't tell you. "'Have you any objections, then, that I should walk a piece of the way with you? "'Not if you have come to your senses, as you ought, about what I mentioned to you.' I have something to say to you, she replied, without noticing the allusion he had made, something that you ought to know. And why not mention it here, where we are? Because I don't wish her there to know it. Thank you, ma'am, replied Nelly. I feel your kindness. And, dear me, what a sight of wisdom I'll lose by being kept out of the secret. Secret, indeed, a fig for yourself and your secret. Maybe I have my secret as well as you. Well, then, replied Sarah. If you have, do you keep yours as I'll keep mine, and then we'll be equal. Come, father, for I must go from home, too. Indeed, I think this is the last day I'll be with either of you for some time, maybe ever. What do you mean, said the father? Hut, said the mother, what a goose you are. Charlie Hanlon, to be sure. I suppose she'll run off with him. Oh, then God pity him or any other one that's doomed to be blistered with you. Sarah flashed like lightning, and her frame began to work with that extraordinary energy which always accompanied the manifestation of her resentment. "'You will,' said she, approaching the other. "'You will, after your escape the other day.' "'You? No. Ah, no. I won't now. I forgot myself. Come, father, come, come. My last quarrel with her is over.' "'I returned Nelly as they went out. There you go, and sweet pair you are.' father and daughter now father resumed sarah after they had got out of hearing will you tell me if you slept well last night why do you ax he replied to be sure i did i'll tell you why i ax she answered do you know that you went last night in the middle of the night to the murdered man's grave in the glen there it is impossible to express the look of astonishment and dismay which he turned up on her at these words sarah he said sternly but she interrupted him it's truth said she and i went with what are you speaking about me go out and not know it nonsense you went in your sleep she rejoined did i speak said he with a black and ghastly look what what tell me hey what did i say you talked a good deal and said that it was condy dalton that murdered him and that you had read rotty to prove it that was what i said hey sarah that's what you said and i thought it was only right to tell you it was right sarah but at the same time at the peril of your life never follow me there again of course you know now that sullivan is buried there i do said she but that's no great comfort although it is to know that you didn't murder him at any rate father remember what i told you about condy dalton leave him to god and just that you may feel what you ought to feel on the subject suppose you were in his situation suppose for a minute that it was yourself that murdered him then ask would you like to be dragged out from us and hanged in your old age like a dog a disgrace to all belonging to you father i'll believe that condy dalton murdered him when i hear it from his own lips but not till then now good-bye you won't find me at home when you come back i think why where are you going there's plenty for me to do she replied there's the sick and the dying on all hands about me and it's a shame for any one that has a heart in their body to see their fellow creatures gasping for want of a drop of cold water to wet their lips or a hand to turn them where they lie think of how many poor strangers is lying in ditches and in barns and in outhouses without a living being almost to look to them or reach them any single thing they want no even to bring the priest to them that they might die reconciled to the almighty isn't it a shame then for me and the likes of me that has health and strength and nothing to do to see my fellow creatures dying on all hands about me for want of the very assistance that i can afford them at any rate i wouldn't live in the house with that woman and you know that and that i oughtn't 
but aren't you afeard of catchin' this terrible fever that's taken away so many if you go among them? Afeard, she replied. No, father, I feel no fear either of that or anything else. If I die, I leave a world that I never had much happiness in, and I know that I'll never be happy again in it. What then have I to fear from death? Any change for me must now be for the better. At all events, it can hardly be for the worse. No, my happiness is gone. What in heaven's name is the matter with you? asked her father. And what brings the big tears into your eyes that way? Good-bye, said she, and as she spoke, a melancholy smile, at once sad and brilliant, irradiated her features. It's not likely, father, that ever you will see me under your roof again. Forgive me all my follies now. Maybe it's the last time ever you'll have an opportunity. Tut, you foolish girl. It's enough to sicken one to hear you speak such stuff. She stood and looked at him for a moment, and the light of her smile gradually deepened, or rather faded away, until nothing remained but a face of exquisite beauty deeply shadowed by anxiety and distress. End of section 9「Section 10 of The Black Prophet by William Carlton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10. The prophet pursued his way to Dick of the Granges, whither, indeed, he was bent. Sarah, having looked after him for a moment with a troubled face, proceeded in the direction of old Dalton's, with the sufferings and pitiable circumstances of whose family she was already but too well acquainted. Her journey across the country presented her with little else than records of death, suffering, and outrage. Along the roads the funerals were so frequent that, in general, they excited no particular notice. They could, in fact, scarcely be termed funerals, inasmuch as they were now nothing more than squalid and meagre-looking knots of those who were immediately related to the deceased, hurrying onward with reckless speed and disturbed looks to the churchyard, where their melancholy burden was hastily covered up with scarcely any exhibition of that simple and affecting decorum or of those sacred and natural sorrows which in other circumstances throw their tender but solemn light over the last offices of death as she went along new and more startling objects of distress attracted her notice in dry and sheltered places she observed little temporary sheds which in consequence of the dreadful panic which always accompanies an epidemic in ireland had to a timid imagination something fearful about them especially when it was considered that death and contagion were then at work in them in such terrible shapes to sarah however they had no terrors so far from that a great portion of the day was spent by her in relieving their wretched and in many cases dying inmates as well as she could she brought them water lit fires for them fixed up their shed and even begged aid for them from the neighbors around and as far as she could did everything to ease their pain or smooth their last moment by the consolation of her sympathy if she met a family on the highway worn with either illness or fatigue perhaps an unhappy mother surrounded by a helpless brood bearing or rather tottering under a couple of sick children who were unable to walk she herself perhaps also ill as was often the case she would instantly take one of them out of the poor creature's arms and carry it in her own as far as she happened to go in that direction, utterly careless of contagion or all other consequences. In this way was she engaged 
towards evening when at a turn of the road she was met by a large crowd of rioters headed by red roddy tom dalton and many others in the parish who were remarkable only for a tendency to ruffianism and outrage for we may remark here that on occasions such as we are describing it is generally those who have suffered least and have but little or nothing to complain of that lead the misguided and thoughtless people into crime and ultimately into punishment the change that had come over young dalton was frightful he was not half his former size his clothes were now in rags his beard grown his whole aspect and appearance that of some miscreant in whom it was difficult to say whether the ruffian or the idiot predominated the most he appeared now in his glory frantic and destructive but amidst all this driveling impetuosity it was not difficult to detect some desperate and unshaken purpose in his heavy but violent and bloodshot eyes far different from him was red roddy who headed his own section of them with an easy but knowing swagger now nodding his head with some wonderful purpose which nobody could understand or winking at some acquaintance with an indefinite meaning that set them guessing at it in vain it was easy to see that he was a knave but one of those knaves on whom no earthly reliance could be placed and who would betray to-morrow for good reasons and without a moment's hesitation those whom he had corrupted to-day come tom said roddy we have scattered a few of the meal-monging vagabonds weren't you talking about that blessed votine old darby scanadra the villain that allowed peggy murtaugh and her child to starve to death aren't we to pay him a visit dalton coughed several times to clear his throat a settled hoarseness having given a frightful hollowness to his voice ay said he ha 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 by the broken heart she died of well well eh roddy what are we to do to him roddy looked significantly at the crowd and grinned and touched his forehead and pointed at dalton that boy's up to everything said he he's the man to lead us all ha ha never mind laughing at him anyway observed one of his friends maybe if you suffered what he did poor fellow and his family too that it's not fun you'd be making of him why asked a newcomer what's wrong with him he's not at himself replied the other ever since he had the fever that they say and the death of a very pretty girl he was going to be married to has put him beside himself the lord save us come on now shouted tom in his terrible voice here's the greatest of all before us still who wants meal now come on i say ha 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 is there any of you hungry is there any of you going to die for want of food now's your time ho ho now peggy now ain't i doing it i am i and it's all for your sake peggy dear for i swore by the broken heart you died of ay and didn't i tell you that last night on your grave where i slept no he wouldn't he wouldn't but now now he'll see the differ ay and feel it too come on he shouted who's ever hungry follow me ha 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 this idiotic but ferocious laugh echoing such a dreadful purpose was appalling but the people who knew what he had suffered only felt it as a more forcible incentive to outrage darby's residence was now quite at hand and in a few minutes it was surrounded by such a multitude both of men and women as no other occasion could ever bring together the people were in fact almost lost in their own garments some were without coats or waistcoats to protect them from the elements having been forced poor wretches to part with them for food others had nightcaps or handkerchiefs upon their head instead of hats a certain proof that they were only in a state of convalescence from fever 
the women stood with disheveled hair some of them half naked and others leading their children about or bearing them in their arms altogether they presented such an appearance as was enough to wring the benevolent heart with compassion and sorrow for their sufferings on arriving at darby's house they found it closed but not deserted at first tom dalton knocked and desired the door to be open but the women who were present whether with shame or with honor to the sex we are at a loss to say felt so eager on the occasion probably for the purpose of avenging peggy murtaugh that they lost not a moment in shivering in the windows and attacking the house with stones and missiles of every description in a few minutes the movement became so general and simultaneous that the premises were a perfect wreck and nothing was to be seen but meal and flour and food of every description either borne off by the hungry crowd or scattered most wickedly and wantonly through the streets while in the very midst of the tumult tom dalton was seen dragging poor darby out by the throat and over to the centre of the street now said he here i have you at last ha 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 his voice by the way as he spoke and laughed had become fearfully deep and hollow now peggy dear didn't i swear it by the broken heart you died of i said and i'll keep that sacred oath darlin while speaking the thin fleshless face of the miser was becoming black his eyes were getting bloodshot and in a very short time strangulation must have closed his wretched existence when a young and tall female threw herself by a bound upon dalton whom she caught by the throat precisely as he himself had caught darby it was sarah who saw that there was but little time to lose in order to save the wretch's life her grip was so effectual that dalton was obliged to relax his hold upon the other for the purpose of defending himself who is this said he let me go you had better till i have his life let me go i say it's one she replied that's not afeard but ashamed of you you a young man to go strangle a weak helpless old creature that hasn't strength or breath to defend himself no more than a child didn't he starve peggy murtaugh replied tom ha 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 didn't he starve her and her child no she replied aloud and with glowing cheeks it's false it wasn't he but yourself that starved her and her child who deserted her who brought her to shame and to sorrow in her own heart and in the eyes of the world who left her to the bitter and vile tongues of the whole country who refused to marry her and kept her so that she couldn't raise her face before her fellow creatures who sent her without hope or any expectation of happiness in this life this miserable life to the glens and lonely ditches about the neighborhood where she did nothing but shed bitter tears of despair and shame at the heartless lot you brought her to and when she was deserted by the wide world and hadn't a friendly face to look to but god's and when one kind word from your lips would give her hope and comfort and happiness where were you and where was that kind word that would have saved her let the old man go you unmanly coward it wasn't him that starved her it was yourself that starved her and broke her heart did you hear that said dalton ha 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 and it's all true she has told me nothing but the truth here then take the old vagabond away with you and do what you like with him i'm a bold and a ramblin boy my lodgings in the isle of troy a ramblin boy although i'll be i'll leave them all and folly thee ha 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 but come boys pull away we'll finish the wreck of this house at any rate wreck away said sarah i have nothing to do with that but i think them women man women i ought to call them might consider that there's many a starvin' mouth that would be glad to have a little of what they're throwin' about so shamefully do you come with me darby i'll save you as far as i can and as long as i am able 
I will, Ochre, replied Darby, and may God bless you, for you have saved my life, but why should they attack me? Sure the world knows, and God knows, that my heart bleeds. Shh, she exclaimed, the world and God both know it's a lie if you say your heart bleeds for anything but the destruction that you see on your place. If you had given Peggy Murtaugh the meal, she might be a livin' woman to-day. So no more falsehoods now, or I'll turn you back to Tom Dalton's clutches. No, then, replied the trembling wretch, I won't. But between you and me, then, and it needn't go any farther, truth my heart bleeds for the severity that's one word more, she replied, and I'll leave you to what you'll get. Sarah's inference had a singular effect upon the crowd. The female portion of it, having reflected upon her words, soon felt and acknowledged their truth, because they involved a principle of justice and affection to their sex, while the men, without annexing any moral consideration to the matter, felt themselves influenced by her exquisite figure and great beauty. "'She's the black prophet's daughter,' exclaimed the women, "'and if the devil was in her, she told Dom Dalton nothing but the truth at any rate. "'And they say the devil is in her, the Lord save us. "'If ever he was in any one, keep away from her. "'My soul in heaven, but she'd think no more of tearing your eyes out "'or sticking you with a case knife than you would have eaten bread and butter.' Blessed father, exclaimed another, did you see the brightness of her eyes while she was speaking? No matter what she is, said a young fellow beside them, the devil a prettier creature ever was made. By my soul, I only wish I had a thousand pounds. I wouldn't be long without a wife at any rate. The crowd, having wrecked Skinadra's dwelling and carried off and destroyed almost his whole stock of provisions, now proceeded in a different direction with the intention of paying a similar visit to some similar character. Sarah and Darby, for he dost not venture, for the present towards his own house, now took their way to the cabin of old Condy Dalton, where they arrived just in time to find the house surrounded by the officers of justice and some military. Ah! thought Sarah on seeing them. It is done, then, and you lost but a little time about it. May God forgive you, father. They had scarcely entered when one of the officers, pulling out a paper, looked at it and asked, Isn't your name Condy or Cornelius Dalton? That is my name, said the old man. I arrest you, then, he continued, for the murder of one Bartholomew Sullivan. It is the will of God, replied the old man, while the tears flowed down his cheeks it's god's will and i won't conceal it any longer take me away i'm guilty i'm guilty chapter twenty one condy dalton goes to prison the scene that presented itself in condy dalton's miserable cabin was one indeed which might well harrow any heart not utterly callous to human sympathy the unhappy old man had been sitting in the armchair we have alluded to, his chin resting on his breast, and his mind apparently absorbed in deep and painful reflection, when the officers of justice entered. Many of our landlord readers, and all probably of our absentee ones, will, in the simplicity of their ignorance regarding the actual state of the lower classes, most likely take it for granted that the picture we are about to draw exists nowhere but in our own imagination would to god that it were so gladly and willingly would we take to ourselves all the shame acknowledge all the falsehood pay the highest penalty for all the moral guilt of our misrepresentations provided only any one acquainted with the country could prove to us that we are wrong change our nature, or, in other words, falsify the evidence of our senses and obliterate our experience of the truths we are describing. Old Dalton was sitting, as we have said, in the only memorial of his former respectability now left him, the old armchair, when the men bearing the warrant for his arrest presented themselves. The rain was pouring down in that close, dark, and incessant fall, 
which gives scarcely any hope of its ending and throws the heart into that anxious and gloomy state which every one can feel and perhaps no one describe the cabin in which the daltons now lived was of the poorest description when ejected from their large holding by Dick of the Grange, or, in other words, were auctioned out, they were unhappily at a loss where to find a place in which they could take a temporary refuge. A kind neighbor who happened to have the cabin in question lying unoccupied, or rather waste upon his hands, made them an offer of it, not, as he said, in the expectation that they could live in it for any length of time, but merely until they could provide themselves with a more comfortable and suitable abode. He wished, he added, it was better for their sakes, and sorry he was to see such a family brought so low as to live in it at all. Alas, he knew not at the time how deeply the unfortunate family in question were steeped in distress and poverty. They accepted this miserable cabin but in spite of every effort to improve their condition, days, weeks, and months passed, and still found them unable to make a change for the better. When Darby and Sarah entered, they found young Con, who had now relapsed, lying in one corner of the cabin on a wretched shake-down bed of damp straw, while on another of the same description lay his amiable and affectionate sister nancy the cabin stood as we have said in a low moist situation the floor of it being actually lower which is a common case than the ground about it outside it served however as a receptacle for the damp and underwater which the incessant downpouring of rain during the whole season had occasioned it was therefore dangerous to tread upon the floor it was so soft and slippery the rain which fell heavily now came down through the roof in so many places that they were forced to put under it such vessels as they could spare not even excepting the beds over each of which were placed old clothes doubled up under dishes pots and little bowls in order if possible to keep them dry the house if such could be called was almost destitute of furniture nothing but a few pots dishes wooden noggins some spoons and some stools being their principal furniture with the exception of one standing short-posted bed in a corner near the fire there then in that low damp dark pestilential crawl without chimney or window sat the old man who notwithstanding its squalid misery could have looked upon it as a palace had he been able to say to his own heart i am not a murderer there we say he sat alone surrounded by pestilence and famine in their most fearful shapes listening to the moanings of his sick family and the ceaseless dropping of the rain which fell into vessels that were placed to receive it mrs dalton was out a term which was used in the bitter misery of the period to indicate that the person to whom it applied had been driven to the last resource of mendicancy and his other daughter mary had gone to a neighbor's house to beg a little fire as the old man uttered the words no language could describe the misery which was depicted on his countenance take me he exclaimed ah no for then what will become of these pointing to his son and daughter who were sick the very minions of the law felt for him and the chief of them said in a voice of kindness and compassion it is a distressing case but if you'll be guided by me you won't say anything that may be brought against you i was never engaged said he looking towards darby and sarah to whom he partly addressed his discourse in anything so painful as this a man of his age now after so many years however well it can't be helped we must do our duty where is the rest of your family asked another of them is this young woman a daughter of yours not at all replied a third this is a daughter of the black prophet himself and by japers 
you hardened gypsy it's a little too bad for you to come to see how your blasted old father's work gets done it's his evidence that's bringing this decent old man from his family to a goal this miserable evening be off out of this i desire you i wonder you're not ashamed to be present here above all places in the world you brazen devil sarah's whole soul however in all its best and noblest sympathies had passed into and mingled with the scene of unparalleled misery which was then before her she went rapidly to the bed in which young con was stretched stooped down and looking closely at him perceived that he was in a broken and painful slumber she then passed to that in which his sister lay and saw that she was also asleep after a glance at each she rubbed her hands with a kind of wild satisfaction and going up to old dalton exclaimed for she had not heard a syllable of the language used towards her by the officer of justice ay said she laying her hand upon his white hairs you are to be pitied this night poor old man but which of you oh which of you is to be pitied most you or them and your wife too and your other daughter and your other son too but he's past understanding it oh what will they do at your age too at your age oh couldn't you die couldn't you contrive some way to die couldn't you give one great struggle and then break your heart as once and forever these words were uttered rapidly but in a low and cautious voice for she still feared to awaken those who slept the old man had also been absorbed in his own misery, for he looked at her inquiringly and only replied, Poor girl, what is it you're saying? I'm bidding you to die, she replied. If you can, you needn't be afeard of God. He has punished you enough for the crime you have committed. Try and die if you can, or if you can't, oh, she exclaimed, I pray God that you, that he, there, and she ran and bent over young Con's bed for a moment, that you, that you may never recover or live to see what you must see. It's a fact that between hunger and this sickness, continued he who had addressed her last, they say, and I know, that there's a great number of people silly, but I think this lady is downright mad. What do you mean, you clip? Sarah stared at him impatiently, but without any anger. He doesn't hear me, she added, again putting her hand in a distracted manner upon Dalton's grey hair. No, no, but since it can't be so, there's not a minute to be lost. Oh, take him away now, she proceeded. Take him away while they're asleep, and before his wife and daughter comes home. Take him away now, and spare him, spare them spare them all as much sufferin as you can there's not much madness in that jack returned one of them i think it would be the best thing we could do are you ready to come now dalton asked the man who's that said the old man in a voice of indescribable woe and sorrow who's that was talkin of a broken heart oh god he exclaimed looking up to heaven with a look of intense agony support me support them and if it be your blessed will pity us all but above all things pity them o oh, heavenly father and don't punish them for my sin it's false exclaimed sarah looking on dalton and reasoning apparently with herself he never committed a cold-blooded murder and the sullivans are are oh take him away she said still in a low rapid voice take him away come now she added approaching dalton again come while they're asleep and you'll save them and yourself much distress i'm not afeard of your wife for she can bear it if any wife could but i do your poor daughter and she so weak and feeble after her illness come dalton looked at her and said who is this girl that seems to feel so much for me but whoever she is may god bless her for i feel that she's right take me away before they awaken oh she is right in every word she says for i'm not afeard of my wife her trust in god is too firm for anything to shake i'm ready but i fear i'll scarcely be able to walk all the way and such an evening too 
young woman will you break this business to these ones and to my wife as you can oh i will i will she replied as well as i can you did well to say so she added in a low voice to herself and i'll stay here with your sick family and watch and attend them whatever can be done by the like of me for them i'll do i'll i'll not leave them i'll nurse them i'll take care of them i'll beg for them oh what would i not do for them and while speaking she bent over young con's bed and clasping her hands and wringing them several times she repeated oh what i wouldn't do for you may god bless you best of girls whoever you are come now i'm ready ay said sarah running over to him that's right i'll break the bitter news to them as well as it can be done come now the old man stood in the midst of his desolation with his hat in his hand and he looked towards the beds poor things he exclaimed what a change has come over you for what you once and that not long since were never my darling children oh never did one harsh or undutiful word come from your lips to your unhappy father in my old age and misery i'm now leaving you maybe forever never maybe to see you again in this world and oh my god if we are never to meet in the other if the innocent and the guilty is never to meet then this is my last look at you for everlasting for everlasting i can't do it he added weeping bitterly i must take my leave of them i must kiss their lips sarah while he spoke had uttered two or three convulsive sobs but she shed no tears on the contrary her eyes were singularly animated and brilliant she put her arms about him and said in a soothing and solicitous tone oh no it's all true but if you kiss them you'll disturb and waken them and then you know when they see you taken away in this manner and here's what it's for it may be their death true achora true well i will only look at them then let me keep my eyes on them for the little maybe they may go first and maybe i may go first the last time may be for everlasting that i'll see them he went over as he spoke sarah still having her hand upon his arm as if to intimate her anxiety to keep him under such control as might prevent him from awakening them and standing first over the miserable bed where nancy slept he looked down upon her ay said he while the tears showered down his cheeks there lies the child that never vexed a parent's heart or ruffled one of our tempers may the blessin if it is a blessin or can be a blessin it is it is said sarah with a quick short sob it is a blessin and a holy blessin but bless him bless him too may my blessin rest upon you or rather may the blessin of almighty god rest upon you daughter of my heart and you too he proceeded turning to the other bed here is him that among them all i loved the best my youngest and called after myself may my blessin and the blessin of god and my saviour rest upon you my darling son and if i never see either of you in this unhappy world grant o merciful father that we may meet in the glory of heaven when that stain will be taken away from me for that crime that i have repented for so long and so bitterly sarah while he spoke had let go his arm and placing her two hands over her eyes her whole breast quivered and the men on looking at her saw the tears gushing out in torrents from between her fingers she turned round however for a few moments as if to compose herself and when she again approached the old man there was a smile a smile brilliant but agitated in her eyes and upon her lips there now she proceeded you have said all you can say come go with them ah she exclaimed with a start of pain all we've done or tried to do is lost i doubt here's his wife and daughter come out now said she addressing him say a word or two to them outside just as she spoke 
mrs dalton and the poor invalid mary entered the house the one with some scanty supply of food and the other bearing a live coal between two turf one under and the other over it wait said sarah i'll speak to them before they come in and ere the words were uttered she met them come here mrs dalton said she stop a minute speak to this poor girl and support her these soldiers and the constables inside is come about sullivan's business long ago i know it replied mrs dalton i've just heard all about it there beyond but she pointing to her daughter has only crossed the ditch from the commons and joined me this minute give me these said sarah to the girl and stay here till i come out again wet as it is your mother will tell you why she took the fire from her as she spoke and running in laid it upon the hearth placing at the same time two or three turf about in a hurried manner but still in a way that argued great presence of mind amid all her distraction on going out again however the first object she saw was one of the soldiers supporting the body of poor mary who had sunk under the intelligence mrs dalton having entered the cabin and laid down the miserable pittance of food which she had been carrying now waved her hand with authority and singular calmness but at the same time with a face as pallid as death itself this is a solemn hour said she and a woeful sight in this place of misery keep quiet all of you i know what this is about dear condy she said i know it but what is the value of our faith if it doesn't teach us obedience kiss your child here said she and go or come i ought to say for i will go with you it's not to be wondered at that she couldn't bear it weak and worn and dearly heartbroken as she is bless her too before you go and this girl she said pointing at mary and addressing sarah you will speak to her and support her as well as you can and stay with them all for an hour or two i can't leave him dalton while she spoke had taken mary in his arms kissed her and as in the case of the others blessed her with a fervour only surpassed by his sorrow and utter despair i will stay with them said sarah don't doubt that not for an hour or two but till they come to either life or death so i told him it's a bitter case said mrs dalton a bitter case but then it's god's gracious will and them that he loves he chastises blessed be his name for all he does and blessed be his name for ever for this mary now recovered in her father's arms and her mother in a low but energetic voice pointing to the beds said think of them darlin there now part with him this world i often told you dear mary is not our place but our passage and although it's painful let us not forget that it is god himself that is guiding and directing us through it come con dear come a long mournful embrace and another sorrowful but fervent blessing and with a feeble effort at consolation dalton parted with the weeping girl and placing his hat on his white head he gave one long look one indescribable look upon all that was so dear to him in this scene of unutterable misery and departed he had not gone far however when he returned a step or two towards the door and mary having noticed this went to him and throwing her arms once more about his neck exclaimed o oh, father darlin and is it come to this oh did we ever complain or grumble about all we suffered while we had you with us no we wouldn't what was our sufferings father dear nothing but oh nothing ever broke our hearts or troubled us but to see you in such sorrow it's true mary darlin you were all all a blessing to me but i feel treasure of my heart that my sorrows and my cares will soon be over it's about tom i come back 
Och, sure I don't care what he or we might suffer if it had pleased God to leave him in his senses. But maybe now he's happier than we are. Tell him, if he can understand it, or when he does understand it, that I leave my blessin' and God's blessin' with him forevermore, forevermore, and with you all, and with you too, young woman, for evermore, amen. And now come, I submit myself to the will of my merciful Saviour. He looked up to heaven as he spoke, his two hands raised aloft, after which he covered his venerable head, and with this pious and noble instance of resignation did the affectionate old man proceed as well as his feeble limbs could support him to the county prison accompanied by his pious and truly christian wife as the men were about to go he who had addressed sarah so rudely approached her with as much regret on his face as its hardened and habitual indifference to human misery could express and said tapping her on the shoulder i was rather rough to you just now my pretty girl to be jabbers it is you that is the pretty girl i dunno by the way how the old black prophet came by the likes of you but then he was a handsome vagabond his day himself and you are like him what do you want to say she asked impatiently but stand outside i won't speak to you here your voice would waken a corpse here now she added having gone out upon the causeway what is it why devil a thing he replied only you're a better girl than i took you to be it's a pitiful case this a woeful case at his time of life be heaveners but i'd rather a thousand times see black boy your own precious father swing than this poor old man a moment's temporary fury was visible but she paused and it passed away after which she returned slowly and thoughtfully into the cabin it is unnecessary to say that almost immediately the general rumor of dalton's arrest for the murder had gone through the whole parish together with the fact that it was upon the evidence of the black prophet and red roddy duncan that the proof of it had been brought home to him upon the former occasion there had been nothing against him but such circumstances of strong suspicion as justified the neighboring magistrates in having him taken into custody on this however the two men were ready to point out the identical spot where the body had been buried and to identify it as that of bartholomew sullivan nothing remained therefore now that dalton was in custody but to hold an inquest upon the remains and to take the usual steps for the trial of dalton at the following assizes which were not very far distant indeed notwithstanding the desolation that prevailed throughout the country and in spite of the care and sorrow which disease and death brought home to so many in the neighborhood there was a very general feeling of compassion experienced for poor old dalton and his afflicted family and among those who sympathized with them there was scarcely one who expressed himself more strongly upon the subject than mr travers the head agent of the property on which they had lived especially upon contrasting the extensive farm and respectable residence from which their middleman landlord had so harshly and unjustly ejected them with the squalid kennel in which they then endured such a painful and pitiable existence this gentleman had come to the neighborhood in order to look closely into the condition of the property which had been entrusted to his management in consequence of a great number of leases having expired some of which had been held by extensive and wealthy middlemen among the latter of whom was our friend dick of the grange the estate was the property of an english nobleman who derived an income of thirty-two or thirty-three thousand a year from it and who though as landlords went was not in many respects a bad one yet 
when called upon to aid in relieving the misery of those from whose toil he drew so large an income did actually remit the munificent sum of one hundred pounds a recent fact the agent himself was one of those men who are capable of a just but not of a generous action he could for instance sympathize with the frightful condition of the people but to contribute to their relief was no part of his duty yet he was not a bad man in his transactions with his landlord's tenancy he was fair impartial and considerate whenever he could do a good turn or render a service without touching his purse he would do it he had it is true very little intercourse with the poorer classes of under tenants but whenever circumstances happened to bring them before him they found him a hard just man who paid attention to their complaints but who in a case of doubt always preferred the interest of his employer or his own to theirs he had received many complaints and statements against the middlemen who resided upon the property and he had duly and carefully considered them his present visit therefore proceeded from a determination to look closely into the state and condition of the general tenancy by which he meant as well those who derived immediately from the head landlord as those who held under middlemen one virtue he possessed which in an agent deserves every praise he was inaccessible to bribery on the one hand or flattery on the other and he never permitted his religious or political principles to degenerate into prejudice so far as to interfere with the impartial discharge of his duty such was robert james travers esq and we only wish that every agent in the country at large would follow his example chapter twenty two reappearance of the box friendly dialogue between jimmy brannigan and the peddler the next morning but one after the committal of condy dalton the strange woman who had manifested such an anxious interest in the recovery of the tobacco box was seated at her humble fireside in a larger and more convenient cottage than that which we have described where she was soon joined by charlie hanlon who had already made it so comfortable and convenient that she was able to contribute something towards her own support by letting what are termed in the country parts of ireland dry lodgings her only lodger on this occasion was our friend the peddler who had been domiciled with her ever since his arrival in the neighbourhood and whose principal traffic we may observe consisted in purchasing the flowing and luxuriant heads of hair which necessity on the one hand and fear of fever on the other induced the country maidens to part with this traffic indeed was very general during the period we are describing the fact being that the poor people especially the females had conceived a notion and not a very unreasonable one too that a large crop of hair not only predisposed them to the fever which then prevailed but rendered their recovery from it more difficult these notions to be sure resulted naturally enough from the treatment which medical men found it necessary to adopt in dealing with it every one being aware that in order to relieve the head whether by blister or other application it is necessary to remove the hair be this however as it may it is our duty to state here that the traffic we allude to was very general and that many a lovely and luxuriant crop came under the shears of the peddler who then strolled through the country after all aunt said hanlon after having bidden her good morrow i'm afraid it was a foolish weakness to depend upon a dream i see nothing clear in the business yet here now we have got the box and what are we the nearer to the discovery well replied his aunt for in that relation she stood to him is it nothing to get even that sure we know now that it was his and 
do you think that m'gowan or as they call him the black prophet would be in such a state to get it and his wife too it seems unless there was some reason on their part beyond the common to come at it it's a dark business altogether but aren't we thrown out of all trace of it in the meantime just when we thought ourselves on the straight road to the discovery it turns out to be another and a different murder entirely the murder of one sullivan at this moment the peddler who had been dressing himself in another small apartment made his appearance just in time to catch his concluding words and now hanlon added it appears that sullivan's body has been found at last the black prophet and body duncan knows all about the murder and can prove the act home to condy dalton and identify the body they say besides the peddler looked at the speakers with a face of much curiosity and interest then mused for a time and at length took a turn or two about the floor after which he sat down and began to drum his fingers on the little table which had been placed for breakfast after i get my breakfast he said at length i'll thank you to let me know what i have to pay it's not my intention to stop under this roof any longer i don't think i'd be overly safe safe arrah why so asked the woman why he replied ever since i came here you have done nothing but collogue collogue and whisper and lay your heads together and divil a sibyl can i hear that hasn't murder at the front and rear of it either speak out or get me my bill if you're of that stamp it's time for me to travel not that i'm so rich as to make it worth anybody's while to take the mouthful of wind out of me that's in me what do you mean by this discourse may god rest the souls of the dead replied the woman but it's not for nothing that we talk as we do and if you knew but all you wouldn't think so very likely he replied in a dry but dissatisfied voice maybe sure enough that the more i'd know of it the less i'd like of it here now is a man named sullivan barney bill or bartley or some such name that has been murdered and it seems the murderer was sent to gaol yesterday evening the villain get me my bill i say it's an unsafe neighbourhood and i'll take myself out of it while i'm able it's not without reason we talk of murder then replied the woman faith maybe so but get my bill then i bid you and in the meantime let me have my breakfast as it is i tell you both that i carry no money to signify about me tell him the truth aunt said hanlon there's no use in lying under his suspicion wrongfully or allowing him to leave your little place for no reason the truth is then she proceeded throwing the corner of her apron over her left shoulder and rocking herself to and fro that this young man had a dream some time ago he dreamt that a near and dear friend of his and a mine too that was murdered in this neighborhood appeared to him and that he desired him to go out of a certain night at the hour of midnight to a stone near this called the grey stone and there he would get a clue to the murderer well and did he he went and but you had better tell it yourself avilish she added addressing hanlon you know best the peddler instantly fixed his anxious and lively eyes on the young man intimating that he looked to him for the rest of the story i went proceeded hanlon and you shall hear everything that happened it is unnecessary for us however to go over the same ground a second time hanlon minutely detailed all that had taken place at the greystone precisely as it occurred if we allow for a slight exaggeration occasioned by his terrors and the impressions of supernatural manifestations which they left upon his imagination the peddler heard all the circumstances with an astonishment which changed his whole bearing into that of deep awe and the most breathless attention the previous eccentricity of his manner 
by degrees abandoned him and as hanlon proceeded he frequently looked at him in a state of abstraction then raised his eyes towards heaven uttering from time to time merciful father heaven preserve us and such like thus accompanying him by a running comment of exclamations as he went along well said he when hanlon had concluded surely the hand of god is in this business you may take that for granted i would fain hope as much replied hanlon but as the matters stand now we're nearly as far from it as ever instead of getting any knowledge of the murderer we want to discover it proves to be that the murder of sullivan has been found out oh sullivan he exclaimed well to be sure oh i well sure that same is something but in the meantime will you let me look at this box you spoke of i feel a curiosity to see it hanlon rose and taking the box from a small deal chest which was strongly locked placed it in the peddler's hands after examining it closely for about half a minute they could observe that he got very pale and his hands began to tremble as he held and turned it about in a manner that was very remarkable do you say he asked in an agitated voice that you have no means of tracing the murder none more than what we've told you did this box belong to the murdered man i mean do you think he had it about him at the time of his death ay and for some time before it replied the woman it's all belonging to him that we can find it now and you got it in the keepin of this mcgowan the black prophet you say we did replied the woman from his daughter at all events who is this black prophet he asked or what is he for that comes nearer the mark where did he come from where does he live and and what way does he earn his bread the boy here she replied pointing to hanlon can tell you that better than i can for although i've been at his place three or four times i never laid eyes on him yet well continued the peddler you have both a right to be thankful that you told me this i now see the hand of god in the whole business i know this box and i can tell you something that will surprise you more than that listen but wait i hear somebody's foot no matter i'll surprise you both by and by god save all here said the voice of our friend jimmy brannigan who immediately entered in truth this change is for the better at any rate said he looking at the house i gave you a lift with the master yesterday he added turning to the woman i think i'll get him to throw the ten shillings off he as good as promised me he would master exclaimed the peddler bitterly oh thin it's he that's the devil's master by all accounts and the devil's landlord too be me soul he'll get a warm corner down here and as he uttered the words he very significantly stamped with his heel to intimate the geographical position of the place alluded to it would be only manners to wait till your opinion is axed of him replied jimmy so mind your pack you poor sprisson or when you do speak endeavor to know something of what you're discoursing about master indeed devil take your impudence he's a scourge to the country continued the peddler a worse landlord never faced the sun that's what we call in this part of the country a lie replied jimmy do you understand what that means no one knows what an outrageous old blackguard he is better than yourself proceeded the peddler and how he harasses the poor that's ditto repeated responded jimmy you're improvin but tell me now do you know any one that he harassed this was indeed a hazardous question on the part of jimmy who by the way put it solely upon the presumption of the peddler's ignorance of dick's proceedings as a landlord in consequence of his the peddler's being a stranger who did you ever know that he harassed 
if you please. Look at the Daltons, replied the other. What do you call his conduct to them? Jimmy, who, whenever he felt himself deficient in truth, always made up for the want of it by warmth of temper, now turned shortly upon his antagonist, and replied in a spirit very wide of the argument, What do I call his conduct to them? What do you call the nose on your face, you codger? Divil a such an impudent creature ever I met. It would be no wonder that the curse of God would come on him for his treatment to that unfortunate and respectable family, responded the peddler. The curse of God knows where to fall best, replied Jimmy, or it's not in the county jail old Condy Dalton would be for murder this day. But, returned the other, isn't it a disgraceful thing to be, as they say, he and yourself is a pair of scourges in the hand of God for your fellow creatures, and in truth you're both fit for it by all accounts. Truth, replied Jimmy, whose gall was fast rising, it's a scourge with nine tails to it ought to go to your back. The Daltons deserved all they got at his hands, and the same pack was never anything else than a hot-brained crew that'd knock you on the head to-day and groan over you to-morrow. He served them right, and he's a liar that says to the contrary, so if you have a pocket for that, put it in it. Jimmy, in fact, was now getting rapidly into a towering passion, for it mattered little how high in violence his own pitched battles with dick ran he never suffered nor could suffer a human being to abuse his master behind his back but himself so confirmed however by habit was his spirit of contradiction that had the peddler began to praise dick jimmy would immediately have attacked him without remorse and scarcely have left a rag of his character together End of section 10。section 11 of the black prophet by william carlton。this librivox recording is in the public domain。section 11。it's a shame for you proceeded the peddler to defend an old sinner like him。but then as there's a pair of you that's not unnatural every rogue will back his brother i could name the place anyway that'll hold you both yet and i could replied jimmy name the piece of machinery that'll be apt to hold you if you give the master any more abuse whether you'll grow in it or not is more than i know but be my soul will plant you there anyhow do you know what the stocks means faith many a spare hour you've served there i go bail that is when you had nothing else to do and by the way of recreation just ay said the peddler listen how he sticks to the old villain but sure if you put any other two blisters together they'll do the same my own opinion is observed hanlon's aunt that it's a pity of the daltons at any rate every one feels for them but still the hand of god and his curse i'm afeard is upon them and that's more maybe than you'll know replied jemmy maybe god's only punishing them because he loves them it's good to have our suffering in this world after all said the peddler I'm afeard myself, too, that the wrath of the Almighty has marked them out. Indeed, I'm sure of it. And maybe that's not the only lie you're sure of, replied Jemmy. It's a subject, anyway, you don't understand. No, he proceeded. By all accounts, Charlie, it would wring anyone's heart to see him taken away in his old age from his miserable family and children. And then he's so humble, too, and so resigned to the will and way of god he's lying ill in the goal i seen him yesterday i went to see him and to say whatever i could to comfort him 
God pity his gray hairs, and <clears throat> have compassion on him and his this day. The poor fellow's heart could stand the sudden contemplation of Dalton's sorrow no longer, and on uttering the last words he fairly wept. If I had known what it was about, he proceeded, but that old scoundrel of a prophet, I and that other old scoundrel of a master of mine, ahem, <coughs> I wished, but what am I saying? But if I had known it, it'd go hard, but I'd give him a lift, so that he might get out of the way at any rate. I, said the peddler, at any rate, indeed, faith, you may well say it, but I say that at any rate he'll be hanged as sure as he murdered Sullivan, and as sure as he did, that he may swing, I pray this day. I'll hold no more discourse with that circulating vagabond, replied Jimmy. I'm a Christian man, a peaceable man, and I know what my religion orders me to do when I meet the likes of him, and that is when he holds the one cheek towards me to give him a sound Christian rap upon the other. So to the devil I pitch you, you villain, soul and body, and that's the worst I wish you. If you choose to be unchristian, be so, but be my soul, I'll not set you the example. Charlie, he proceeded, addressing Hanlon, I was sent for you in a hurry. Master Dick wants you, and so does Red Roddy, the villain, and I tell you to take care of him, for like that vagabond Judas, he'd kiss you this minute and betray you the next. I believe you're pretty near the truth, replied Jimmy, but I was near forgettin'. It seems the crowner of the country is sick, and there can't be an inquest held till he recovers, if he ever does recover, and if it'd serve poor old Dalton, that he never may, I pray God this day. Come away, you'll be killed for stayin'. Just then young Henderson himself called Hanlon forth, who, after some conversation with him, turned towards the garden, where he held a second conference with Red Roddy, who, on leaving him, appeared in excellent spirits, and kept winking and nodding with a kind of burlesque good humour at every one whom he knew, until he reached home. In this state stood the incidents of our narrative, suspended for some time by the illness of the coroner, when Mr. Travers, himself a magistrate, came to the head inn of the county town in which he always put up, and where he held his office. He had for several days previously gone over the greater portion of the estate, and inspected the actual condition of the tenantry on it. It is unnecessary to say that he was grieved at the painful consequences of the middleman system, and of subletting in general. Wherever he went he found the soil in many places covered with hordes of pauper occupants, one holding under another in a series that diminished from bad to worse in everything but numbers, until he arrived at a state of destitution that was absolutely disgraceful to humanity, and what rendered this state of things doubly painful and anomalous was the fact that while these starving wretches lived upon his employer's property, they had no claim on him as landlord, nor could he recognize them as tenants. It is true that these miserable creatures, located upon small patches of land, were obliged to pay their rents to the little tyrant who was over them, and he again, probably, to a still more important little tyrant, and so on. But whenever it happened that the direct tenant, or any one of the series, neglected to pay his or their rent, of course the landlord had no other remedy than to levy it from off the soil, thus rendering it by no means an infrequent case that the small occupiers, who owed nothing to him, or those above them, were forced to see their property applied to the payment of the head rent, in consequence of the inability, neglect, or dishonesty of the middleman, or some other subordinate individual from whom they held. This was a state of things which 
mr travers wished to abolish but to do so without inflicting injury however unintentional or occasioning harshness to the people was a matter not merely difficult but impossible as we are not however writing a treatise upon the management of property we shall confine ourselves simply to the circumstances only of such of the tenants as have enacted a part in our narrative about a week had now elapsed since the abusive contest between jemmy brannigan and the peddler the coroner was beginning to recover and charley hanlon's aunt had disappeared altogether from the neighbourhood previous to her departure however she her nephew and the peddler had several close and apparently interesting conferences into which their parish priest the reverend anthony devlin was ultimately admitted it was clear indeed that whatever secret the peddler communicated had inspired both hanlon and his aunt with fresh energy in their attempts to discover the murderer of their relative and there could be little doubt that the woman's disappearance from the scene of its perpetration was in some way connected with the steps they were taking to bring everything connected with it to light travers already acquainted with the committal of old dalton as he was with all the circumstances of his decline and eviction from his farm was sitting in his office about twelve o'clock when our friend the peddler bearing a folded paper in his hand presented himself with a request that he might be favoured with a private interview this without any difficulty was granted and the following dialogue took place between them well my good friend said the agent what is the nature of this private business of yours why please your honour it's a petition in favour of old condy dalton a petition of what use is a petition to dalton is he not now in gaol on a charge of murder you would not have me attempt to obstruct the course of justice would you the man will get a fair trial i hope i hope so your honour but this petition is not about the crime the unfortunate man is in for it's a humble prayer to your honour hoping you might restore him or i ought rather to say his poor family to the farm that they were so cruelly put out of will your honour read it sir and look into it because at any rate it sets forth too common a case i am partly acquainted with the circumstances already however let me see the paper the peddler placed it in mr travers's hands who on looking over it read somewhat to his astonishment as follows the humble petition of cornelius dalton to his honour mr john robert travers esq on behalf of himself his wife and his afflicted family now lying in a state of almost superhuman destitution by eugenius mcgrain philomath and classical instructor in the learned languages of latin english and the hibernian vernacular with an inceptive initiation into the rudiments of greek as far as the gospel of st john the divine attended with copious disquisitions on the relative merits of moral and physical philosophy as contrasted with the pusillanimous lectures of that ignoramus of the first water phadric mcswagger falsely calling himself philomath cum multis aliis quos enumerare longum est humbly showeth that cornelius dalton late of Carra, gentleman agriculturalist held a farm of sixty-six irish acres under the right honourable the reverse could be proved with sound and legitimate logic lord molyborough an absentee nobleman and proprietor of the tully stretchum estate that the said cornelius dalton entered upon the farm of Carra with a handsome capital and abundant stock as became a man bent on improving it for both the intrinsic and external edification and comfort of himself and family that the rent was originally very high and 
Upon complaint of this, several well-indicted remonstrances urged with most persuasive and enthusiastic eloquence, as the indicter hereof can testify, were most insignificantly and superciliously disregarded, that the said Mr. Cornelius Dalton persisted notwithstanding this great act of contemptuosity and discouragement to his creditable and industrious endeavors to expend upon the aforesaid farm in solid and valuable improvements a sum of seven hundred pounds and upwards in building draining enclosing and manuring all of which improvements transcendentally elevated the value of the farm in question as the whole rational population of the country could depose to may ipso teste quoque that when this now highly emendated tenement was brought to the best condition of excellence of which it was susceptible the middleman landlord va miseris agricolus called upon him for an elevation of rent which was reluctantly complied with under the tyrannical alternative of threatened ejection incarceration of cattle etc etc and many other proceedings equally inhuman and iniquitous that this rack rent being now more than the land could pay began to paralyze the efforts and deteriorate the condition of the said mr cornelius dalton and which being concatenated with successive failures in his crops and mortality among his cattle occasioned him as it were to retrograde from his former state and in the course of a few calamitous years to decline by melancholy gradation and oppressive treatment from richard henderson esq j p his landlord to a state of painful struggle and poverty that the said richard henderson esq his unworthy landlord having been offered a still higher rent from a miserable disciple named darby scanadra among others unfeelingly availed himself of dalton's res augusta and under play of his privileges as a landlord levied an execution upon his property auctioned him out and expelled him from the farm thus turning a respectable man and his family hopeless and houseless beggars upon the world to endure a misery and destitution that the said mr cornelius dalton now plain corny dalton for vile poverty humilifies even the name or rather his respectable family among whom facile princeps for piety and unshaken trust in her redeemer stands his truly unparalleled wife are lying in a damp wet cabin within two hundred perches of his former residence groaning with the agonies of hunger destitution dereliction and disease in such a state of complicated and multiform misery as rarely falls to the lot of human eyes to witness that the burden and onus of this petition is to humbly supplicate that mr cornelius dalton or rather his afflicted and respectable family may be reinstated in their farm as aforesaid or if not that richard henderson j p may be compelled to swallow such a titillating emetic from the head landlord as shall compel him to eructate to this oppressed and plundered man all the money he expended in making improvements which remain to augment the value of the farm but which at the same time were the means of ruining himself and his most respectable family for as the bard says sio vos non vobus etc etc of the remainder of this appropriate quotation your honor cannot be incognizant or any man who has had the advantage of being college bred as every true gentleman or homo factus ad unguem must have otherwise he fails to come under this category and your petitioner will ever pray are you 
the mr eugenius mcrain asked the agent who drew up this extraordinary document no your honor i'm only merely a friend of the daltons although a stranger in the neighborhood but what means have dalton or his family granting that he escapes from this charge of murder that's against him of stocking or working so large a farm i am aware myself that the contents of this petition with all its pedantry are too true but consider sir that he sunk seven hundred pounds in it and that according to everything like fair play he ought either to get his farm again at a reasonable rate or his money that raised its value for the landlord back again sure that's but fair your honor i'm not here to discuss the morality of the subject my good friend neither do i question the truth of your argument simply as you put it i only say that what you ask is impracticable you probably know not dick of the grange for you say you are a stranger if you did you would not put yourself to the trouble of getting even a petition for such a purpose written it's a hard case your honor it is a hard case but the truth is i see nothing that can be done for the daltons to talk of putting a family in such a state as they are now in back again upon such a farm is stark nonsense without stock or capital of any kind the thing is ridiculous but suppose they had stock and capital why then they certainly would have the best right to the farm but where's the use of talking about stock or capital so far as they are concerned i wish your honor would interfere for an oppressed and ill-treated family against as great a rogue by all accounts as ever broke bread i wish you would make me first sure that they'd get their farm to what purpose i say why sir for the reason i have if your honor will make me sure that they'll get their land again that's all i want what is your reason have you capital and are you willing to assist them the peddler shook his head is it the likes of me your honor no but maybe it might be made up for them some way i believe said the agent that your intentions are good only that they are altogether impracticable however a thought strikes me go to dick of the grange and lay your case before him ask a new lease for your friends the daltons of course he won't give it but at all events come back to me and let me know as nearly in his own words as you can what answer he will give you go now that is all that i can do for you in the matter barrin this your honor that set in case the poor heartbroken daltons were to get capital some way perhaps said travers interrupting him you can assist them oh if i could no but that set in case as i said that it was to be forthcomin you perceive me oh the lord that i was able very well replied the other anxious to rid himself of the peddler that will do now you are i perceive one of those good-natured speculating creatures who are anxious to give hope and comfort to every one the world has many like you and it often happens that when some good fortune does throw the means of doing good into your power you turn out to be a poor pitiful miserable crew without actual heart or feeling good-bye now i have no more time to spare try dick of the grange himself and let me know his answer so saying he rang the bell and our friend the peddler by no means satisfied with the success of his interview took his leave chapter twenty three darby in danger nature triumphs the mild and gentle mave sullivan with all her natural grace and unobtrusive modesty was yet like many of the fair daughters of her country possessed of qualities which frequently lie dormant in the heart until some trying calamity or startling event of more than ordinary importance awakens them into life and action indeed any one in the habit of observing the world may have occasionally noticed that even within the range of his own acquaintances there has been many a quiet and apparently diffident girl without pretense or affectation of any kind 
who when some unexpected and stunning blow has fallen either upon herself or upon someone within the circle of her affections has manifested a spirit so resolute or a devotion so heroic that she has at once constituted herself the lofty example whom all admire and endeavor to follow the unrecorded calamities of ordinary life and the annals of human affection as they occur from day to day around us are full of such noble instances of courage and self-sacrifice on the part of woman for the sake of those who are dear to her dear holy and heroic woman how frequently do we who too often sneer at your harmless vanities and foibles forget the light by which your love so often dispels the darkness of our affliction and the tenderness with which your delicious sympathy charms our sorrows and our sufferings to rest when nothing else can succeed in giving us one moment's consolation the situation of the daltons together with the awful blow which fell upon them at a period of such unexampled misery had now become the melancholy topic of conversation among their neighbors most if not all of whom were however so painfully absorbed in their own individual afflictions either of death or famine or illness as to be able to render them no assistance such as had typhus in their own families were incapable of attending to the wants or distress of others and such as had not acting under the general terror of contagion which prevailed avoided the sick houses as they would a plague on the morning after old dalton's removal to prison jerry sullivan and his family were all assembled around a dull fire the day being as usual so wet that it was impossible to go out unless upon some matter of unusual importance there was little said for although they had hitherto escaped the fever still their sufferings and struggles were such as banished cheerfulness from among them mave appeared more pale and dejected than they had ever yet seen her and it was noticed by one or two of the family that she had been occasionally weeping in some remote corner of the house where she thought she might do so without being observed mave dear said her father what is the matter with you you look darlin to be in very low spirits to-day were you crying she raised her large innocent eyes upon him and they instantly filled with tears i can't keep it back from you father she replied let me do as i will and oh father dear when we look out upon the world that is in it and when we see how the hand of god is taken away so many from among us and when we see how the people everywhere is suffering and struggling with so much how one is here this day and in a week to come in the presence of their judge oh surely when we see all the doings of death and distress among us we ought to think that it's no time to harbor hatred or any other bad or unchristian feelings in our hearts it is not indeed darlin and i hope nobody here does no she replied and as she spoke the vibrations of sorrow and of sympathy shook her naturally sweet voice into that tender expression which touches the heart of the hearer with such singular power no father she proceeded i hope not religion teaches us a different lesson not only to forgive our enemies but to return good for evil it does occur mccree replied her father whose eyes expressed a kind of melancholy pride as he contemplated his beautiful but sorrowful-looking girl giving utterance to truths which added an impressive and elevated character to her beauty young and old acushla mccree is fallen about us in every direction but may the father of mercy spare you to us my darling child for if anything was to happen you where oh where could we look upon your equal or find anything that could console us for your loss 
if it's my fate to go father i'll go and if it isn't god will take care of me whatever comes i'm resigned to his will ay dear and you ever were too and for the same reason god's blessin' will be upon you but what makes you look so low avoreen i trust in my saviour you're not unwell mave dear thanks be to god no father but there's a thing on my mind that's distressin' me very much and i hope you'll allow me my way in it i may say so dear because i know you wouldn't ax me for anything that it'd be wrong to grant you what is it mave it's the unhappy and miserable state that these poor daltons is in she replied father dear forgive me for what i'm about to say for although it may make you angry there's nothing farther from my heart than to give you offence you needn't tell me so mave you need not indeed but sure you know darlin', that unfortunately we have nothing in our power to do for them i wish to the lord we had didn't we do all that people in our poor condition could do for them didn't you yourself achora make us send them such little assistance as we could spare ay even to sharin i may say our last morsel with them and now darlin', you know we haven't it i know that she replied as she wiped away her tears where is there a poorer family than we are sure enough but father dear we can assist them relieve them ay maybe save them for all that god be praised then exclaimed sullivan only show me how and we'll be glad to do it for i can forget everything now mave but their distress but do you know the condition they're in at this moment she asked do you know father that they're stretched on the bed of sickness i mean nancy and and young con who has got into a relapse poor mary is scarcely able to go about she's so badly recovered from the fever and tom the wild unfortunate young man is out of his senses they say then there's nobody to look to them but mrs dalton herself and she you know has to go out to ask their poor bit from the neighbors only think she proceeded with a fresh burst of sorrow oh only think father of such a woman being forced to this may the lord pity her and them this woeful day exclaimed sullivan now father proceeded mave i know oh who knows better or so well what a good and kind and a forgiven heart you have and i know that even in spite of the feelin' that was and maybe is upon your mind against them you'll grant me my wish in what i'm goin' to ask what is it then let me hear it it's this you know that here in our family i can do nothing to help ourselves that is there is nothing for me to do and i feel the time hang heavy on my hands i have been thinkin father dear of this miserable state the poor daltons is in without any one to attend them in their sickness to say a kind word to them or to hand them even a drink of clean water if they wanted it them that hasn't got the fever yet won't go near them for fear of catchin it what then will become of them there they are without the face or hand or voice of kindness about them oh what on god's blessed earth will become of them they may die and they must die for want of care and assistance but sure that's not our fault dear mave we can't help them we can father and we must for if we don't they'll die father she added laying her wasted hand in his it is my intention to go over to them and as i have nothing that i can do at home to spend the greater part of the day with them in taking care of them and and in doing what i can for them yes father dear it is my intention for there is none but me to do it for them saviour of earth mave dear is it mad you are you achora macree that's dearer to us all than the apple of our eye or the very pulse of our hearts to let you into a plague-house to let you near the deadly fever that's upon them where you'd be sure to catch it and then o oh, blessed father mave what's come over you to think of such a thing ay or to think 
that we'd let you expose yourself. But it's all the goodness and kindness of your affectionate heart. Put it out of your head, however. Don't name it or let us hear of it again. But, Father, it's a duty that our religion teaches us. Why, what's come over you, Mave? All at once, too. You that was so much afeard of it that you wouldn't go on a windy side of a feverish house or walk near any one that was even recovering from it. Why, what's come over you? Simply, father, the thought. If I don't go to them and help them, they will die. I was afeard of the fever, and I am afeard of it. But am I to let my own foolish fears prevent me from doing the part of a Christian to them? Let us put ourselves in their place, and who knows, although may God forbid, but it may be our own before the season passes, suppose it was our own case, and that all the world was afeard to come near us. Oh, what would we think of any one, man or woman, that trusting in God would set their own fears at defiance and come to our relief? Mave, I couldn't think of it. If anything happened to you, and that we lost you, I never would lay my head down without the bitter thought that I had a hand in your death. At this moment, the mother, who had been in another room, came into the kitchen, and having listened for a minute to the subject of their conversation, she immediately joined her husband, but still with feelings of deep and almost tearful sympathy for the Daltons. It's like her, poor affectionate girl, she exclaimed, looking tenderly at her daughter, but it's a thing, Mave, we could never think of, so put it out of your head. She approached her mother, and seizing her hands, exclaimed, Oh, mother, for the sake of the living God, make it your own case, think of it. Bring it home to you. Look into the frightful state they're in. Are they to die in a Christian country for want of some kind of person to attend upon them? Is it not our duty, when we know how they are suffering i cannot rest or be at ease and i am not afeard of fever here you may say i love young condy dalton and that it is on his account i am wishing to go maybe it is and i will now tell you at once that i do love him and that if it was the worst plague that ever silenced the noise of life in a whole country it wouldn't prevent me from going to his relief nor to the relief of any one belonging to him I know, said her father, that that was at the bottom of it. I do love him, she continued, and this is more than ever I had courage to tell you openly before. But father, I feel that I am called upon here to go to their assistance, and to see that they don't die from neglect in a Christian country. I have trust and confidence in Almighty God. I am not afeard of fever now, and even if I take it and die. You both know that I'll die in actin' the part of a Christian girl, and what brighter hope could anything bring to us than the happiness that such a death would open to me? But here I feel that the strength and protection of God is upon me, and I will not die. That's all very well, Mave, said her mother, but if you took it and did die, oh, darling, in God's name, then, I'll take my chance and do the duty that I feel myself called upon to do. And, Father dear, just think for a minute. The true Christian doesn't merely forgive the injury, but returns good for evil. And then, above all things, let us make it our own case. As I said before, if we were as they are, lying racked with pain, burning with drouth, the head splitting, the whole strength gone, not able maybe to speak, and hardly able to make a sign, to make ourselves, to put a drink to our lips. Suppose I say we were lying in this state, and that all the world had deserted us. Oh, wouldn't we say that any fellow creature that had the kindness and courage to come and aid us, would our lips raise our heads and cheer our sinking hearts, by the sound of their voice alone. Oh, wouldn't we say that it was God that in his mercy put it into their heart to come to us and relieve us and save us? The mother's feelings gave way at this picture, and she said, addressing her husband, Jerry, 
maybe it's right that she should go because after all what if it's god himself that has put it into her heart he shook his head but it was clear that his opposition began to waver think of the danger he replied think of that still if i thought it was god's own will that was setting her to it father she replied let us do what is right and leave the rest to god himself surely you aren't afeard to trust in him i may take the fever here at home without going at all and die for if it's his blessed will that i should die of it nothing can save me let me go or stay where i please and if it's not it matters little where i go his divine grace and goodness will take care of me and protect me it's to god himself then you are trusting me and that ought to satisfy you her parents looked at each other then at her and with tears in their eyes as if they had been parting with her as for a sacrifice they gave a consent in which that humble confidence in the will of god which constitutes the highest order of piety was blended with a natural yearning and terror of the heart lest they were allowing her to place herself rashly within the fatal reach of the contagion which prevailed having obtained their permission she lost very little time in preparing for the task she had proposed to execute a very small portion of meal and a little milk together with one or two jugs of gruel whey etc she put under her cloak and after getting the blessings of her parents and kissing them and the rest of the family she departed upon her pious her sublime mission followed by the tears and earnest prayers of her whole family how anomalous and full of mysterious and inexplicable impulses is the human heart mave sullivan who in volunteering to attend at the contagious beds of the unfortunate daltons gave singular and noble proof of the most heroic devotedness absolutely turned from the common road on her way to their cabin rather than meet the funeral of a person who had died of fever and on one or two occasions kept aloof from men who she knew to be invalids by the fact of their having handkerchiefs about their heads a proof in general that they had been shaved or blistered while laboring under its severest form when she had gone within about a quarter of a mile of her destination she met two individuals whose relative positions indicated anything but a state of friendly feeling between them the persons we allude to were thomas dalton and the miserable object of his vengeance darby skinadra our readers are aware that sarah caused darby to accompany her for safety to the cabin of the daltons as she feared that should young dalton again meet him at the head of his mob and he in such a furious and unsettled state the hapless miser might fall a victim to his vengeance no sooner therefore had the mealmonger heard tom's name mentioned by his father when about to proceed to prison then he left a dark corner of the cabin into which he had slunk and passing out easily disappeared without being noticed in the state of excitement which prevailed the very name of tom reminded him that he was in his father's house and that should he return and find him there he might expect little mercy at his hands tom however amidst the melancholy fatuity under which he laboured never forgot that he had an account to settle with skinadra it ran through his unsettled understanding like a sound thread through a damaged web forever and anon his thought and recollection would turn to peggy murtaugh and the miser's refusal to give her credit for the food she asked of him during the early part of that day he had gone about with a halter in his hand as if seeking some particular individual and whenever he chanced to be questioned as to his object he always replied with a wild and ferocious chuckle the fellow that killed her the fellow that killed her 
Upon the present occasion, Mave was surprised by meeting him and the miser, whom he must have met accidentally, walking side by side, but in a position which gave fearful intimation of Dalton's purpose respecting him. Around the unfortunate wretch's neck was the halter aforesaid made into a running noose, while, striding beside him, went his wild and formidable companion, holding the end of it in his hand, and eyeing him from time to time with a look of stupid but determined ferocity. Scanadra's appearance and position were ludicrously and painfully helpless. His face was so pale and thin that it was difficult to see, even in those frightful times of sickness and famine, a countenance from which they were more significantly reflected. He was absolutely shrunk up with terror into half his size, his little thin corded neck appearing as if it was striving unsuccessfully to work its way down into his trunk, and his small ferret eyes looking about in every direction for someone to extricate him out of the deadly thrall in which he was held. Mave, who had been aware of the enmity which his companion bore him, as well as of its cause, and fearing that the halter was intended to hang the luckless mealman, probably upon the next tree they came to, did not, as many another female would do, avoid or run away from the madman. On the contrary, she approached him with an expression singularly winning and sweet on her countenance, and in a voice of great kindness, laid her hand upon his arm to arrest his attention, asked him how he did. He paused a moment, and looking upon her with a dull but turbid eye, exclaimed with an insane laugh, pointing at the same time to the miser, this is the fellow that killed her, ha, 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 but I have him now. Here he is in the noose, in the noose. Ay, and I swore it, and there's another too that's to get it, but I won't rob anybody, nor join in that at all. I'll hang him here, though, ha, Darby, I have you now. As he spoke, poor Scanadra received a chuck of the halter, which almost brought his tongue out as far as in the throttling process which we have before described. Mave, Ochra, said he, looking at her after his recovery from the powerful jerk he had just got, for the sake of heaven, try and save my life. If you don't, he'll never let me out of his hands a living man. Don't be alarmed, Darby, she replied. Poor Tom won't injure you. So far from that, he'll take the halter from about your neck and let you go. "'Won't you let poor Darby go, Tom?' "'I will,' he replied, "'after I hang him. Ha, ha, ha! "'Twas he that killed her. "'He let her die with hunger. "'But now he'll swing for it. Ha, ha!' "'These words were accompanied by another chuck, "'which pulled miserable Scanadra almost off his legs. "'Tom, for shame,' said Mave. "'Why would you do such a un manly thing with this poor old creature. Be a man and let him go. Ay, when he's hanging with his tongue out, ha, 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 wait till we get to the rabbit bank, where there's a tree to be had. I've sworn it, I, on her very grave, too. So good-bye, Mave. Come along, Darby. Mave, as you expect to have the gates of heaven opened to your soul, and don't leave me exclaimed the miser with clasped hands. Mave looked up and down the road, but could perceive no one approach who might render the unfortunate man assistance. Tom, said she, I must insist on your setting the poor man at liberty. I insist upon it. You cannot, and you must not take his life in a Christian country. If you do, you know you will be hanged yourself. Let him go immediately. Oh, I, he replied, you insist, me, but I'll tell you what. I'll put Peggy in a coach yet when I come into my fortune, and so you'll insist, will you? Just look at that wrist of yours, he replied, seizing hers, but with gentleness, and then look 
at this of mine. And now will you tell me that you'll insist? Come, Darby, we're bound for the bank. There's not a beach there but's a hundred feet high, and that's higher than ever I'll make you swing from. Your heart bled for her, didn't it? But how will you look when I have you facing the sun with your tongue out? Tom replied the wretch, I go on my knees to you, and as you hope, Tom, hope, you hard-hearted hound, isn't her father's curse upon me? Ay, and in me? Wasn't she destroyed among us, and you bid me hope? By the broken heart she died of, you'll get a double tug for that. And he was about to drag him on in a state of great violence, when Maeve again placed her hand upon his arm and said, I'm sure, Tom, you are not ungrateful. I am sure you would not forget a kind act done to poor Peggy that's gone. Peggy, he replied. What about her? Gone. Peggy's gone. Is she gone? She is gone, replied Maeve, but not lost. And it is most likely that she is now looking down with displeasure at your conduct and intentions towards this poor man. But listen, are you going to speak about Peggy, though? I am, and listen. Do you remember one evening in the early part of this summer? It was of a Sunday. There was a crowd about old Brian Murtaugh's house, and the report of Peggy's shame had gone abroad, and couldn't be kept from people's eyes any longer. She was turned out of her father's house. She was beaten by her brother, who swore that he would take the life of the first person, whether man or woman, young or old, that would give her one hour's shelter. She was turned out, poor young, misled, and mistaken creature, and no one would receive her, for no one durst. There was a young girl then passing through the village on her way home, much about Peggy's own age, but, barring in one respect, neither so good nor so handsome. Poor Peggy ran to that young girl, and she was going to throw herself into her arms, but she stopped. I am not worthy, she said, crying bitterly. I am not worthy, but, oh, I have no roof to shelter me, for no one dare take me in. What will become of me? While she spoke, Dalton's mind appeared to have been stirred into something like a consciousness of his situation, and his memory to have been brought back, as it were, from the wild and turbulent images, which had impaired its efficacy to a personal recollection of circumstances that had ceased to affect him. His features, for instance, became more human, his eye more significant of his feeling and his whole manner more quiet and restored. He looked upon the narrator with an awakened interest, surveyed Darby as if he scarcely knew how or why he came there, and then sighed deeply. Maeve proceeded. I am an outcast now, said poor Peggy. I have neither house nor home. I have no father, no mother, no brother, and he that I loved and said that he loved me has deserted me. Oh, said she, I have nothing to care for, and nobody to care for me now, and what was dearest of all, my good name is gone. No one will shelter me, although I thought of nothing but my love for Thomas Dalton. She was scorned, Thomas Dalton. She was insulted and abused by women who knew her innocence and her goodness till she met him. Every tongue was against her, every hand was against her, and every door was closed against her. No, not every one. The young woman she spoke to, with tears in her eyes, out of compassion for one so young and unfortunate, brought Peggy Murtaugh home, and cried with her, and gave her hope, and consoled her, and pleaded with her father and mother for the poor deluded girl in such a way that they forgot her misfortune and sheltered her, till, after her brother's death, she was taken in again to her own father's house. Now, Tom, wouldn't you like to oblige that girl who was kind to poor Peggy Murtaugh? It was Jerry Sullivan's. It was into your father's house she was taken. It was, Tom, and the young woman who 
befriended Peggy Murtaugh is now standing by your side and asks you to let Darby Scanadra go. Do then let him go for the sake of that young woman. Maeve, on concluding, looked up into his face and saw that his eyes were moist. He then smiled moodily and placing his hand upon her head in an approving manner said, you were always good, Mave. Here, set Darby free, but my mind's uneasy. I'm not right, I doubt, nor as I ought to be. But I'll tell you what. I'll go back towards home with you, if you'll tell me more about Peggy. Do so, she replied, delighted at such a proposal. And I will tell you many a thing about her, and you, Darby, she added, turning round to that individual, short, however, as the time was, the exulting but still trembling usurer was making his way at full speed towards his own house, so that she was spared the trouble of advising him, as she had intended, to look to his safety as well as he could. Such was the gentle power with which Mave softened and subdued this ferocious and unsettled young man to her wishes and indeed so forcible in general was her firm but serene enthusiasm that wherever the necessity for exerting it occurred it was always crowned with success thomas dalton as might be expected swayed by the capricious impulse of his unhappy derangement did not accompany her to her father's cabin when within a few hundred yards of it he changed his intention and struck across the country like one who seemed uncertain as to the course he should take of late indeed he rambled about sometimes directing otherwise associating himself with such mobs as we have described sometimes wandering in a solitary manner through the country at large and but seldom appearing at home on the present occasion he looked at mave and said i hate sick people mave and i won't go home but whisper when you see peggy murtaugh's father tell him that i'll have her in a coach yet please god and he'll take the curse off of me when he hears it maybe and all will be right he then bid her good-bye turned from the road and bent his steps in the direction of the rabbit bank on one of the beaches on which he had intended to hang the miser chapter twenty four rivalry if the truth were known the triumph which mave sullivan achieved over the terror of fever which she felt in common with almost every one in the country around her was the result of such high-minded devotion as would have won her a statue in the times of old greece when self-sacrifice for human good was appreciated and rewarded in her case indeed the triumph was one of almost unparalleled heroism for among all the difficulties which she had to overcome by far the greatest was her own constitutional dread of contagion it was only on reaching the miserable pest house in which the daltons lived and on witnessing with her own eyes the clammy atmosphere which in the shape of dark heavy smoke was oozing in all directions from its roof that she became conscious of the almost fatal step that she was about to take and the terrible test of christian duty and exalted affection to which she was in the act of subjecting herself on arriving at the door and when about to enter even the resolution she had come to and the lofty principle of trust in god on which it rested were scarcely able to support her against the host of constitutional terrors rushed upon her breast the great act of self-sacrifice as it may almost be termed which she was about to perform became so diminished in her imagination that all sense of its virtue passed away and instead of gaining strength from a consciousness of the pure and unselfish 
motive by which she was actuated she began to contemplate her conduct as the result of a rash and unjustifiable presumption on the providence of god and a wanton exposure of the life he had given her she felt herself tremble her heart palpitated and for a minute or two her whole soul became filled with a tumultuous and indistinct perception of all she had proposed to do as well as of everything about her gradually however this state of feeling cleared away by and by the purity and the christian principle that were involved in her conduct came to her relief what she asked herself if they should die without assistance in god's name and with his strength to aid me i will run all risks and fulfil the task i have taken upon me to do may he support and protect me through it thus resolved and thus fortified she entered the gloomy scene of sickness and contagion there were but four persons within that is to say her lover his sister nancy mary the invalid and sarah mcgowan nancy and her brother were now awake and poor mary occupied her father's armchair in which she sat with her head reclined upon the back of it somewhat indeed after his own fashion and sarah opposite young con's bed having her eyes fixed with a mournful expression on his pale and almost death-like countenance mave's appearance occasioned the whole party to feel much surprise and mary rose from her armchair and greeting her affectionately said i cannot welcome you dear mave to such a place as this and indeed i am sorry you came to see us for i needn't tell you what i'd feel what we'd all feel and here she looked quickly but with the slightest possible significance at her brother if anything happened you in consequence which may god forbid how are you all at home we are all free from sickness thank god said mave whom the presence of sarah caused to blush deeply but how are you all here i'm sorry to find that poor nancy is ill and that con has got a relapse she turned her eyes upon him as she spoke and on contemplating his languid and sickly countenance she could only by a great effort repress her tears do not come near us dear mave said dalton and indeed it was wrong to come here at all god bless you and guard you mave said nancy and we feel your goodness but as con says it was wrong to put yourself in the way of danger for god's sake and as you hope to escape this terrible sickness leave the house at once we're sensible of your kindness but leave us leave us for every minute you stop may be death to you end of section eleven Section twelve of the Black Prophet by William Carleton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section twelve. Sarah, who had never yet spoken to Mave, turned her black, mellow eyes from her to her lover and from him to her alternately. She then dropped them for a time on the ground and again looked round her with something like melancholy impatience her complexion was high and flushed and her eyes sparkled with unaccustomed brilliancy it's not right two people should run such a risk on our account said con looking towards sarah here's a young woman who has come to nurse tend and take care of us for which may god bless her and protect her it's sarah mcgowan donald dhu's daughter think of mave sullivan said sarah think only of mave sullivan she's in danger ha but as for me suppose i should take the fever and die may god forbid poor girl exclaimed con it would leave us 
all a sad heart. Dear Mave, don't stop here. Every minute is dangerous. Sarah went over to the bedside, and putting her hand gently upon his forehead, said, Don't speak to pity me. I can't bear pity, anything at all but pity from you. Say you don't care what becomes of me, or whether I die or not, but don't pity me. It is extremely difficult to describe Sarah's appearance and state of mind as she spoke this. Her manner towards Con was replete with tenderness and the most earnest and anxious interest, while at the same time there ran through her voice a tone of bitter feeling, an evident consciousness of something that pressed strongly on her heart, which gave a marked and startling character to her language. Mave for a moment forgot everything but the interest which Sarah and the mention of her excited. She turned gently round from Mary, who had been speaking to her, and fixing her eyes on Sarah, examined her with pardonable curiosity from head to foot. Nor will she be blamed, we trust, if even then and there the scrutiny was not less close, in consequence of it having been known to her that in point of beauty and symmetry of figure they had stood towards each other for some time past in the character of rivals. Sarah, who had on without stockings a pair of small slippers, a good deal the worse for wear, had risen from the bedside, and now stood near the fire directly opposite the only little window in the house, and consequently in the best light it afforded. Maeve's glance, though rapid, was comprehensive, but she felt it was sufficient. The generous girl, on contemplating the wild grace and natural elegance of Sarah's figure, and the singular beauty and wonderful animation of her features, instantly, in her own mind, surrendered all claim to competition, and admitted to herself that Sarah was, without exception, the most perfectly beautiful girl she had ever seen. Her last words, too, and the striking tone in which they were spoken, arrested her attention still more, so that she passed naturally from the examination of her person to the purport of her language. We trust that our readers know enough of human nature to understand that this examination of Sarah upon the part of Maeve Sullivan was altogether an involuntary act, and one which occurred in less time than we have taken to write any one of the lines in which it is described. Maeve, who perceived at once that the words of Sarah were burdened by some peculiar distress, could not prevent her admiration from turning into pity without exactly knowing why. But in consequence of what Sarah had just said, she feared to express it either by word or look, lest she might occasion her unnecessary pain. She consequently, after a slight pause, replied to her lover, "'You must not blame me, dear Con, for being here. I came to give whatever poor attendance I could to Nancy here, and to such of you as want it, while you're sick. I came indeed to stay and nurse you all, if you will let me, and you won't be sorry to hear it, in spite of all that has happened.' that I have the consent of my father and mother for so doing. A faint smile of satisfaction lit up her lover's features, but this was soon overshadowed by his apprehension for her safety. Sarah, who had for about a half-minute been examining Maeve on her part, now started and exclaimed with flashing eyes, and we may add a bursting and distracted heart, Well, Maeve Sullivan, I have often seen you, but never so well as now. You have goodness and truth in your face. Oh, it's a pretty face, a lovely face. But why do you state a falsehood here? For what you've just said is false. I know it. Maeve started, and in a moment her pale face and neck were suffused by one burning blush at the idea of such an imputation. She looked around her as if inquiring from all those who were present the nature of the falsehood attributed to her, and then with a calm but firm eye she asked Sarah what she could mean by such language. 
you're after saying replied sarah that you come here to nurse nancy there now that's not true and you know it isn't you come here to nurse young con dalton and you come to nurse him because you love him no i don't blame you for that but i do for not saying so without fear or disguise for i hate both that wouldn't be altogether true either replied mave if i said so for i did come to nurse nancy and any others of the family that might stand in need of it as to con i'm neither ashamed to love him nor afeard to acknowledge it and i had no notion of stating the falsehood when i said what i did i tell you then sarah m'gowan that you've done me injustice if there appeared to be a falsehood in my words there was none in my heart that's truth i know i feel that that's truth replied sarah quickly but oh how wrong i am she exclaimed to mention that or anything else here that might distract him ah she proceeded addressing mave i did you injustice i feel i did but don't be angry with me for i acknowledge it why should i be angry with you replied mave you only spoke what you thought and this by all accounts is what you always do let us talk as little as possible here replied sarah the sole absorbing object of whose existence lay in dalton's recovery i will speak to you on your way home but not here not here and while uttering the last words she pointed to dalton to intimate that further conversation might disturb him dear mave observed mary now rising from her chair you are staying too long oh for god's sake don't stop you can't dream of the danger you're in but replied mave calmly you know mary that i came to stop and to do whatever i can do till the family comes round you are too feeble to undertake anything and might only get into a relapse if you attempted it but then we have sarah m'gowan she replied who came as few would none live in this day i think barring yourself and her to stay with us and to do anything that she can do for us all may god forever bless her for short as the time is i think she has saved some of our lives condy's without a doubt mave turned towards sarah and as she looked upon her the tears started in her eyes sarah m'gowan said she you are fond of truth and you are right i can't find words to thank you for doing what you did god bless and reward you she extended her hand as she spoke but sarah put it back no said she indignantly never from you above all that's livin' don't you thank me you you why you aren't his wife yet she exclaimed in a suppressed voice of deep agitation and maybe you never will you don't know what may happen you don't know she immediately seemed to recollect something that operated as a motive to restrain any exhibition of strong feeling or passion on her part for all at once she composed herself and sitting down merely said mave sullivan i'm glad you love truth and i believe you do i can't then receive any thanks from you nor i won't and i would tell you why any place but here i don't at all understand you replied mave but for your care and attention to him i am sure it's no harm to say may god reward you i will never forget it to you while i have life said dalton feebly and fixing his eyes upon sarah's face i for one won't forget her kindness kindness she re-echoed ha ha well it's no matter it's no matter she saved my life mave i'm lying here and hadn't even a drink of water and there's no one else in the house mary there was out and poor nancy was ravin' and ragin' with illness and pain but she sarah was here to settle us to attend us to get us a drink whenever we wanted it to raise us up and to put it to our lips and to let us down with as little pain as possible oh how could i forget all this dear dear sarah how could i forget this if i was to live a thousand years con's face while he spoke became animated with the enthusiasm of the feeling 
to which he gave utterance, and, as his eyes were fixed on Sarah with a suitable expression, there appeared to be a warmth of emotion in his whole manner, which a sanguine person might probably interpret in something beyond gratitude. Sarah, after he had concluded, looked upon him with a long, earnest, but uncertain gaze. So long, indeed, and so intensely penetrating was it, that the whole energy of her character might, for a time, be read clearly in the singular expression of her eyes. It was evident that her thoughts were fluttering between pleasure and pain, cheerfulness and gloom. But at length her countenance lost, by degrees, its earnest character, the alternate play of light and shadow over it ceased, and the gaze changed, almost imperceptibly, into one of settled abstraction. It might be, she said, as if thinking aloud, it might be, but time will tell. And in the meantime, everything must be done fairly, fairly. Still, if it shouldn't come to pass, if it should not, it would be better if I had never been born. But it may be, and time will tell. Maeve had watched her countenance closely, and without being able to discover the nature of the conflict that appeared in it, she went over, and placing her hand gently upon Sarah's arm, exclaimed, Don't blame me for what I'm going to say, Sarah, if you'll let me call you Sarah, but the truth is, I see that your mind is troubled. I wish to God I could remove that trouble, or that any one here could. I am sure they all would, as willingly as myself. She is troubled, said Mary. I know by her manner that there's something distressing on her mind. Any earthly thing that we could do to relieve her we would. But I asked her, and she wouldn't tell me. It is likely that Mary's kindness, and especially Maeve's, so gently but so sincerely expressed, touched her as they spoke. She made no reply, however, but approached me with a slight smile on her face, her lips compressed, and her eyes, which were fixed and brilliant, floating in something that looked like moisture, and which might as well have been occasioned by the glow of anger as the impulse of a softer emotion, or perhaps, and this might be nearer the truth, as a conflict between the two states of feeling. For some moments she looked into Maeve's very eyes, and after a while she seemed to regain her composure and sat down without speaking. There was a slight pause occasioned by the expectation that she had been about to reply, during which Dalton's eyes were fixed upon her. In her evident distress she looked upon him. Their eyes met, and the revelation that that glance of anguish on the part of Sarah gave to him disclosed the secret. Oh, my God! he exclaimed involuntarily and unconsciously. Is this possible? Sarah felt that the discovery had been made by him at last, and seeing that all their eyes were still upon her, she rose up, and approaching Maeve said, It is true, Maeve Sullivan, I am troubled. Mary, I am troubled. And as she uttered the words, a blush so deep and so beautiful spread itself over her face and neck that the very females present were for the moment lost in admiration of her radiant youth and loveliness. Dalton's eyes were still upon her, and after a little time he said, Sarah, come to me. She went to his bedside, and kneeling bent her exquisite figure over him, and as her dark, brilliant eyes looked into his, he felt the fragrance of her breath mingling with his own. What is it? said she. You are too near me, said he. Ah, I feel I am, she said, shaking her head. I mean, he added, for your own safety. Give me your hand, dear Sarah. He took her hand, and raising himself a little on his right side, he looked upon her again, and as he did so, she felt a few warm tears falling upon it. Now, he said, lay me down again, Sarah. A few moments of ecstatic tumult, in which Sarah was unconscious of anything about her past. She then rose, and, sitting down on the little stool, 
she wept for some minutes in silence during this quiet paroxysm no one spoke but when dalton turned his eyes upon mave sullivan she was pale as ashes mary who had noticed nothing particular in the incidents just related now urged mave to depart and the latter on exchanging glances with dalton could perceive that a feeble hectic had overspread his face she looked on him earnestly for a moment then paused as if in thought and going round to his bedside knelt down and taking his hand said con if there is any earthly thing that i can do to give ease and comfort to your mind i am ready to do it if it would relieve you forget that you ever saw me or ever ever knew me at all suppose i am not living that i am dead i say this dear con to relieve you from any pain or distress of mind that you may feel on my account believe me i feel everything for you and nothing now for myself whatever you do i tell you that a harsh word or thought from me you will never have mave while she spoke did not shed a tear nor was her calm sweet voice indicative of any extraordinary emotion sarah who had been weeping until the other began to speak now rose up and approaching mave said go mave sullivan go out of this dangerous house and you condy dalton heed not what she has said mave sullivan i think i understand your words and they make me ashamed of myself and of the thoughts that have been troubling me oh what am i when compared to you nothing nothing mave had on entering deposited the little matters she had brought for their comfort and mary now came over and placing her hand on her shoulder said sarah is right dear may for god's sake do not stay here oh think only think if you tuck this fever and that anything happened you come said sarah leave this dangerous place i will see you part of the way home you can do nothing here that i won't do and everything that i can do will be done her lover's eyes had been fixed upon her and with a feeble voice for the agitation had exhausted him he added his solicitations for her departure to theirs i hope i will soon be better dear mave and able to get up too but may god bless you and take care of you till then mave again went round and took his hand on which he felt a few tears fall i came here dear con she said to take care of you all and why need i be ashamed to say so to do all i could for yourself sarah here wishes me to speak the truth and why shouldn't i think of my words then con and don't let me or the thoughts of me occasion you one moment's unhappiness to see you happy is all the wish i have in this world she then bade them an affectionate farewell and was about to take her departure when sarah who had been musing for a moment went to dalton and having knelt on one knee was about to speak and to speak as was evident from her manner with great earnestness when she suddenly restrained herself clasped her hands with a vehement action looked distractedly from him to mave and then suddenly rising took mave's hand and said come away it's dangerous to stop where this fever is you ought to be careful of yourself you have friends that love you and that would feel for you if you were gone you have a kind good father a loving mother a loving mother that you could turn to and may turn to if ever you should have a sore heart a mother oh that blessed word what wouldn't i give to say that i have a mother many an outrage many a wild fit of passion many a harsh word too oh what mightn't i be now if i had a mother all the world thinks i have a bad heart that i'm without feelin but indeed mave sullivan i'm not without feelin and i don't think i have a bad heart you have not a bad 
heart replied mave taking her hand no one dear sarah could look into your face and say so no but i think so far from that your heart is both kind and generous i hope so she replied i hope i have now come you and leave this dangerous house besides i have something to say to you mave and she proceeded along the old causeway that led to the cabin and having got out upon the open road sarah stood now mave sullivan said she listen you do me only justice to say that i love truth and hate a lie or concealment of any kind i ax you now this you discovered a while ago that i love condy dalton isn't that true i wasn't altogether certain replied mave but i thought i did and now i think you do love him i do love him oh i do and why as you said should i be ashamed of it ay and it was my intention to tell you so the first time i'd see you and to give you fair notice that i did and that i'd leave nothing undone to win him from you well replied the other this is open and honest at all events that was my intention pursued sarah and i had for a short time other thoughts ay and worse thoughts my father was persuading me but i can't speak on that for he has my promise not to do so oh i'm nothing dear mave nothing at all to you i can't forget your words a while ago because i knew what you meant at the time when you said to con any earthly thing that i can do to give ease and comfort to your mind i am ready to do it if it would relieve you forget that you ever saw me or ever knew me now mave i've confessed to you that i love con dalton but i tell you not to trouble your heart by any thoughts of me my mind's made up as to what i'll do don't fear me i'll never cross you here i'm a lonely creature she proceeded bursting into bitter tears i'm without friends and relations or any one that cares at all about me don't say so replied mave i care about you and it's only now that people is beginning to know you but that's not all sarah if it's any consolation to you to know it know it condy dalton loves you i loves you sarah mcgowan you may take my word for that i am certain this day that what i say is true loves me she exclaimed loves you repeated mave is the word and i have said it i didn't suspect that when i spoke she replied each looked upon the other and both as they stood were as pale as death itself at length mave spoke i have only one thought sarah and that is how to make him happy to see him happy i can scarcely speak replied sarah i wouldn't know what to say if i did i am all confused mave dear forgive me god bless you replied mave for you are truth and honesty itself god bless and you make him happy good-bye dear sarah she put her hand into sarah's and felt that it trembled excessively but sarah was utterly passive she did not even return the pressure which she had received and when mave departed she was standing in a reverie incapable of thought deadly pale and perfectly motionless chapter twenty five sarah without hope how sarah returned to dalton's cabin she herself knew not such was the tumult which the communication then made to her by mave had occasioned in her mind that the scene which had just taken place altogether appeared to her excited spirit like a troubled dream whose impressions were too unreal and deceptive to be depended on for a moment the reaction from the passive state in which mave had left her was to a temperament like hers perfectly overwhelming her pulse beat high her cheek burned and her eye flashed with more than its usual fire and overpowering brilliancy and with the exception of one impression alone all her thoughts were so rapid and indistinct as to resemble the careering clouds which fly in tumult and confusion along the troubled sky with nothing stationary 
but the sun far above, and which in this case might be said to resemble the bright conviction of Dalton's love for her that Mave's assurance had left behind it. On re-entering the cabin, without being properly conscious of what she either did or said, she once more knelt by the side of Dalton's bed, and hastily taking his unresisting hand was about to speak, but a difficulty how to shape her language held her in a painful and troubled suspense for some moments, during which Dalton could plainly perceive the excitement, or rather rapture, by which she was actuated. At length a gush of hot and burning tears enabled her to speak, and she said, "'Con Dalton, dear Con, is it true? Can it be true? Oh, no, no, but then she says it. Is it true that you like me, like me?' No, no, that word is too weak. Is it true that you love me? But no, it can't be. There never was so much happiness intended for me. And then, if it should be true, oh, if it was possible, how will I bear it? What will I do? What is to be the consequence? For my love for you is beyond all belief, beyond all that tongue can tell. I can't stand the struggle my head is giddy i scarcely know what i'm saying or is it a dream that i'll awaken from and find it false false dalton pressed her hand and looking tenderly upon her face replied dear sarah forgive me your dream is both true and false it is true that i like you that i pity you but you forbid me to say that well it is true i say that i like you but i can't say more the only girl I love, in the sense you mean, is Mave Sullivan. I could not tell you an untruth, Sarah, nor don't deceive yourself. I like you, but I love her. She started up, and in an instant dashed the tears from her cheeks, after which she said, I'm glad to know it. You have said the truth, the bitter truth. Aye, bitter it will prove, Condy Dalton, to more than me. My happiness in this world is now over forever. I never was happy, and it's clear that the doom is against me. I never will be happy. I am now free to act as I like. No matter what I do, it can't make me feel more than I feel now. I might take a life, I twenty, and I couldn't feel more miserable than I am. Then what is there to prevent me from working out my own will, and doing what my father wishes. I may make myself worse and guiltier, but unhappier I cannot be. That poor weak hope was all I had in this world, but that has gone, and I have no other hope now. Compose yourself, dear Sarah, calm yourself, said Dalton. Don't call me, dear Sarah, she replied. You are wrong ever to do so. Oh, why was I born? And what has this world and this life been to me but hardship and sorrow? But still, she added, drawing herself up, I will let you all see what pride can do. I now know my fate and what I must suffer, and if one tear would gain your love, I wouldn't shed it. Never, never. Sarah, said Mary in a soothing voice, I hope you won't blame poor Con. You don't know maybe that himself and Mave Sullivan has loved one another ever since they were no more about Mave Sullivan, she replied, almost fiercely. Leave her to me. As for me, I'll not break my word, either for good or evil. I was never the one to do an ungenerous... an ungenerous... no. She paused, however, as if struck by some latent conviction and in a panting voice she added, I must leave you for a while, but I will be back in an hour or two. Oh, yes, I will. And in the meantime, Mary, anything that is to be done, you can do it for me till I come again. Mave Sullivan, Mave Sullivan, leave Mave Sullivan to me. She then threw a humble garment about her, and in a few minutes was on her way to have an interview with her father. On reaching home, she found that he had arrived only a few minutes before her, and 
to her surprise he expressed something like good humor or perhaps gratification at her presence there on looking into her face more closely however he had little trouble in perceiving that something extraordinary had disturbed her he then glanced at nelly who as usual sat gloomily by the fire knitting her brows and groaning with suppressed ill-temper as she had been in the habit of doing ever since she suspected that donal had made a certain disclosure connecting with her to sarah well said he has there been another battle have you been ding dust at it as usual what's wrong sally eh did it go to blows with you for you look raised you're all out of it replied nelly her blood's up now and i'm not prepared for a sudden death she's dangerous this minute and i'll take care of her blessed man look at her eyes she repeated these words with that kind of low dogged ridicule and scorn which so frequently accompany stupid and wanton brutality and which are besides provoking almost beyond endurance when the mind is chafed by a consideration of an exciting nature sarah flew like lightning to the old knife which we have already mentioned and snatching it from the shelf of the dresser on which it lay exclaimed i have now no earthly thought nor any hope of good in this world to keep my hand from evil and for all ever you made me suffer take this her father had not yet sat down and it was indeed well that he had not for it required all his activity and strength united to intercept the meditated blow by seizing his daughter's arm sarah said he what is this are you mad you murdering jade to attempt the vagabond's life for she is a vagabond and an ill-tongued vagabond why do you provoke the girl by such language you double distilled old strap you do nothing but growl and snarl and curse and pray i pray from morning to night in such a way that the very devil himself could not bear you or live with you be gone out of this or i'll let her at you and i'll engage she'll give you what'll settle you nelly rose and putting her cloak went out i'm goin she replied looking at and addressing the prophet and please god before long i'll have the best wish of my heart fulfilled by seeing you hanged but until then may my curse and the curse of god light on you and pursue you i know you have told her everything or she wouldn't act towards me as she has done of late sarah stood like the pythoness in a kind of savage beauty with the knife firmly grasped in her hand i'm glad she's gone she said but it's not her father that i ought to raise my hand against who then sarah he asked with something like surprise you asked me she proceeded to assist in a plan to have mave sullivan carried off by young dick of the grange i'm now ready for anything and i'll do it this world father has nothing good or happy in it for me now i'll be equal to it if it gives me nothing good it'll get nothing out of me i'll give it blow for blow kindness good fortune if it was to happen but it can't now would soften me but i know i feel that ill-treatment crosses disappointments and want of all hope in this life has made and will make me a devil ay and oh what a different girl i might be this day what has vexed you asked the father for i see that something has isn't it a cruel thing she proceeded without seeming to have attended to him isn't it a cruel thing to think that every one you see about you has some happiness except yourself and that your heart is bursting and your brain burning and no relief for you no one point to turn to for consolation but everything dark and dismal and fiery about you 
I feel all this myself, said the prophet, so don't be disheartened, Sarah. In the course of time your heart will get so hardened that you'll laugh at the world. I, at all that's either bad or good in it as I do. I never wish to come to that state, she replied, and you never feel what I feel. You never had that much of what was good in your heart, no, she proceeded. Sooner than come to that state, that is, to your state, I'd put this knife into my heart. You, father, never loved one of your kind yet, didn't I, he replied, while his eyes lightened into a glare like those of a provoked tiger. I, I loved one of your kind, of your kind, loved her. I, and was happy with her. Oh, how happy. Ah, Sarah McGowan, and I loved my fellow creatures then, too, like a fool as I was. Loved, I loved, and she that I so loved proved false to me, proved an adulteress, and I tell you now that it may harden your heart against the world, that that woman, my wife, that I so loved, and that so disgraced me, was your mother. It's a lie. It's as false as the devil himself, she replied, turning round quickly and looking him with frantic vehemence of manner in the face. My mother never did what you say. She's now in her grave and can't speak for or defend herself. But if I were to stand here till judgment day, I'd say it was false. You were misled or mistaken, or your own bad suspicious nature made you do her wrong. And even if it was true, which it is not, but false as hell, why would you crash and wring her daughter's heart by a knowledge of it? Couldn't you let me get through the short but bitter passage of life that's before me, without adding this to the other thoughts that's distracted me? I did it, as I said, he replied, to make you hearten your heart, and to prevent you from putting any trust in the world, or expecting anything either of truth or goodness from it. She started as if some new light had broken in upon her, and, turning to him, said, Maybe I understand you, father. I hope I do. Oh, could it be that you were once a... a... a better man? A man that had a heart for fellow creatures and cared for them? I'm looking into my own heart now, and I don't doubt that I might be brought to the same state yet. Ha! That's terrible to think of, but again I can't believe it. Father, you can stoop to lies and falsity that I could not do, but no matter. You were once a good man, maybe. Am I right? The prophet turned round, and fixing his eyes upon his daughter, they stood each gazing upon the other for some time. He then looked for a moment into the ground, after which he sat down upon a stool, and covering his face with both his hands, remained in that position for two or three minutes. Am I right, father? she repeated. He raised his eyes, and looking upon her with his usual composure, replied, No, you are wrong, you are very wrong. When I was a light-hearted, affectionate boy, playing with my brothers and sisters, I was a villain. When I grew into youth, Sarah, and thought every one full of honesty and truth and the world all kindness and nothing about me but goodness and generosity and affection, I was, of course, a villain. When I loved the rising sun, when I looked upon the stars of heaven with a wondering and happy heart, when the dawn of morning and the last light of the summer evening filled me with joy and made me love every one and everything about me, the trees, the running rivers, the green fields, and all that God, ha, what am I saying, I was a villain. When I loved and married your mother, and when she, but no matter, when all these things happened, I was, I say, a villain. But now that things is changed for the better, I am an honest man. Father, there is good in you yet, she said, as her eyes sparkled in the very depth of her excitement with a hopeful animation that had its source in a noble and exalted benevolence. You're not lost. 
don't i say he replied with a cold and bitter sneer that i am an honest man and she replied that's gone too then look where i will everything's dark no hope no hope of any kind but no matter now since i can't do better i'll make them think of me ay and feel me too come then what have you to say to me let us have a walk then replied her father there is a weeny glimpse of sunshine for a wonder you look heated your face is flushed too very much and the walk will cool you a little i know my face is flushed she replied for i feel it burnin and so is my head i have a pain in it and a pain in the small of my back too well come he continued and a walk will be of service to you they then went out in the direction of the rabbit bank the prophet during their walk availing himself of her evident excitement to draw from her the history of its origin such a task indeed was easily accomplished for this singular creature in whom love of truth as well as detestation of all falsehood and subterfuge seemed to have been a moral instinct at once disclosed to him the state of her affections and indeed all that the reader already knows of her love for dalton and her rivalry with mave sullivan these circumstances were such precisely as he could have wished for and our readers need scarcely be told that he failed not to aggravate her jealousy of mave nor to suggest to her the necessity on her part if she possessed either pride or spirit to prevent her union with dalton by every means in her power i'll do it she replied i'll do it to be sure i feel it's not right and if i had one single hope in this world i'd scorn it but i'm now desperate i tried to be good but i'm only a cobweb before the wind everything is against me and i think i'm like some one that never had a guardian angel to take care of them the prophet then gave her a detailed account of their plan for carrying away mave sullivan and of his own subsequent intentions in life we have more than one iron in the fire he proceeded and as soon as everything comes off right and to our wishes we'll not lose a single hour in going to america i didn't think said sarah that dalton ever murdered sullivan till i heard him confess it but i can well understand it now he was hasty father and did it in a passion but it's himself that has a good heart father don't blame me for what i say but i'd rather be that pious affectionate old man with his murder on his head than you in the state you're in and that's true i must turn back and go to them i'm too long away still something ails me i'm all sickish my head and back especially go home to your own place he replied maybe it's the sickness you're taking oh no she replied i felt this way once or twice before and i know it'll go off me good-bye good-bye sarah and remember honour bright and secrecy secrecy father i grant you but never honour bright for me again it's the world that makes me do it the wicked dark cruel world that has me as i am without a livin heart to love me that's what makes me do it they then separated he pursuing his way to dick of the granges and she to the miserable cabin of the daltons they had not gone far however when she returned and calling after him said i have thought it over again and won't promise altogether till i see you again are you going back on your word so soon he asked with a kind of sarcastic sneer i thought you never broke your word sarah she paused and after looking about her as if in perplexity she turned on her heel and proceeded in silence chapter twenty six the peddler runs a close risk of the stocks nelly's suspicions apparently well founded as they had been 
were removed from the prophet, not so much by the disclosure to her and Sarah of his having been so long cognizant of Sullivan's murder by Dalton, as by that unhappy man's own confession of the crime. Still, in spite of all that had yet happened, she could not divest herself of an impression that something dark and guilty was associated with the tobacco box, an impression which was strengthened by her own recollections of certain incidents that occurred upon a particular night much about the time of Sullivan's disappearance. Her memory, however, being better as to facts than to time, was such as prevented her from determining whether the incidents alluded to had occurred previous to Sullivan's murder or afterwards. There remained, however, just enough of suspicion to torment her own mind without enabling her to arrive at any satisfactory conclusion as to Donald's positive guilt arising from the mysterious incidents in question, a kind of awakened conscience, too, resulting not from any principle of true repentance, but from superstitious alarm and a conviction that the prophet had communicated to Sarah a certain secret connected with her, which she dreaded so much to have known, had for some time past rendered her whole life a singular compound of weak terror, ill-temper, gloom, and a kind of conditional repentance, which depended altogether upon the fact of her secret being known. In this mood it was that she left the cabin, as we have described. "'I'm not fit to die,' she said to herself after she had gone, "'and that's the second offer for my life she has made. "'Anyway, it's the best of my play to leave them, "'and above all to keep away from her. "'That's the second attempt, "'and I know to a certainty that if she makes a third one, "'it'll do for me. "'Oh, no doubt of that. "'The third time's always the charm.' and into my heart that unlucky knife'll go, if she ever tries it a third time. They tell me, she proceeded, soliloquizing as she was in the habit of doing, that the inquest is to be held in a day or two, and that the crowner was only unwell a trifle, and hadn't the sickness after all. No matter. Not all the weather in the sky would clear my mind, that there's not villainy joined with that tobacco box, though where it could go or what could come of it, barrin' the devil himself or the fairies took it, I don't know. So far as concerned the coroner, the rumour of his having caught the prevailing typhus was not founded on fact. A short indisposition arising from a cold caught by a severe wetting but by no means of a serious or alarming nature, was his only malady, and when the day to which the inquest had been postponed had arrived, he was sufficiently recovered to conduct that important investigation. A very large crowd was assembled upon the occasion, and a deep interest prevailed throughout that part of the country. The circumstances, however, did not, as it happened, admit of any particular difficulty jerry sullivan and his friends attended as was their duty in order to give evidence touching the identity of the body this however was a matter of peculiar difficulty on disinterring the remains it was found that the clothes worn at the time of the murder had not been buried with them in other words that the body had been stripped of all but the undergarment previous to its internment the evidence, nevertheless, of the Black Prophet and of Red Roddy was conclusive. The truth, however, of most, if not of all the details, but not of the fact itself, was denied by old Dalton, who had sufficiently recovered from his illness to be present at the investigation. The circumstances deposed to by the two witnesses were sufficiently strong and home to establish the fact against him, although he impugned the details, as we have stated, but admitted that, after a hard battle with weighty sticks, he did kill Sullivan with an unlucky blow, 
and left him dead in a corner of the field for a short time near the grey stone. He said that he did not bury the body, but that he carried it soon afterwards from the field in which the unhappy crime had been committed to the roadside where he laid it for a time in order to procure assistance. He said he then changed his mind, and having become afraid to communicate the unhappy accident to any of the neighbors, he fled in great terror across the adjoining mountains, where he wandered nearly frantic until the approach of daybreak the next morning. He then felt himself seized with an uncontrollable anxiety to return to the scene of the conflict, which he did, and found, not much to his surprise indeed, that the body had been removed, for he supposed at the time that Sullivan's friends must have brought it home. This, he declared, was the truth, neither more nor less, and he concluded by solemnly stating that he knew no more than the child unborn what had become of the body or how it disappeared. He also acknowledged that he was very much intoxicated at the time of the quarrel, and that, were it not for the shock he received by perceiving that the man was dead, he thought he would not have had anything beyond a confused and indistinct recollection of the circumstances at all. He admitted also that he had threatened Sullivan in the market, and followed him closely for the purpose of beating him, but maintained that the fatal blow was not given with an intention of taking his life. The fact, on the contrary, that the body had been privately buried and stripped before internment, was corroborated by the circumstance of Sullivan's body-coat having been found the next morning in a torn and bloody state, together with his great coat and hat. But indeed the impression upon the minds of many was that Dalton's aversion of the circumstances was got up for the purpose of giving to what was looked upon as a deliberate assassination the character of simple homicide or manslaughter, so as that he might escape the capital felony and come off triumphantly by a short imprisonment. The feeling against him, too, was strengthened and exasperated by the impetuous resentment with which he addressed himself to the Prophet and Roddy Duncan, while giving their evidence, for it was not unreasonable to suppose that the man who, at his years and in such awful circumstances, could threaten the lives of the witnesses against him as he did, would not hesitate to commit in a fit of that ungovernable passion that had made him remarkable through life the very crime with which he stood charged through a similar act of blind and ferocious vengeance. Others, on the contrary, held different opinions, and thought that the old man's account of the matter was both simple and natural, and bore the stamp of sincerity and truth upon the very face of it. Jerry Sullivan only swore that, to the best of his opinion, the skeleton found was much about the size of what his brother's would be, but as the proof of his private internment by Dalton had been clearly established by the evidence of the Prophet and Roddy, constituting as it did an unbroken chain of circumstances which nothing could resist, the jury had no hesitation in returning the following verdict. We find a verdict of willful murder against Cornelius Dalton, Sr., for that he, on or about the night of the 14th of December in the year of grace, 1798, did follow and waylay Bartholomew Sullivan, and deprive him of his life by blows and violence, having threatened him to the same effect in the early part of the aforesaid day. During the progress of the investigation, our friend the peddler and Charlie Hanlon were anxious and deeply attentive spectators. The former never kept his eyes off the prophet, but surveyed him with a face in which it was difficult to say whether the expression was one of calm conviction or astonishment. 
when the investigation had come to a close he drew hanlon aside and said that swearin charley was too clear and if i was on the jury myself i would find the same verdict may the lord support the poor old man in the meantime for in spite of all that happened one can't help pitying him or at any rate his unfortunate family however see what comes by not having a curb over one's passions when the blood's up god's a just god replied hanlon the murderer deserves his punishment and i hope will meet it there is little doubt of it said the pedlar the hand of god is in it all that's more than i see or can at the present time then replied hanlon why should my aunt stay away so long but i dare say the truth is she is either sick or dead and if that's the case what's all you have said or done worth you see it's but a chance still trust in god replied the pedlar that's all either of us can do or say now there's the coffin i'm told they're going to bury him and to have the greatest funeral that ever was in the country but god knows there's funerals enough in the neighborhood without their making a show of themselves with this there's no truth in that report either said hanlon i was speaking to jerry sullivan this morning and i have it from him that they intend to bury him as quietly as they can he's much changed from what he was jerry is and doesn't wish to have the old man hanged at all if he can prevent it hanged or not charley i must go on with my petition to dick of the grange of course i have no chance but maybe the lord put something good into travers's heart when he bid me bring it to him at any rate it can do no harm nor any earthly good replied the other the farm is this minute the property of darby skinadre and to my knowledge master dick has a good hundred pounds in his pocket for befriendin the mealmonger still and all charley i'll go to the father if it was only because the agent wishes it i promised i would and who knows at any rate but he may do something for the poor daltons himself when he finds that the villain that robbed and ruined them won't so far you may be right said hanlon and as you say if it does no good it can do no harm but for my part i can scarcely think of anything but my poor aunt what in god's name except sickness or death can keep her away i don't know put your trust in god man that's my advice to you and a good one it is replied the other if we could only follow it up as we ought every one here wonders at the change that's come over me i that was so light and airy and so fond of every diversion that was to be had am now as grave as a parson but indeed no wonder for ever since that awful night at the greystone since both nights indeed i'm not the same man and feel as if there was a weight come over me that nothing will remove unless we traced the murder and i hardly know what to say about it now that my aunt isn't forthcoming trust in god i tell you for as you live truth will come to light yet the conversation took various changes as they proceeded until they reached the grange where the first person they met was jimmy brannigan who addressed his old enemy the pedlar in that particularly dry and ironical tone which he was often in the habit of using when he wished to disguise a friendly act in an ungracious garb a method of granting favors by the way to which he was proverbially addicted in fact a surly answer from jimmy was as frequently indicative of his intention to serve you with his master as it was otherwise but so adroitly did he disguise his sentiments that no earthly penetration could develop them until proved by the result jimmy besides liked the pedlar at heart for his open honest scurrility a quality which he latterly found extremely beneficial to himself inasmuch as now that increasing infirmity had incapacitated his master from delivering much of the 
alternate abuse that took place between them, he experienced great relief every moment from a fresh breathing with his rather eccentric opponent. Jimmy, said Hanlon, is the master in the office? Is he in the office? Who wants him? And as he put the query, he accompanied it by a look of ineffable contempt at the peddler. Your friend, the peddler, wants him, and so now, added Hanlon, I leave you both to fight it out between you. You're coming with your petition, and a pretty object you are, going to look after a farm for a man that'll be hanged. May God forbid this day, amen, he exclaimed, in an undertone which the other could not hear. And what can you expect but to get kicked out or put in the stocks for attempting to take a farm over another man's head. What other man's head? Nobody has it yet. I has there. A very decent, respectable man has it. By name one Darby Scanadra. May he never warm his hungry nose in the same farm, the miserable Keot that he is this day. He added in another soliloquy which escaped the peddler. A very honest man is Darby Scanadra, so you may save yourself the trouble, I say. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. Worse than fail we can't, and if we succeed, it'll be good to come in for anything from the old scoundrel before the devil gets him. Jimmy gave him a look. Why, what have you to say against the old boy? Sure it's not casting reflections on your own master you'd be. Oh, not at all, replied the peddler, especially when I'm expecting a favor from one of his servants. Truth, he'll soon by all accounts have his hook in the old clip of the grange, and after that some of his friends will soon follow him. I wouldn't be meanin' one Jimmy Brannigan, oh dear no, but it's a sure case that the black boy's intention to take the whole family by installments, and with respect to the servants, to place them in their old situations. Faith, you'll have a warm berth of it, Jimmy, and, well, you deserve it. Why, then, you circulating vagabond, replied Jimmy, if you weren't a close friend to him, you'd not know his intentions so well. Don't let out on yourself, man alive, unless you have the face to be proud of your acquaintance, which in truth is more than anyone, barring the same set, could be of you. "'Well, well,' retorted the peddler, "'sure blood alive, as we're all of the same connection. "'Let us not quarrel now, but serve another if we can. "'Go and tell the old blackguard I want to see him about business. "'Will I tell him you're itchy about the hawks? Eh? "'However, the truth is that they,' and he pointed to the stocks, "'might be justice, but no novelty to you. "'The iron gathers is an ornament you often wore.' and will again please goodness truth and your ornament is one you'll never wear a second time the hemp collar will grace your neck yet but never mind you're leading a life to deserve it see now if i can speak a word with your master for a poor family why then to avoid your tongue i may as well tell you that himself master richard and darby scanadra's in the office and if you can use the same blackguard tongue as well in a good cause as you can in a bad one, it would be well for the poor creatures. Go in now, and, he added in another soliloquy, may the Lord prosper his virtuous endeavors, the vagabond, although all hope of that's past, I doubt. For hasn't Scanadra the promise, and Master Richard the bribe? However, who can tell? So God prosper the vagabond, I say again. End of section 12section thirteen the peddler on entering found old henderson sitting in an armchair with one of his legs as usual bandaged and stretched out before him on another chair he seemed much worn and debilitated 
and altogether had the appearance of a man whose life was not worth a single week's purchase. Scanodra was about taking leave of his patron, the son, who had been speaking to him as the peddler entered. "'Don't be uneasy, Darby,' he said. "'We can't give you a lease for about a week or fortnight. But the agent is now here, and we must first take out new leases ourselves. As soon as we do, you shall have yours. If you only knew your honour, the scraping I had in these hard times to get together that hundred hush there, said the other, clapping his hand, with an air of ridicule and contempt upon the miser's mouth, that will do now, be off, and depend upon mum, you understand, mo, ha, 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 that's not a bad move, father, he added, however, I think we must give him the farm. The peddler had been standing in the middle of the floor when young Dick, turning round, suddenly asked him with a frown, occasioned by the fact of his having overheard this short dialogue what he wanted. "'God save your honours, gentlemen,' said the peddler in a loud, straightforward voice. "'I'm glad to see your honour looking so well,' he added, turning to the father. "'It's fresh and young you're getting, sir. Glory be to God.' "'Who is this fellow, Dick? Do you think I look better, my man?' "'Says Jimmy Brannigan to me afore I came in,' proceeded the peddler. "'He's a true friend of mine, your honour, Jimmy is, "'and it go to the well of the world's end to serve me. "'Says he, you'll be delighted, Harry, to see the master look so fresh and well. "'And the cursed old hypocrite is just after telling me, Dick, "'to prepare for a long journey.' adding for my consolation that it won't be a troublesome one as it will be all downhill why replied the son he has given you that information for the ten thousandth time to my own knowledge what does this man want what's your business my good fellow begging your pardon sir replied the peddler will you allow me to ask you one question were you ever in the forty-seventh foot oh bedad it must be him to a certainty he added as if to himself no replied dick why so take care your honour said the peddler smiling roguishly take care now your honour if it wasn't you what are you speaking about what do you mean asked the young man the peddler went over to him and said in a low voice looking cautiously at the father as if he didn't wish that he should hear him it was surely your honour took away Lord Handicap's daughter when you were an ensign, the handsome ensign, as they called you, in the 47th, eh? Fay, I knew you the minute I looked at you. Ha, ha, ha! Do you know what, father? He says I'm the handsome ensign of the 47th that took away Lord Handicap's daughter. The greatest beauty in all England, added the peddler. "'And I knew him once, your honour. "'Well, Dick, that's a compliment at any rate,' replied the father. "'Were you ever in the forty-seventh? asked the son, smiling. "'Aha!' returned the peddler with a knowing wink. "'Behave yourself, Captain. "'I'm not so soft as all that comes to. "'But sure as I have a favour to ask from your honour, your father, "'I'm glad to have your assistance.' Fay, by all accounts, you pleaded your own cause well at any rate, and I hope you'll give me a lift now with his honour here. Dick the younger laughed heartily, but really had not ready virtue sufficient about to disclaim the peddler's compliment. Come then, he added, let us hear what your favour is. Oh, then, thank you, and God bless you, Captain. It's this, only to know if you'd be good enough to grant a new lease of Carra farm to young condy dalton for the old man by all accounts is not long for this world both turned their eyes upon him with a look of singular astonishment who are you at all my good fellow asked the father or oh, what devil drove you here on such an impudent message a least to the son of that old murderer and his crew of beggars that's good dick well done soldier 
Will you back him in that, Captain? Ha, ha, ha. Damn me, if I ever heard the like of it. I hope you will back me, Captain, said the peddler. Upon what grounds, comrade? Ha, ha, ha. Go on, let us hear you. Why, Your Honor, because he's best entitled to it. Think of what it was when he got it, and think of what it is now, and then ax yourselves who raised it in value and made it worth twist what it was worth. Wasn't it the Daltons? Didn't they lay out near eight hundred pounds upon it? And didn't you at every renewal screw them up, begging your pardon, gentlemen, until they found that the more they improved it, the poorer they were getting, and now that it lies there worth double its value, and they that made it so, to put money into your pocket, beggars, within a few hundred yards of it, wouldn't it be rather hard to let them die and starve in destitution, and them wishing to get it back at a reasonable rent? In this country, brother soldier, replied Dick ironically, we generally starve first and die afterwards. You may well say so, Your Honor, and God knows there's not upon the face of the earth a country where starvation is so much practiced or so well understood. Faith, unfortunately, it's the national diversion with us. However, is what I'm saying reasonable, gentlemen? Exceedingly so, said Dick. Go on. Well, then, I wish to know, will you give them a new lease of their farm? You do, do you? Troth I do, Your Honor. Well, then, replied the son, I beg to inform you that we will not. Why so, Your Honor? Simply, you knave, exclaimed the father in a passion, because we don't wish it. Kick him out, Dick. My good friend and brother soldier, said Dick, the fact is that we are about to introduce a new system altogether upon our property. We are determined to manage it upon a perfectly new principle. It has been too much sublet under us, and we have resolved to rectify this evil. That is our answer. You get no lease. Provide for yourself and your friends, the Daltons, as best you can, but on this property you get no lease. That is your answer. Begone now, you scoundrel, said the father, and not a word more out of your head. Gentlemen, gentlemen, exclaimed the peddler, have you no consciences? Is there no justice in the world? The misery and sorrow and suffering of this misfortunate family will be upon you, I doubt, if you don't do them justice. Touch the bell, Dick. Here's someone, Jimmy Brannigan, Harry, Lowry, Jack Clinton. Where are you all, you scoundrels? Here, put this rascal in the stocks immediately. In with him. Jimmy, who from an adjoining room had been listening to every word that passed, now entered. Here you, sir, clap this vagabond in the stocks for his insolence. He has come here purposely to insult myself and my son to the stocks with him at once. No, replied Jimmy. The devil save. The stock will go on him this day. Didn't I hear every word that passed? And what did he say but the truth, and what every one knows to be the truth? Put him in the stocks, I desire you, this instant. Truth, if you were to look at your mug in the glass, you'd feel that you'll soon be in a worse stocks yourself than ever you put any poor creature into, replied the redoubtable Jimmy. Do you be off about your business in the meantime, you good-natured vagabond, or this old firebrand will get someone with less conscience than I have that'll clap you in them? Never mind, father, observed the son. Let the fellow go about his business. He's not worth your resentment. The peddler took the hint and withdrew, accompanied by Jimmy, on whose face there was a grin of triumph that he could not conceal. I told you, he added, as they went down the steps, that the same stocks was afore you, and in the meantime God pardon me for the injustice I did in keeping you out of them. Go on, replied the other. Devil harsh words ever I'll say to you again. Troth will you, said Jimmy, and both of us will be as fresh as a daisy in the morning, please goodness. I have scarcely any one to abuse me, or to abuse either, now that the old master is so feeble. Jimmy extended his hand as he spoke, and gave the peddler a squeeze, 
the cordiality of which was strongly at variance with the abuse he had given him god bless you said the pedlar returning the pressure your bark is worse than your bite i'm off now to mention the reception they gave me and the answers i got to a man that will maybe bring themselves to their marrow bones afore long ay but don't abuse em for all that replied jimmy for i won't bear it truth returned the other you're a queer jimmy and so god bless you having uttered these words in an amicable and grateful spirit our friend the peddler bent his steps to the head inn of the next town being that of the assizes where mr travers the agent kept his office chapter twenty eight sarah ill mave again heroic young henderson whose passion for mave sullivan was neither virtuous nor honourable would not have lent himself notwithstanding to the unprincipled projects of the prophet had not that unworthy personage gradually and dishonestly drawn him into a false position in other words he led the vain and credulous young man to believe that mave had been seized with a secret affection for him and was willing provided everything was properly managed to consent to an elopement for this purpose it was necessary that the plan should be executed without violence as the prophet well knew because on sounding young dick upon that subject in an early stage of the business he had ascertained that the proposal of anything bordering upon outrage or force would instantly cause him to withdraw from the project altogether for this reason then he found it necessary if possible to embark sarah as an accomplice otherwise he could not effect his design without violence and he felt that her cooperation was required to sustain the falsehood of his assertions to henderson with regard to mave's consent to place herself under his protection this was to be brought about so as to hoodwink henderson in the following manner the prophet proposed that sarah should by his own or her ingenuity contrive to domicile herself in jerry sullivan's house for a few days previous to the execution of their design not only for the purpose of using her influence such as it was to sway the young creature's mind and principles from the path of rectitude and virtue by dwelling upon the luxury and grandeur of her future life with henderson whose intentions were to be represented as honourable but if necessary to leave a free ingress to the house so as that under any circumstances and even with a little violence mave should be placed in henderson's hands should the prophet by his management effect this he was to receive a certain sum of money from his employer the moment he or his party had her in their possession for such were the terms of the agreement otherwise donald dhu reserved to himself the alternative of disclosing the matter to her friends and acquainting them with her situation this at all events was readily consented to by henderson whose natural vanity and extraordinary opinion of his own merits in the eyes of the sex prevented him from apprehending any want of success with mave provided he had an opportunity of bringing the influence of his person and his wonderful powers of persuasion to bear upon such a simple country girl as he considered her to be so far then he had taken certain steps to secure himself whilst he left henderson to run the risk of such contingencies as might in all probability arise from the transaction this however was but an underplot of the prophet whose object was indeed far beyond that of becoming the paltry instrument of a rusty intrigue it was a custom with dick of the grange for a few years previous to the date of our story to sleep during the assizes in the head inn of the town attended by jemmy brannigan this was rendered in some degree necessary by the condition of his bad leg and his extraordinary devotion to convivial indulgence 
a propensity to which he gave full stretch during the social license of the grand jury dinners now the general opinion was that henderson always kept large sums of money in the house an opinion which we believe to have been correct and which seemed to have been confirmed by the fact that on no occasion were both father and son ever known to sleep out of the house at the same time to which we may also add another that is that the whole family were well provided with firearms which were freshly primed and loaded every night the prophet therefore had so contrived it that young dick's design upon mave sullivan or in other words the prophet's own design upon the money coffers of the grange should render his absence from home necessary whilst his father was swilling at the assizes by which arrangement added to others that will soon appear the house must to a certain degree be left unprotected or altogether under the care of dissolute servants whose habits caught from those of the establishment were remarkable for dissipation and neglect the prophet indeed was naturally a plotter it is not likely however that he would ever have thought of projecting the robbery of the grange had he not found himself as he imagined foiled in his designs upon mave sullivan by the instinctive honour and love of truth which shone so brilliantly in the neglected character of his extraordinary daughter having first entrapped her into a promise of secrecy a promise which he knew death itself would scarcely induce her to violate he disclosed to her the whole plan in the most plausible and mitigated language effort after effort was made to work upon her principles but in vain once or twice it is true she entertained the matter for a time but a momentary deliberation soon raised her naturally noble and generous spirit above the turpitude of so vile a project it was then in this state of things that the failure of the one and the lesser plan through the incorruptible honour of his daughter drove him upon the larger and more tempting one of the burglary in this latter he took unto himself as his principal accomplice red roddy duncan whose anxiety to procure the driver's situation arose from the necessity that existed to have a friend in the house who might aid them in effecting a quiet entrance and by unloading or wetting the firearms neutralize the resistance which they might otherwise expect sarah's excitement and distraction however resulting from her last interview with young dalton giving as it did a fatal blow to her passion and her hopes vehement and extraordinary as they were threw her across her father's path at the precise moment when her great but unregulated spirit inflamed by jealousy and reckless from despair rendered her almost accessible to the wily and aggravating arguments with which he tempted and overcame her thus did he as far as human means could devise or foresight calculate provide for the completion of two plots instead of one it is true mave sullivan was not left altogether without being forewarned nobody however had made her acquainted with the peculiar nature of the danger that was before her nelly mcgowan as she was called had strongly cautioned her against both donnel and sarah but then nelly herself was completely in the dark as to the character of the injury against which she warned her so that her friendly precautions were founded more upon the general and unscrupulous profligacy of donnel's principles and his daughter's violence than upon any particular knowledge she possessed of her intentions towards her mave's own serene and innocent disposition was such in fact as to render her not easily impressed by suspicion and our readers may have perceived by the interview which took place between her and sarah that from the latter she apprehended no injury it was on the following day after that interview about two o'clock 
that while she was spreading some clothes upon the garden hedge during a sickly gleam of sunshine our friend the peddler made his appearance and entered her father's house mave having laid her washing before the sun went in and found him busily engaged in showing his wares which consisted principally of cutlery and trinkets the peddler as she entered threw a hasty glance at her perceived that she shook down her luxuriant hair which had been disarranged by a branch of thorn that was caught in it while stretching over the hedge she at once recognized him and blushed deeply but he seemed altogether to have forgotten her ha he exclaimed well that i may be blessed but it's many a long day since i seen such a head a hair as that holy saint countryman but it's a beauty musha o oragal maybe you'll dispose of it for in tooth if ever a livin face could afford to part with its best ornament yours is that one mave smiled and blushed at the compliment and the peddler eyed her apparently with a mixed feeling of admiration and compassion no she replied i haven't any desire to part with it you had the sickness maybe thanks be to the mercy of god she fervently exclaimed no one in this family has had it yet well ochre he continued if you take my advice you'll dispose of it in regard that if the sickness which may god prevent should come it will be well for you to have it off you if you sell it i'll give you either money or value for it for indeed and truth it flogs all i've seen this many a day they say observed her mother that it's not lucky to sell one's hair and whether it's true or not i don't know but i'm told for a certainty that there's not a girl that ever sold it but was sure to catch the sickness i know that there's truth in that said jerry himself there's sally hackett and mary gagan and katie dowdell all sold it and not one of them escaped the sickness and moreover didn't i hear mr cooper the bleedin doctor say himself in the market on saturday that the people couldn't do a worse thing then cut their hair close as it lets the sickness in by the head and makes it ten times as hard upon them when it comes well well there's no arguing with you said the peddler all i say is that you ought to part with it acushla by all means you ought never mind him mave darlin said her mother whose motive in saying so was altogether dictated by affectionate apprehensions for her health no replied her daughter it is not my intention mother to part with what god has given me i have no notion of it at this stage of the dialogue her eldest brother who had been getting a horse shod at the next forge entered the house and threw himself carelessly on a chair his appearance occasioned a slight pause in the conversation well denny said the father what's the news bad news with the daltons replied the boy with the daltons exclaimed mave trembling and getting paler if possible than she was for god's mercy dennis what has happened amongst them i met mrs dalton a while ago he replied and she told me that they had no one now to take care of them sarah mcgowan the black prophet's daughter has catched the sickness and is lying in a shed there beyant that a poor travelling family was in about a week ago mrs dalton says her own family isn't worse with the sickness but better she thinks but she was crying the decent creature and she says they'll die with neglect and starvation for she must be out and there's no one to attend to them and they have nothing but the black water god help them while he spoke mave's eyes were fastened upon him as if the sentence of her own life or death was about to issue from his lip gradually however she breathed more freely a pale red tinged her cheek for a moment after which a greater paleness settled upon it again the peddler shook his head ah he exclaimed they are hard times sure enough 
May the Lord bring us all safe through them. Well, I see I'm not likely to make my fortune among you, he added, smiling, so I must tramp on. By any way, I must thank you for house room and your civility. I'd offer something to eat, said Mrs. Sullivan, with evident pain. But the truth is not a morsel, replied the other. If the house was overflown, God bless you all, God bless you. Mave, almost immediately after her brother had concluded, passed to another room, and returned just as the old peddler had gone out. She instantly followed him with a hasty step, while he, on hearing her foot, turned round. "'You told me that you admired my hair,' she said, on coming up to him. "'Now, supposin' I'm willin' to sell it to you, what ought I to get for it?' "'Don't be alarmed by what they say inside,' replied the peddler. "'Any regular doctor would tell you that, in these times, it's safer to part with it. "'That I may be happy, but I'm telling you truth. "'What is it worth? What are you axin?' "'I don't know, but for God's sake, cut it off and give me the most you can afford for it. "'Oh, believe me, it's not on account of the mere value of it, but the money may save lives.' Why, Ockram, what do you intend doing with the money, if it's a fair question to ax? It's not a fair question for a stranger. It's enough for me to tell you that I'll do nothing with it without my father and mother's knowledge. Here, Denny, she said, addressing her brother, who was on his way to the stable, slip a stool through the windy, and stay with me in the barn. I want to send you of a message in a few minutes." It is only necessary to say that the compensation was a more liberal one than Mave had at all expected, and the peddler disencumbered her of as rich and abundant a mass of hair as ever ornamented a female head. This he did, however, in such a way as to render the absence of it as little perceptible as might be. The side locks he did not disturb, and Mave, when she put on a clean nightcap, looked as if she had not undergone any such operation. As the peddler was going away, he called her aside, so as that her brother might not hear. "'Did you ever see me afore?' he asked. "'I did,' she replied, blushing. "'Well, Okra, he proceeded, "'if ever you happen to be hard set, either for yourself or your friends, send for me, in widow hanlon's house at the grange and maybe i may befriend either you or them that is as far as i can which dear knows is not far but still in all send i'm known as the conny cigar or merry peddler and that'll do god mark you agar her brother's intelligence respecting the situation of the daltons as well as of sarah mcgowan saved Mave a long explanation to her parents for the act of having parted with her hair. We are able to live, barely able to live, she exclaimed, and thanks be to God we have our health. But the Daltons, oh, they'll never get through what they're suffering. And that girl, oh, mother, such a girl as that is, how little does the world know of the heart that a beautiful creature has. May the mercy of God rest upon her. This money is for the poor Daltons and her. We can do without it. And, Mother dear, my hair will grow again. Oh, Father dear, think of it. Lying in a cold shed by the roadside, and no one to help or assist her, to hand her a drink, to ease her on her hard bed. Bed? No, on the cold earth, I suppose. Oh, think if I was in that desolate state. May God support me, but she's the first I'll see, and while I have life and strength, she mustn't want attendance. And thank God, her shed's on my way to the Daltons. She then hastily sent her brother into Ballynafail for such comforts as she deemed necessary for both parties, and in the meantime, putting a bonnet over a clean nightcap, she proceeded to the shed in which Sarah McGowan lay. On looking at it ere she entered, she could not help shuddering. It was such a place as the poorest pauper in the poorest cabin would not willingly place an animal in for shelter. 
It simply consisted of a few sticks laid up against the side of a ditch. Over these sticks were thrown a few scraws, that is, the sward of the earth cut thin. In the inside was the remnant of some loose straw, the greater part having been taken away either for bedding or firing. When Maeve entered, she started at the singular appearance of Sarah. From the first moment her person had been known to her until the present, she had never seen her look half so beautiful. She literally lay stretched upon a little straw with no other pillow than the sod of earth under that rich and glowing cheek, while her raven hair had fallen down and added to the milk-white purity of her shining neck and bosom. "'Father of mercy!' exclaimed Maeve mentally. "'How will she live? How can she live here? And what will become of her? Is she to die in this miserable way in a Christian land?' Sarah lay groaning with pain, and starting from time to time with the pangs of its feverish inflictions. Maeve spoke not when she entered the shed, being ignorant whether Sarah was asleep or awake, but a very few moments soon satisfied her that the unhappy and deserted girl was under the influence of delirium. "'I won't break my promise, father, but I'll break my heart, and I can't even give her warning. Ah, but it's treacherous, and I hate that. No, no, I'll have no hand in it. Manage it your own way. It's treacherous. She has crossed my happiness, you say. I, and there you're right, so she has. Only for her I might... Am and I as handsome, you say, and as well-shaped? Haven't I as white a skin, as beautiful hair, and as good eyes? People say better. And if I have, wouldn't he come to love me in time, only for her? Or if there wasn't that bar put between us? You're right, you're right. She's the cause of all my suffering and sorrow, she is. I agree, I agree, down with her. Out of my way with her, I hate the thoughts of her, and I'll join it. For mark me, father, wicked I may be, but more miserable I can't, so I'll join you in it. What need I care now? Maeve felt her heart sink, and her whole being disturbed with a heavy sense of terror, as Sarah uttered the incoherent rhapsody which we have just repeated. The vague but strongly expressed warnings which she had previously heard from Nelly, and the earnest admonitions which that person had given her to beware of evil designs on the part of Donald Dhu and his daughter, now rushed upon her mind, and she stood looking upon the desolate girl with feelings that it is difficult to describe. She also remembered that Sarah herself had told her in their very last interview that she had other thoughts, and worse thoughts, than the fair battle of rivalry between them would justify, and it was only now, too, that the unconscious allusion to the prophet struck her with full force. Her sweet and gentle magnanimity, however, rose over every other consideration but the frightfully desolate state of her unhappy rival. Even in this case, also, her own fears of contagion yielded to the benevolent sense of duty by which she was actuated. Come what will, she said to her own heart, we ought to return good for evil, and there's no use in knowing what is right unless we strive to put it in practice. At any rate, poor girl, poor generous Sarah, I'm afeard that you're never likely to do harm to me or anyone else in this world. May God in his mercy pity and relieve you, and restore you once more to health. Maeve unconsciously repeated the last words aloud, and Sarah, who had been lying with her back to the unprotected opening of the shed, having had a slight mitigation, and but a slight one, of the paroxysm under which she had uttered the previous incoherencies, now turned round, and fixing her eyes upon Maeve, kept sharply but steadily gazing at her for some time. It was quite evident, however, that consciousness had not returned, for after she had surveyed Maeve for a minute or two, she proceeded, 
the devil was there a while ago but i wasn't afeard of him because i knew that god was stronger than him and then there came an angel another angel not you and put him away but it wasn't my guardian angel for i never had a guardian angel oh never never no nor any one to take care of me or make me love them she uttered the last words in a tone of such deep and distressing sorrow that mave's eyes filled with tears and she replied dear sarah let me be your guardian angel i will do what i can for you do you not know me no i don't aren't you one of the angels that come about me the place is full of them unhappy girl or maybe happy girl exclaimed mave with a fresh gush of tears who knows but the almighty has your cold and deserted bed i can't call it surrounded with things that may comfort you and take care that no evil thing will harm you oh no dear sarah i am far from that i'm a weak sinful mortal because they're about me continually and let me see who are you i know you one of them said a while ago may god relieve you and restore you once more to health i heard the voice dear sarah don't you know me reiterated mave look at me don't you know mave sullivan your friend mave sullivan that knows your value and loves you who she asked starting a little who what name is that who is it say it again don't you know mave sullivan that loves you and feels for your miserable situation my dear sarah i never had a guardian angel nor any one to take care of me nor a mother many a time often often the whole world just to look at her face and to know feel love me oh a drink a drink is there no one to give me a drink i'm burnin i'm burnin is there no one to get me a drink mave sullivan mave sullivan have pity on me i heard some one name her i heard a voice i'll die without a drink mave looked about the desolate shed and to her delight spied a tin porringer which sarah's unhappy predecessors had left behind them seizing this she flew to a little stream that ran by the place and filling the vessel returned and placed it to sarah's lips she drank it eagerly and looking piteously and painfully up into mave's face she laid back her head and appeared to breathe more freely mave hoped that the drink of cold water would have cooled her fever and assuaged her thirst so as to have brought her to a rational state such a state as would have enabled the poor girl to give some account of the extraordinary situation in which she found herself and of the circumstances which occasioned her to take shelter in such a place in this however she was disappointed sarah having drank the cold water once more shut her eyes and fell into that broken and oppressive slumber which characterizes the terrible malady which had stricken her down for some time she waited with this benign expectation but seeing there was no likelihood of her restoration to consciousness she again filled the tin vessel and placing it upon a stone by her bedside composed the poor girl's dress about her and turned her steps toward a scene in which she expected to find equal misery it is not our intention however to dwell upon it it is sufficient to say that she found the daltons who by the way had a pretty long visit from the peddler as her brother had said beginning to recover and so far this was consolatory but there was not within the walls of the house earthly comfort or food or nourishment of any kind poor mary was literally gasping for want of sustenance and a few hours more might have been fatal to them all there was no fire no gruel milk or anything that could in the slightest possible degree afford them relief her brother denny however who had been desired by her to fetch his purchases directly to their cabin soon returned and almost at a moment 
that might be called the crisis, not of their malady for that had passed, but of their fate itself. His voice was heard, shouting from a distance that he had discharged his commission, for we may observe that no possible inducement could tempt him to enter that or any other house where fever was at work. Mave lost little time in administering to their wants and their weaknesses. With busy and affectionate hands, she did all that could be done for them at this particular juncture. She prepared food for Mary, made whey and gruel, and left as much of her little purse as she thought could be spared from the wants of Sarah McGowan. In the course of two or three days afterwards, however, Sarah's situation was very much changed for the better, but until that change was effected, Mave devoted as much time to the poor girl as she could possibly spare. Nor was the force of her example without its beneficial effects in the neighborhood, especially as regarded Sarah herself. The courage she displayed, despite her constitutional timidity, communicated similar courage to others, in consequence of which Sarah was scarcely ever without someone in her bleak shed to watch and take care of her. Her father, however, on hearing of her situation, availed himself of what some of the neighbors considered a mitigation of her symptoms, and with as much care and caution as possible she was conveyed home on a kind of litter, and nurse tended by an old woman from the next village, Nelly having disappeared from the neighborhood. The attendance of this old woman, by the way, surprised the prophet exceedingly. He had not engaged her to attend on Sarah, nor could he ascertain who had. Upon this subject she was perfectly inscrutable. All he could know or get out of her was that she had been engaged, and he could perceive also that she was able to procure her many general comforts, not usually to be had about the sick bed of a person in her condition of life. Mave, during all her attendance upon Sarah, was never able to ascertain whether in the pauses of delirium she had been able to recognize her. At one period, while giving her a drink of whey, she looked up into her eyes with something like a glance of consciousness, mingled with wonder, and appeared about to speak, but in a moment it was gone, and she relapsed into her former state. This, however, was not the only circumstance that astonished Mave. The course of a single week also made a very singular change in the condition of the Daltons. Their miserable cabin began to exhibit an abundance of wholesome food, such as fresh meat, soup, tea, sugar, white bread, and even to wine, to strengthen the invalids. These things were to Mave equally a relief and a wonder, nor were the neighbors less puzzled at such an unaccountable improvement in the circumstances of this pitiable and suffering family. As in the case of Sarah, however, all these comforts and the source from whence they proceeded were shrouded in mystery. It is true Mrs. Dalton smiled in a melancholy way when any inquiries were made about the matter, and shaking her head, declared that although she knew it was out of her power to break the seal of secrecy, or violate the promise she had made to their unknown benefactor. Sarah's fever was dreadfully severe, and for some time after her removal from the shed there was little hope of her recovery. Our friend the peddler paid her a visit in the very height of her malady, and without permission given or asked, took the liberty, in her father's absence, of completely removing her raven hair, with the exception, as in Maeve's case, of those locks which adorn the face and forehead, and to his shame and dishonesty be it told, without the slightest offer of remuneration. Chapter 28 Double Treachery The state of the country at this period of our narrative was, indeed, singularly gloomy and miserable. 
Some improvement, however, had taken place in the statistics of disease, but the destitution was still so sharp and terrible that there was very little diminution of the tumults which still prevailed. Indeed, the rioting in some districts had risen to a frightful extent. The cry of the people was for either bread or work, and to still, if possible, this woeful clamor, local committees by large subscriptions, aided in some cases by loans from government, contrived to find them employment on useful public works. Previous to this nothing could surpass the prostration and abject subserviency with which the miserable crowds solicited food or labor. Only give them labor at any rate, say sixpence a day, and they did not wish to beg or violate the laws. No, no, only give them peaceable employment, and they would rest not only perfectly contented, but deeply grateful. In the meantime, the employment they sought for was provided, not at sixpence, but at one and sixpence a day, so that for a time they appeared to feel satisfied, and matters went on peaceably enough. This, however, was too good to last there was ever among such masses of people unprincipled knaves known as politicians idle vagabonds who hate all honest employment themselves and ask no better than to mislead and fleece the ignorant unreflecting people however or wherever they can these fellows read and expound the papers on sundays and holidays rail not only against every government no matter what its principles are but in general attack all constituted authority without feeling one single spark of true national principle or independent love of liberty it is such corrupt scoundrels that always assail the executive of the country and at the same time supply the official staff of spies and informers with their blackest perjurers and traitors in truth they are always the first to corrupt and the first to betray you may hear these men denouncing government this week and see them strutting about the castle its pampered instruments and insolent with its patronage the next if there be a strike conspiracy or cabal of any kind these patriots are at the bottom of it, and wherever ribbonism and other secret societies do not exist, there they are certain to set them a-going. For only a short time were these who had procured industrial employment permitted to rest satisfied with the efforts which had been made on their behalf. The patriots soon commenced operations. Eighteen pence a day was nothing. The government had plenty of money, and if the people wished to hear a truth, it could be told them by those who knew. Listen, Heather, as the Munstermen say, the country gentlemen and the committees are putting half the money into their own pockets, this being precisely what the knaves would do themselves if they were in their places, and for that reason we'll strike for higher wages. In this manner were the people led first into folly and ultimately into rioting and crime for it is not in point of fact those who are suffering most severely that take a prominent part in these senseless tumults or who are the first to trample upon law and order the evil example is set to those who do suffer by these factious vagabonds and under such circumstances and betrayed by such delusions the poor people join the crowd and find themselves engaged in the outrage before they have time to reflect upon their conduct at the time of which we write however the government did not consider it any part of its duty to take a deep interest in the domestic or social improvement of the people the laws of the country at that period had but one aspect that of terror for it was evident that the legislature of the day had forgotten that neither an individual nor a people can both love and fear the same object at 
the same time. The laws checked insubordination and punished crime, and having done this, the great end and object of all law was considered to have been attained. We hope, however, the day has come when education, progress, improvement, and reward will shed their mild and peaceful luster upon our statute books, and banish from them those draconian enactments that engender only fear and hatred, breathe of cruelty, and have their origin in a tyrannical love of blood. We have said that the aspect of the country was depressing and gloomy, but we may add here that these words convey but a vague and feeble idea of the state to which the people at large were reduced. The general destitution, the famine, sickness, and death which had poured such misery and desolation over the land left, as might be expected, their terrible traces behind them. Indeed, the sufferings which a year of famine and disease, and they usually either accompany or succeed each other, inflicts upon the multitudes of poor, are such as no human pen could at all describe, so as to portray a picture sufficiently faithful to the dreary and death-like spirit which should breathe in it. Upon the occasion we write of, nothing met you, go where you might, but suffering and sorrow and death, to which we may add tumult and crime and bloodshed, scarcely a family but had lost one or more. Every face you met was an index of calamity, and bore upon it the unquestionable impressions of struggle and hardship. Cheerfulness and mirth had gone and were forgotten. All the customary amusements of the people had died away. Almost every house had a lonely and deserted look, for it was known that one or more beloved beings had gone out of it to the grave. A dark, heartless spirit was abroad. The whole land, in fact, mourned, and nothing on which the eye could rest bore a green or a thriving look or any symptom of activity but the churchyards, and here the digging and delving were incessant. At the early twilight, during the gloomy noon, the dreary dusk, and the still more funeral-looking light of the midnight taper, the first days of the assizes were now near and among all those who awaited them there was none whose fate excited so profound an interest as that of old Condy Dalton. His family had now recovered from their terrible sufferings, and were able to visit him in his prison, a privilege which was awarded to them as a mark of respect for their many virtues, and of sympathy for their extraordinary calamities and trials. They found him resigned to his fate, but stunned with wonder at the testimony on which he was likely to be convicted, the peddler, who appeared to take so singular an interest in the fortunes of his family, sought and obtained a short interview with him, in which he requested him to state, as accurately as he could remember, the circumstances on which the prosecution was founded, precisely as they occurred. This he did, closing his account, by the usual burden of all his conversation ever since he went to gaol. I know I must suffer, but I think nothing of myself, only for the shame it will bring upon my family. Sarah's unexpected illness disconcerted at least one of the projects of Donald Dew. They were now only two days until the assizes, and she was as yet incapable of leaving her bed although in a state of convalescence. This mortified the prophet very much, but his subtlety and invention never abandoned him. It struck him that the most effectual plan now would be, as Sarah's part in aiding to take away Mave was out of the question, to merge the violence to which he felt they must resort into that of the famine riots and under the character of one of these tumults to succeed, if possible, in removing Mave from her father's house, ere her family could understand the true cause of her removal. 
those who were to be engaged in this were besides principally strangers to whom neither mave nor her family were personally known and as a female cousin of hers an orphan had come to reside with them until better times should arrive it would be necessary to have some one among the party who knew mave sufficiently to make no mistake as to her person for this purpose judiciously fixed upon thomas dalton as the most appropriate individual to execute this act of violence against the very family who were likely to be the means of bringing his father to a shameful death this young man had not yet recovered the use of his reason so as to be considered sane he still roved about as before sometimes joining the mobs and leading them on to the outrage and sometimes sauntering in a solitary mood without seeming altogether conscious of what he did or said to secure his cooperation was a matter of little difficulty and the less so as he heard with infinite satisfaction that dalton was perpetually threatening every description of vengeance against the sullivans about to be tried and very likely to suffer for the murder it was now the day but one previous to the commencement of the assizes and our readers will be kind enough to accompany us to the grange or rather to the garden of the grange at the gate of which our acquaintance red roddy is knocking he has knocked two or three times and sent on each occasion hanlon old dick young dick together with all the component parts of the establishment to a certain territory where so far as its legitimate historians assure us the coldness of the climate has never been known to give any particular offence i know he's inside for didn't i see him goin in well may all the devils <clears throat> oh good morrow charley troth you'd make a good messenger for death i'm knockin here till i have lost the use of my arm wid downright fatigue never mind roddy you'll recover it before you're twice married come in they then entered well roddy what's the news what the news is it why then it's anything in the shape of news of good news i mean to be had in such a country as this truth it's a shame for any one that has health and limbs to remain in it and now that you're answered what's the news yourself charley i hope that the driver's ship's safe at last i thought i was to sleep at home in my comfortable berth last not now till after the sizes ruddy the master's goin to them because i heard he wasn't able he's goin he says happen what may he thinks it's the last visit to them and i agree with him he'll soon have a greater sizes and a different judge to meet ay charley think of that now and tell me he sleeps in ballyfinnail as usual eh now he does of course and jimmy brannigan goes along wid him are you foolish coddy do you think he could live without him well i believe not truth whenever the old fellow goes in the next world there'll be no keepin jimmy from him how endeavour to drop that isn't these poor times charley and isn't this a poor country to live in or it would be nearer the truth to say starvin no but it would be the truth itself replied the other what is there over the whole country but starvation and misery any dreams about america since charley hey now maybe i and maybe no roddy is it true that tom dalton threatens all kinds of vengeance on the sullivans ay it is and the whole country says that he's as ready to knock one of them on the head as ever the father before him was they don't think the better of the old man for it but what do you mean by maybe i and maybe no charley what do you mean by axin me each looked keenly for some time at the other as he spoke and after this there was a pause at length hanlon placing his hand upon roddy's shoulder replied roddy it won't do i know the design and i tell you now that one word from my lips could have you brought up at the assizes tried and i won't say the rest you're betrayed 
the ruffian's lip fell his voice faltered and he became pale i proceeded the other you may well look astonished but listen you talk about going to america do you wish to go of course i do replied buddy of course not a doubt of it well proceeded hanlon again listen still your plans discovered you're betrayed but i can't tell you who betrayed you i'm not at liberty now listen i say come this way couldn't you and i ourselves do the thing couldn't we make the haul and couldn't we cut off to america without any danger to signify that is if you can be faithful faithful he exclaimed by all the books that was ever open and shut i'm truth and honesty itself so i am how endeavor you said i was betrayed but i can't tell you the man that told me whether you're able to guess at him or not i don't know but the truth is roddy i've taken a likin to you and if you'll just stand the trial i'm going to put you to i'll be a friend to you the best you ever had too well charley said the other plucking up courage a little for the fellow was a thorough coward what is the trial the man continued hanlon that betrayed you gave me one account of what you're about but whether he told me truth or not i don't know till i hear another and that's yours now you see clearly roddy that i'm up to all as it is so you need not be a bit backward in tellin the whole truth i say you're in danger and it's only trustin to me mark that by trustin faithfully to me that you'll get out of it and please the fates i hope that before three months is over we'll be both safe and comfortable in america do you understand that i had my dreams roddy but if i had there must be nobody but yourself and me to know them it wasn't i that first thought of it but donald do replied roddy i never dreamt that he'd turn traitor though don't be sayin to-morrow or next day that i said he did replied hanlon do you mind me now a nod's as good as a wink to a blind horse end of section thirteen Section 14 of The Black Prophet by William Carleton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 14. Roddy, though cowardly and treacherous, was extremely cunning, and upon turning the matter over in his mind, he began to dread, or rather to feel, that Hanlon had so far overreached him. Still it might be possible, he thought, that the Prophet had betrayed him, and he resolved to put a query to his companion that would test his veracity, after which he would leave himself at liberty to play a double game, if matters should so fall out as to render it necessary. "'Did you mean that you told everything?' he asked. "'Tell you the night that was appointed for this business?' Hanlon felt this was a puzzler, and that he might possibly commit himself by replying in the affirmative no he replied you didn't tell me that ha ha thought his companion i see whereabouts you are he disclosed however the whole plot with the single exception of the night appointed for the robbery which in point of date he placed in his narrative exactly a week after the real time now he said to himself so far i am on the safe side still if he has humbugged me I've paid him in his own coin. Maybe the whole haul, as he calls it, may be secured before they begin to prepare for it. Hanlon, however, had other designs. After musing a little, they sauntered along the garden walks, during which he proposed a plan of their own for the robbery of Henderson. And so admirably was it concocted, and so tempting to the villainous cupidity of Duncan, that he expressed himself delighted from the commencement of its fancied execution until their ultimate settlement in America. "'It was a treacherous thing, I grant, to betray you, Roddy,' said Hanlon, "'and if I was in your place I'd give him tit for tat, and by the way, talkin' of the prophet, 
Not that I say it was he betrayed you, for indeed now it wasn't. Bad cess to me if it was. I think you once said you knew more about him than I thought. Aha, again thought Roddy, I think I see what you're after at last, but no matter. I'll keep my eye on you. Hut, I did I, he replied, but I forget now what's this it was. However, I'll try if I can remember it. If I do, I'll tell you. You and he will hang that murderin' villain, Dalton. I'm afeard of that, replied the other, and for my part I'd as soon be out of the thing altogether, however it can't be helped now. Isn't it strange, Roddy, how murder comes out at last? observed Hanlon. Now there's that old man, and see, after twenty years or more, how it comes against him. However, it's not a very pleasant subject, so let it drop. Here's Master Richard coming through the private gate, he added, but if you slip down to my aunt's to-night, we'll have a glass of something that'll do us no harm at any rate, and we can talk more about the other business. Very well, replied Roddy, I'll be down, so good-bye, and whisper Charlie, he added, putting on a broad grin, don't be too sure that I told you a single word of truth about the rob- Ahem, <clears throat> aha! take care of yourself good people is scarce you know ha 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 he then left hanlon in a state of considerable doubt as to the discovery he had made touching the apprehended burglary and his uncertainty was the greater inasmuch as he had frequently heard the highest possible encomiums lavished upon duncan's extraordinary powers of invention and humbug young henderson on hearing these circumstances did not seriously question their truth neither did they in the slightest degree shake his confidence in the intentions of the prophet with respect to mave sullivan indeed he argued very reasonably and correctly that the man who was capable of the one act would have little hesitation to commit the other this train of reflection however he kept to himself for it was necessary to state here that Hanlon was not at all in the secret of the plot against Mave. Henderson had, on an earlier occasion, sounded him upon it, but perceived at once that his scruples could not be overcome, and that, of course, it would be dangerous to repose confidence in him. The next evening was that immediately preceding the assizes, and it was known that Dalton's trial was either the second or third on the list, and must consequently come on on the following day. The peddler and Hanlon sat in a depressed and melancholy mood at the fire. An old crone belonging to the village, who had been engaged to take care of the house during the absence of Hanlon's aunt, sat on the other side, occasionally putting an empty dudeen into her mouth drawing it hopelessly and immediately knocking the bowl out of it in a fretful manner against the nail of her left thumb what's the matter ailey asked the peddler are you out of tobacco truth is it's time for you to ax i am i since i ate my dinner saw a puff i had here then he replied suiting the action to the word and throwing a few halfpence into her lap go to peggy finnegan's and buy yourself a couple of ounces and smoke rings round you and listen to me go down before you come back to bammy curane's and see whether he has my shoes done or not and tell him from me that if they're not ready for me to-morrow morning i'll get him excommunicated when the crone had gone out the peddler proceeded don't be cast down yet i tell you there's still time enough and they may be here still be here still why good god isn't the trial to come on to-morrow they say so itself you may take my word for it that even if he's found guilty they won't hang him or any man of his years don't be too sure of that replied hanlon but indeed what could i expect after dependent upon a foolish dream never mind i'm still of the opinion that everything may come about yet 
the prophet's wife was with father hanratty tellin him somethin and he is to call here early in the mornin he'd bid me tell you so when did you see him to-day at the crossroads as he was goin to a sick call but where's the use of that when they're not here my own opinion is that she's either sick or if god hasn't said it may be dead how can we tell if ever she has seen or found the man you sent her for sure if she didn't all's lost truth i allow replied the pedlar that things is in a distressin state with us however while there's life there's hope as the doctor says there must be something extraordinary wrong to keep them away so long i grant or herself at any rate still i say again trust in god you have secured duncan you say but can you depend on the ruffian if it was on his honesty i could not one second but i do upon his villainy and love of money i have promised him enough and it all depends on whether he'll believe me or not well well observed the other i wish things had a brighter look up if we fail i won't know what to say we must only try and do the best we can ourselves have you seen the agent since you gave him the petition asked hanlon i did but he had no discourse with the hendersons and he bid me call on him again i dunna what does he intend to do hut nothin what did he do i'll go bail he'll never trouble his head about it more at any rate i told him a thing very likely he won't replied hanlon but what i'm thinking of now is the poor daltons may god in his mercy pity and support them this night the pedlar clasped his hands tightly as he looked up and said amen ay said he it's now charley when i think of them that i get frightened about our disappointment and the way that everything has failed with us god pity them i say to the situation of this much tried family was indeed on the night in question pitiable in the extreme it is true they had now recovered or nearly so the full enjoyment of their health and were owing as we have already said to the bounty of some unknown friend in circumstances of considerable comfort dalton's confession of the murder had taken away from them every principle on which they could rely with one only exception until the moment of that confession they had never absolutely been in possession of the secret cause of his remorse although it must be admitted that on some occasions the strength of his language and the melancholy depth of his sorrow filled them with something like suspicion still such they knew to be the natural affection and tenderness of his heart his benevolence and generosity in spite of his occasional bursts of passion that they could not reconcile to themselves the notion that he had ever murdered a fellow-creature every one knows how slow the heart of wife or child is to entertain such a terrible suspicion about a husband or a parent and that the discovery of their guilt comes upon the spirit with a weight of distress and agony that is great in proportion to the confidence felt in them the affectionate family in question had just concluded their simple act of evening worship and were seated around a dull fire looking forward in deep dejection to the awful event of the following day the silence that prevailed was only broken by an occasional sob from the girls or a deep sigh from young con who with his mother had not long been returned from ballynafail where they had gone to make preparations for the old man's defence his chair stood by the fire in its usual place and as they looked upon it from time to time they could not prevent their grief from bursting out afresh the mother on this occasion found the usual grounds for comfort taken away from both herself and them we mean the husband's innocence she consequently had but one principle to rely on that of single dependence upon god and obedience to his sovereign will however bitter the task might be and so she told them it's a great 
trial to us children, she observed, and it's only natural we should feel it. I do not bid you to stop crying, my poor girls, because it would be very strange if you didn't cry. Still, let us not forget that it's our duty to bow down humbly before whatever misfortune, and this is indeed a woeful one, that it pleases God in his wisdom, or maybe in his mercy, to lay in our way. That's all we can do now, God help us, and a hard trial it is, for when we think of what he was to us, of his kindness, his affection, her own voice became infirm, and instead of proceeding she paused a moment, and then giving one long convulsive sob that rushed up from her very heart, she wept out long and bitterly. The grief now became a wail, and were it not for the presence of Con, who, however, could scarcely maintain a firm voice himself, the sorrow, worn mother, and her unhappy daughters would have scarcely known when to cease. Mother dear, he exclaimed, what use is in this? You began with giving us a good advice, and you ended with setting us a bad example. Oh, mother darling, forgive me the word, never, never, since we remember anything, did you ever set us a bad example. Con, dear, I bore up as long as I could, she replied wiping her eye, but you know, after all, nature's nature, and will have its way. You know, too, that this is the first tear I shed since he left us. I know, replied her son, laying her careworn cheek over upon his bosom, that you are the best mother that ever breathed, and that I would lay down my life to save your heart from being crushed as it is, and as it has been. She felt a few warm tears fall upon her face as he spoke, and the only reply she made was to press him affectionately to her heart. God's merciful, if we're obedient, she added in a few moments. Don't you remember that when Abraham was commanded to kill his only son, he was ready to obey God and do it? And don't you remember that it wasn't until his very hand was raised with a knife in it that God interfered. Wished, she continued, I hear a step. Who is it? Oh, poor Tom. The poor young man entered as she spoke, and after looking about him for some time, placed himself in the armchair. Tom, darling, said his sister Peggy, don't sit in that. That's our poor father's chair, and until he sits in it again, none of us ever will. Nobody has such a right to sit in it as I have, he replied. I am a murderer. His words, his wild figure, and the manner in which he uttered them, filled them with alarm and horror. Tom, dear, said his brother, approaching him, why do you speak that way? You're not a murderer. I am, he replied, but I haven't done with the Sullivans yet for what they're going to do. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, no, it's all planned, and they'll suffer, never doubt it. Tom, said Mary, who began to fear that he might in some wild paroxysm have taken the life of the unfortunate miser, or of someone else. If you murdered anyone, who was it? Who was it? he replied. If you go up to Currabeg churchyard, you'll find her there, the child's widow. But I didn't murder the child, did I? On finding that he alluded only to the unfortunate Peggy Murtaugh, they recovered from the shock into which his words had thrown them. Tom, however, appeared exceedingly exhausted and feeble, as was evident from his inability to keep himself awake. His head gradually sank upon his breast, and in a few minutes he fell into a slumber. "'I'll put him to bed,' said Con. "'Help me to raise him.' They lifted him up, and a melancholy sight it was to see that face, which had once been such a noble specimen of manly beauty, now shrunk away into an expression of gaunt and haggard wildness that was painful to contemplate. His sisters could not restrain their tears on looking at the wreck that was before them, and his mother, with a voice of deep anguish, exclaimed, my brave, my beautiful boy, what, oh, what has become of you, oh, Tom, 
Tom, she added, maybe it's well for you that you don't know the breakin' hearts that's about you this night, or the bitter fate that's over him that loved you so well. As they turned him about to take off his cravat, he suddenly raised his head and, looking about him, asked, Where's my father gone? I see you all about me but him. Where's my father? Ere the words were pronounced, however, he was once more asleep and free for a time from the wild and moody malady that oppressed him. Such was the night, and such were the circumstances and feelings that ushered in the fearful day of Condy Dalton's trial. Chapter 29 A Picture of the Present Sarah Breaks a Word the grey of a cold, frosty morning had begun to dawn, and the angry red of the eastern sky gradually to change into that dim but darkening aspect which marks a coming tempest of snow, when the parish priest, the Reverend Father Hanrity, accompanied by Nelly McGowan, passed along the Ballyfinale Road on their way to the Grange for the purpose of having a communication with Charlie Hanlon. It would indeed be impossible to describe a morning more strongly marked than the one in question, by that cold and shivering impression of utter misery which is calculated to leave on any mind, especially when associated with the sufferings of our people. The breeze was keen and so cutting that one felt it as if that part of the person exposed to it had undergone the process of excoriation and when a stronger blast than usual swept over the naked and desolate-looking fields, its influence actually benumbed the joints, and penetrated the whole system with a sensation that made one imagine the very marrow within the bones was frozen. They had not proceeded far beyond the miserable shed where Sarah, in the rapid prostration of typhus, had been forced to take shelter when, in passing a wretched cabin by the roadside, which, from its open door and ruinous windows, had all the appearance of being uninhabited, they heard the moans of some unhappy individual within, accompanied, as it were, with something like the low, feeble wail of an infant. Ah, said the worthy priest, this, I fear, is another of those awful cases of desertion and death that are too common in this terrible and scourging visitation. We must not pass here without seeing what is the matter, and rendering such assistance as we can. With the help of God, my foot won't cross the threshold, replied Nelly. I know it's the sickness. God keep it from us, and I won't put myself in the way of it. Don't profane the name of the Almighty, you wretched woman, replied the priest, alighting from his horse. It is always his will and wish that in such trials as these you should do whatever you can for your suffering fellow creatures. But if I should catch it, the other replied, what would become of me? Mightn't I be as bad as they are in there and maybe in the same place too? And God knows I'm not fit to die. Stay where you are, said the priest, until I enter the house, and if your assistance should be necessary, I shall command you to come in. Well, if you order me, replied the superstitious creature, that changes the case. I'll be then under obedience to my clergy. If you had better observed the precepts of your religion, and the injunctions of your clergy, wretched woman, you would not be the vile creature you are to-day, he replied, as he hooked his horse's bridle upon a staple in the doorpost and entered the cabin. O oh, merciful father, support me, he exclaimed. What a sight is here. Come in at once, he added, addressing himself to Nelly, and if you have a woman's heart within you, aid me in trying what can be done. Awed by his words, but with timidity and reluctance, she approached the scene of appalling misery which there lay before them. But how shall we describe it? The cabin in which they stood had been evidently for some time deserted, a proof 
that its former humble inmates had been all swept off by typhus, for in these peculiar and not uncommon cases no other family would occupy the house thus left desolate, so that the cause of its desertion was easily understood. The floor was strewn in some places with little stopples of rotten thatch, evidently blown in by the wind of the previous night. The cheerless fireplace was covered with clots of soot, and the floor was all spattered over with the black shining moisture called soot drops, which want of heat and habitation caused to fall from the roof. The cold, strong blast, too, from time to time rushed in with wild moans of desolation that rose and fell in almost supernatural tones and swept the dead ashes and soot from the fireplace and the rotten thatch from the floor in little eddies that spun about until they got out into some nook or corner with the fiercer strength of the blast could not reach them stretched out in this wretched and abandoned hut lay before the good priest and his companion a group of misery consisting of both the dying and the dead to wit a mother and her three children over in the corner on the right hand side of the fireplace the unhappy and perishing creature lay divided or rather torn asunder as it were by the rival claims of affection lying close to her cold and shivering breast was an infant of about six months old striving feebly from time to time to draw from that natural source of affection the sustenance which had been dried up by chilling misery and want beside her on the left lay a boy a pale emaciated boy about eight years old silent and motionless with the exception that ever and anon he turned round his heavy blue eyes as if to ask some comfort or aid or even some notice from his unfortunate mother who as if conscious of these affectionate supplications pressed his wan cheek tenderly with her fingers to intimate to him that as far as she could she responded to and acknowledged these last entreaties of the heart whilst again she felt her affection called upon by the apparently dying struggles of the infant that was in reality fast perishing at the now exhausted fountain of its life between these two claimants was the breaking heart of the woeful mother divided but the alternations of her love seemed now almost wrought up to the last terrible agonies of mere animal instinct when the sufferings are strong in proportion to that debility of reason which supervenes in such deaths as arise from famine or under those feelings of indescribable torture which tore her affection as it were to pieces and paralyzed her higher powers of moral suffering beyond the infant again and next the wall lay a girl it might be of about eleven stretched as if in sleep and apparently in a state of composure that struck one forcibly when contrasted from its utter stillness with the yet living agonies by which she was surrounded it was evident from the decency with which the girl's thin scanty covering was arranged and the emaciated arms placed by her side that the poor parent had endeavoured as well as she could to lay her out and oh great god what a task for a mother and under what circumstances must it have been performed there however did the corpse of this fair and unhappy child lie her light and silken locks blown upon her still and death-like features by the ruffian blast and the complacency which had evidently characterized her countenance when in life now stamped by death with a sharp and wan expression of misery and the grave thus surrounded lay the dying mother and it was not until the priest had 
taken in at more than one view the whole terrors of this awful scene that he had time to let his eyes rest upon her countenance and person when he did however the history though a fearful one was in her case as indeed in too many legible at a glance and may be comprised in one word starvation father hanratty was a firm-minded man with a somewhat rough manner but a heart natural and warm after looking upon her face for a few moments he clasped his hands closely together and turning up his eyes to heaven he exclaimed great god guide and support me in this trying scene and indeed it is not to be wondered at that he uttered such an exclamation there lay in the woman's eyes between her knit and painful eyebrows over her shrunk upper forehead upon her sharp cheekbones and along the ridge of her thin wasted nose there lay upon her skeleton arms pointed elbows and long jointed fingers a frightful expression at once uniform and varied that spoke of gaunt and yellow famine in all its most hideous horrors her eyeballs protruded even to sharpness and as she glared about her with a half conscious and half instinctive look there seemed a fierce demand in her eye that would have been painful were it not that it was occasionally tamed down into something mournful and imploring by a recollection of the helpless beings that were about her stripped as she then was of all that civilized society presents to human being on the bed of death without friends aid of any kind comfort sympathy or the consolations of religion she might be truly said to have sunk to the mere condition of animal life whose uncontrollable impulses had thus left their startling and savage impress upon her countenance unless as we have said when the faint dawn of consciousness threw a softer and more human light into her wild features in the name and in the spirit of god's mercy asked the priest if you have the use of your tongue or voice tell me what the matter is with you or your children is it sickness or starvation the sound of a human voice appeared to arrest her attention and rouse her a little she paused as it were from her sufferings and looked first at the priest and then at his companion but she spoke not he then repeated the question and after a little delay he saw that her lips moved she is striving to speak said he but cannot i will stoop to her he repeated the question a third time and stooping so as to bring his ear near her mouth he could catch expressed very feebly and indistinctly the word hunger she then made an effort and bent down her mouth to the infant which now lay still at her breast she felt for its little heart she felt its little lips but they were now chill and motionless its little hands ceased to gather any longer around her breast it was cold it was breathless it was dead her countenance now underwent a singular and touching change a kind of solemn joy a sorrowful serenity was diffused over it she seemed to remember their position and was in the act after having raised her eyes to heaven of putting round her hand to feel for the boy who lay on the other side when she was seized with a short and rather feeble spasm and laying down her head in its original position between her children she was at last freed from life and all the sufferings which its gloomy lot had inflicted upon her and those whom she loved the priest seeing that she was dead offered up a short but earnest prayer for the repose of her soul after which he turned his attention to the boy the question now is he observed to his companion can we save this poor but interesting child i hardly think it possible she replied doesn't your reverence see that death's workin at him and 
an easy job he'll have of the poor thing now hunger and cold have here done awful work said father hanratty as they have and will in many other conditions similar to this i shall mount my horse and if you lift the poor child up i will wrap him as well as i can in my great coat which by the way he stripped off him as he spoke he then folded it round the boy and putting him into nelly's arms was about to leave the cabin when the child looking round him for a moment then upon his mother made a faint struggle to get back what is it ashore asked the woman what is it you want leave me with my mother he said let me go to her my poor father's dead and left us oh let me stay with her the poor boy's voice was so low and feeble that it was with difficulty she heard the words which she repeated to the priest dear child said the latter we are bringing you to where you will get food and drink and a warm bed to go to and you will get better i hope and as he took the helpless and innocent sufferer into his arms after having fixed himself in the saddle the tears of strong compassion ran down his cheeks he is as light as a feather poor thing exclaimed the kind-hearted man but i trust in heaven we may save him yet and they immediately hurried onward to the next house which happened to be that of our friend jerry sullivan to the care of whose humane and affectionate family they consigned him we cannot dwell here upon that which every reader can anticipate it is enough to say that the boy with care recovered and that his unfortunate mother with her two children received a humble grave in the nearest churchyard beyond the reach of the storms and miseries of life for ever on reaching the grange or rather the house now occupied by widow hanlon the priest having sent for charley into whose confidence he had for some time been admitted had a private conference of considerable length with him and the peddler after which nelly was called in as it would seem to make some disclosure connected with the subject they were discussing a deep gloom however rested upon both hanlon and the peddler and it was sufficiently evident that whatever the import of nelly mcgowan's communication may have been it was not of so cheering a nature as to compensate for the absence of widow hanlon and the party for which she had been sent for the hanratty having left them they took an early breakfast and proceeded to ballinafail which we choose to designate as the assize town in order to watch with disappointed and heavy hearts the trial of condy dalton in whose fate they felt a deeper interest than the reader might suppose all the parties attended the prophet among the rest and it might have been observed that his countenance was marked by an expression of peculiar determination his brow was if possible darker than usual his eye was quicker and more circumspect but his complexion notwithstanding this was not merely pale but absolutely white as ashes the morning came however and the assizes were open with the usual formalities the judge's charge to the grand jury in consequence of the famine outrages which had taken place to such an extent was unusually long nor was the king against dalton for the murder of sullivan left without due advice and comment in this way a considerable portion of the day passed at length a trial for horse stealing came on but closed too late to allow them to think of commencing any other case during the day and as a natural consequence that of condy dalton was postponed until the next morning it is an impressive thing and fills the mind with a reverend sense of the wisdom manifested by an overruling providence to reflect upon the wondrous manner in which the influence of slight events is made to frustrate the subtlest designs of human ingenuity and vindicate the justice of the almighty 
in the eyes of his creatures, sometimes for the reward of the just, and as often for the punishment of the guilty. Had the trial of Dalton, for instance, gone on, as had been anticipated during the first day, it is impossible to say how many of the characters in our humble drama might have grievously suffered or escaped in consequence. At all events, it is not likely that the following dialogue would have taken place or been made instrumental in working out purposes and defeating plans with which the reader, if he is not already, will very soon be made acquainted. Donald Dew had returned from the assizes and was sitting as usual poring over the fire when he asked the old woman who nursed Sarah if there had been any persons inquiring for him since nightfall. Three or four, she replied, but I said you hadn't come home yet, and devil a one of them, but was all on the same tune and bid me to tell you that it was a safe night. Well, I hope it is, Biddy, he replied, but not so safe, he added to himself, as I could wish it to be. How is Sarah? She is better, replied the woman, and was up to-day for an hour or two, but still she's poorly, and I think her brain isn't right yet. Very likely it isn't, said the prophet. But, Biddy, when were you at Shanko? Not this week past. Well, then, if you like to slip over for an hour or so now, you may, and I'll take care of Sarah till you come back, only don't be longer. Long life to you, Donnell. Truth, and I want to go. If it was only to set the little matters right for them poor orphans, my grandchildren. Well, then, go, he replied. But don't be more than an hour away, mind. I'll take care of Sarah for you till you come back. At this moment a tap came to the door, and Donnell, on hearing it, went out, and in a minute or two returned again, saying, Hurry, Biddy, make haste, if you wish to go at all, but remember not to be more than an hour away. The old creature accordingly threw her cloak about her, and made the best of her way to see her grandchildren, both of whose parents had been swept away by the first deadly ravages of the typhus fever. She had not been long gone when another tap was given, and Donnell, on opening the door, said, You may come in now. She's off to Shanko. I didn't think it safe that she should see us together on this night at all events. Sit down. This girl's illness has nearly spoiled all. However, we must only do the best we can. Thank God the night's dark. That's one comfort. If we could have had Dalton found guilty, replied Body, all would be well over this night, and we might be on our way out of this to America. But what did you do with Sarah if we had? Sure she wouldn't be able to travel, nor she won't, I doubt as it is. Sarah, replied the prophet, who suspected the object of the question, is well fit to take care of herself. We must only go without her if she's not able to come the day after to-morrow. Where are the boys for the Grange? Under shelter of the grey stone, waiting to start. Well, then, as it is, said Donnell, they know their business at any rate. The Grange folk don't expect them this week to come, you think? Roddy looked at the prophet very keenly, as he thought of the conversation that took place between himself and Charlie Hanlon, and which, upon an explanation with Donnell, he had detailed. The fellow, however, as we said, was both cowardly and suspicious, and took it into his head that his friend might feel disposed to play him a trick by sending him to conduct the burglary, of which Hanlon had spoken with such startling confidence, a piece of cowardice which indeed was completely gratuitous and unfounded on his part the truth being that it was the prophet's interest above all things to keep roddy out of danger both for that worthy individual's sake and his own roddy we say looked at him and of a certainty must be admitted that the physiognomy of our friend the seer during that whole day was one from which no very high opinion of his integrity or good faith could be drawn
"'It's a very strange thing,' replied Roddy, in a tone of thought and reflection, "'how Charlie Hanlon came to know of this matter at all.' "'He never heard a word of it,' replied Donnell, barring from yourself.' "'From me?' replied Roddy, indignantly. "'What do you mean by that?' "'Why, when you went to sound him,' said Donnell, "'you let too much out, and Charlie was too cute not to see what you were at.' "'All featherlog and nonsense,' replied Roddy, "'who, by the way, entertained a very high opinion of his own sagacity. "'No mortal could suspect that there was a plot to rob the house from what I said, but hold, he added, slapping his knee as if he had made a discovery. Much up a duel, but I have it all. What is it? said the prophet calmly. You told the matter to Sarah, and she by course told it to Charlie Hanlon that she tells everything to. No such thing, replied the other. Sarah knows nothing about the robbery that's to go on to-night at the Grange, but she did about the plan upon Mave Sullivan, and promised to help us in it, as I told you before. Well, at any rate, replied Duncan, I'll have nothing to do with this robbery, devil a thing, but I'll make a bargain with you. If you manage the Grange business, I'll lend a hand in Mave Sullivan's affair." The prophet looked at him, fastening his dark, piercing eyes upon his face. "'I see,' he proceeded, "'you're suspicious, or you're cowardly, or maybe both. But to make you feel that I'm neither the one nor the other, and that you have no reason to be so either, I say I'll take you at your word. Do you manage Mave Sullivan's business, and I'll see what can be done with the other and listen to me now it's our business in case of a discovery of the robbery to have master dick's neck as far in the noose for mave's affair as ours may be for the other thing and for the same reason you needn't care how far you drive him he doesn't wish to have violence but do you take care that there will be violence and then maybe we may manage him if there's a discovery in the other affair donnell you're a great headpiece the devil's not so deep as you are but as the most of them all is strangers and they say there's two girls in sullivan's instead of one how will the strange boy know the right one if it goes to that said the prophet you'll know her by her clipped head the minute they seize upon the girl with the clipped head let them make sure of her poor foolish tom dalton who knows nothing about our scheme thinks the visit is merely to frighten the sullivans but when you get the girl let her be brought to the crossroads of tulnavert where master dick will have a chase waitin for her and once she's with him your care's over in the meantime while he's waitin there i and the others will see what can be done at the grange but tell me donald you don't intend surely to leave poor sarah behind us eh sarah returned the prophet ay because you said so a while agone i know i said so a while ago but regardin sarah roddy she's the only livin thing on this earth that i care about i have hardened my heart thank god against all the world but herself and although i have never much showed it to her and although i have neglected her and sometimes thought i hated her for her mother's sake well no matter she's the only thing i love or care about for all that oh no go without sarah come well come well we must not because continued roddy when we're safe and out of the reach of danger i have a thing to say to you about sarah very well roddy said the prophet with a grim but bitter smile it'll be time enough then now go and manage these fellows and see you do things as they ought to be done she's fond of charlie hanlon to my own knowledge who is sarah and between you and me it's not a bernoge 
like him that's fit for her. She's a hasty and an uncertain kind of girl, a good deal wild or so, and it isn't, as I said, the likes of that chap that'd answer her, but a steady, experienced, sober, honest man, Roddy. Well, I'm not in the laughing humor now. Be off, and see that you do yourself and us all credit. When he was gone, the prophet drew a long breath, one, however, from its depths, evidently indicative of anything but ease of mind. He then rose, and was preparing to go out, when Sarah, who had only laid herself on the bed, without undressing, got up, and approaching him, said in a voice tremulous with weakness, "'Father, I have heard every word you and Roddy said.' "'Well,' replied her father, looking at her, "'I supposed as much. I made no secret of anything. However, keep to your bed. Your father, I have changed my mind. You have neither my heart nor wish in anything. You're bent on this night.' changed your mind replied the prophet bitterly oh you're a real woman i suppose like your mother you'll drive some unfortunate man to hate the world and all that's in it yet father i care as little about the world as you do but still never will i lay myself out to do anything that's wrong you promised to assist us then in mave sullivan's business for all that he replied you can break your word, too. Ah, real woman again. Sooner than keep that promise, father, now I would willingly let the last drop of blood out of my heart, my unhappy heart. Father, you're proven yourself to be what I can't name. Listen to me. You're on the brink of destruction. Stop in time, and fly, for there's a fate over you. I dreamt since I lay down not more than a couple of hours ago, that I saw the tobacco-box you were looking for in the hands of— Don't bother or vex me with your damned nonsense about dreams, he replied, in a loud and excited voice. The curse of heaven on all dreams, and every stuff of the kind. Go to bed. He slapped the door violently after him as he spoke, and left her to her own meditations. Chapter 30 self-sacrifice villainy time passes now as it did on the night recorded in the preceding chapter about the hour of two o'clock on the same night a chase was standing at the crossroads of tullivert in which a gentleman a little but not much the worse of liquor sat in a mood redolent of anything but patience many ejaculations did he utter and some oaths in consequence of the delay of certain parties whom he expected to meet there at length the noise of many feet was heard and in the course of a few minutes a body of men advanced in the darkness one of whom approached the chase and asked is that master dick master dick sirrah no it's not then there must be some mistake replied the fellow who was a stranger, and as it's a runaway match, by Gora, it would never do to give the girl to the wrong person. It was Master Dick that the prophet desired us to inquire for. There is a mistake, my friend. There is. My name, my good fellows, happens to be Master Richard, or rather Mr. Richard. In all other respects, everything is right. I expect a lady and I am the gentleman, but not Master Dick, though. Richard is the correct reading. Then, sir, replied the fellow, here she is. And whilst speaking, a horseman bearing a female before him came forward, and in a few minutes she was transferred without any apparent resistance to the inside of the vehicle which awaited her. This vehicle we shall now follow. The night, as we said, was dark, but it was also cold and stormy. The driver, who had received his instructions, proceeded in the direction of the Grange, and we only, I say so generally, because so many crossroads branched off from that which they took, that it was impossible to say when or where. 
master or mr richard may have intended to stop in the meantime that enterprising and gallant young gentleman commenced a dialogue somewhat as follows my dear miss sullivan i must be satisfied that these fellows have conducted this business with all due respect to your feelings i hope they have not done anything to insult you i am very weak replied the lady you needn't expect me to speak much for i am not able i only wish i was in heaven or anywhere out of this world you speak as if you had been agitated or frightened but compose yourself you are now under my protection at last and you shall want for nothing that can contribute to your ease and comfort upon my honor upon my sacred honor i say i would not have caused you even this annoyance were it not that you yourself expressed a willingness very natural indeed considering our affection to meet me here to-night who told you that i was willing to meet you who why who but our mutual friend the black prophet and by the way he is to meet us at the greystone by and by he told you false then replied his companion feebly why asked henderson are you not here with your own consent i am oh indeed i am it's altogether my own act that brings me here my own act and i thank god that i had strength for it admirable girl that is just what i have been led to expect from you and you shall not regret it i have as i said everything provided that can make you happy happy i can't bear this sir i'm deceiving you i'm not what you think me you are ill i fear my dear miss sullivan the bustle and disturbance have agitated you too much and you are ill you are speaking truth i am very ill but i'll soon be better i'll soon be better she feared nothing from me added she in a low soliloquy and could i let her outdo me in generosity and kindness is this fire is there fire in the coach she asked in a loud voice or is it lightning oh my head my head but it will soon be over compose yourself i entreat of you my dearest girl what good heavens how is this you have not been ill for any time your hand pardon me you need not withdraw it so hastily is quite burning and fleshless what is wrong everything sir is wrong unless that i am here and that is as it ought to be ha ah. good my dearest girl that consoles me again upon my honor the old prophet shall not lose by this on the contrary i shall keep my word and at the greystone shall he pocket ere half an hour the reward of his allegiance to his liege lord i have for a long time had my eye on you miss sullivan and when the prophet assured me that you had discarded dalton for my sake i could scarcely credit him until you confirmed the delightful fact by transmitting me a tress of your beautiful hair his companion made no reply to this and the chase went on for some minutes without any further discourse henderson at length ventured to put over his hand towards the corner in which his companion sat but no sooner came in contact with her person than he felt her shrinking as it were from his very touch with his usual complacent confidence however in his own powers of attraction and strongly impressed besides with the belief in his knowledge of the sex he at once imputed all this to caprice on the behalf of mave or rather to that assumption of extreme delicacy which is often resorted to and overacted when the truthful and modest principle from which it should originate has ceased to exist well my dear girl he proceeded i grant that all this is natural enough quite so i know the step you have taken shows great strength of character for indeed it requires a very high degree of moral courage and virtue in you 
to set society and the whole world at perfect defiance for my sake. But, my dearest girl, don't be cast down. You are not alone in this heroic sacrifice, not at all, believe me. You are not the first who has made it for me. Neither, I trust, shall you be the last. This I say, of course, to encourage you, because I see that the step you have taken has affected you very much, as is natural it should. A low moan, apparently of great pain, was the only reply Henderson received to this eloquent effort at consolation. The carriage again rolled onward in silence, and nothing could be heard but the sweep of the storm without, for it blew violently, and deep breathings, or occasional moanings, from his companion within. They drove, it might be, for a quarter of an hour in this way, when Henderson felt his companion start, and the next moment her hand was placed upon his arm. Ha-ha, my dearest, thought he, I knew, notwithstanding all your beautiful startings and fencings, that matters would come to this. There is nothing, after all, like leaving you to yourselves a little, and you are sure to come round. My dear Miss Sullivan, he added aloud, be composed. Say but what it is you wish, and if a man can accomplish it, it must be complied with or procured for you. Then, said she, if you are a human being, let me know when we come to the grey stone. Undoubtedly I shall. The grim old prophet promised to meet us there, and for a reason I have, I know he will keep his word. We shall be there in less than a quarter of an hour. But, my precious creature, now that you understand how we are placed with relation to each other, I think you might not and ought not object to allowing me to support you after the fatigue and agitation of the night. Ahem! <clears throat> Do repose your head upon my bosom like a pretty, trembling, agitated dear as you are. Hold away, exclaimed his companion. Don't dare to lay a hand upon me. If your life is worth anything, and it's not worth much, keep your distance. You'll find your mistake soon. I didn't put myself in your power without the means of defending myself and punishing you if you should deserve it. Beautiful caprice, but my dearest girl, I can understand it all. It is well done, and I know besides that little hysterics will be necessary in their proper place. But for that you must wait till we get to our destination, and then you will be most charmingly affected with a fit, a delightful, sweet, soft, sobbing fit, which will render it necessary for me to soothe and console you, to wipe your lovely eyes, and then, you know, to kiss your delicious lips. All this, my darling girl, will happen as a natural consequence, and in due time everything will be well. End of section 14